Introduction of Irenaeus Against Heresies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Introductory Notice the work of Irenaeus against heresies is one of the most precious remains of early Christian antiquity. It is devoted, on the one hand, to an account and refutation of those multiform Gnostic heresies which prevailed in the latter half of the second century, and on the other hand, to an exposition and defense of the Catholic faith. In the prosecution of this plan, the author divides his work into five books. The first of these contains a minute description of the tenets of the various heretical sects, with occasional brief remarks in illustration of their absurdity, and in confirmation of the truth to which they were opposed. In the second book, Irenaeus proceeds to a more complete demolition of those heresies which he has already explained, and argues at great length against them, on grounds principally of reason. The three remaining books set forth more directly the true doctrines of Revelation as being an utter antagonism to the views held by the Gnostic teachers. In the course of this argument, many passages of Scripture are quoted and commented on, many interesting statements are made bearing on the rule of faith, and much important light is shed on the doctrines held, as well as to the practices observed, by the Church of the second century. It may be made matter of regret that so large a portion of the work of Irenaeus is given to an exposition of the manifold Gnostic speculations. Nothing more absurd than these has probably been imagined by rational beings. Some ingenious and learned men have indeed endeavored to reconcile the wild theories of these heretics with the principles of reason. But, as Bishop K. remarks, quote, a more arduous or unpromising undertaking cannot be well conceived. The fundamental object of the Gnostic speculations was doubtless to solve the two grand problems of all religious philosophy, viz., how to account for the existence of evil, and how to reconcile the finite with the infinite. But these ancient theories were not more successful in grappling with such questions than have been their successors in modern times. And by giving loose reins to their imagination, they built up the most incongruous and ridiculous systems, while, by deserting the guidance of Scripture, they were betrayed into the most pernicious and extravagant errors. Accordingly, the patience of the reader is sorely tried, in following our author through those mazes of absurdity which he treads, in explaining and refuting these Gnostic speculations. This is especially felt in the perusal of the first two books, which, as has been said, are principally devoted to an exposition and subversion of the various heretical systems. But the vagaries of the human mind, however melancholy in themselves, are never altogether destitute of instruction. And in dealing with those set before us in this work, we have not only the satisfaction of becoming acquainted with the currents of thought prevalent in these early times, but we obtain much valuable information regarding the primitive church, which, had it not been for these heretical schemes, might never have reached our day. Not a little of what is contained in the following pages will seem most unintelligible to the English reader, and it is scarcely more comprehensible to those who have pondered long on the original. We have inserted brief notes of explanation where these seemed specially necessary. But we have not thought it worth while to devote a great deal of space to the elucidation of those obscure Gnostic views, which, in so many varying forms, are set forth in this work. For the same reason, we give here no account of the origin, history, and successive phases of Gnosticism. Those who wish to know the views of the learned on these points may consult the writings of Neander, Bauer, and others among the Germans, or the lectures of Dr. Burton in English, 
while a succinct description of the whole matter will be found in the Preliminary Observations on the Gnostic System, prefixed to Harvey's edition of Irenaeus. The great work of Irenaeus, now for the first time translated into English, is unfortunately no longer extant in the original. It has come down to us only in the ancient Latin version, with the exception of the greater part of the first book, which has been preserved in the original Greek, through means of copious quotations made by Hippolytus and Epiphanius. The text, both Latin and Greek, is often most uncertain. Only three manuscripts of the work, Against Heresies, are at present known to exist. Others, however, were used in the earliest printed editions put forth by Erasmus. And as these codices were more ancient than any now available, it is greatly to be regretted that they have disappeared or perished. One of our difficulties throughout has been to fix the readings we should adopt, especially in the first book. Varieties of reading, actual or conjectural, have been noted only when some point of special importance seems to be involved. After the text has been settled, according to the best judgment which can be formed, the work of translation remains, and that is, in this case, a matter of no small difficulty. Irenaeus, even in the original Greek, is often a very obscure writer. At times he expresses himself with remarkable clearness and terseness, but, upon the whole, his style is very involved and prolix. And the Latin version adds to these difficulties of the original, by being itself of the most barbarous character. In fact, it is often necessary to make a conjectural retranslation of it into Greek, in order to obtain some inkling of what the author wrote. Dodwell supposes this Latin version to have been made about the end of the fourth century, but as Tertullian seems to have used it, we must rather place it in the beginning of the third. Its author is unknown, but he was certainly little qualified for his task. We have endeavored to give as close and accurate a translation of the work as possible, but there are not a few passages in which a guess can only be made as to the probable meaning. Irenaeus had manifestly taken great pains to make himself acquainted with the various heretical systems which he describes. His mode of exposing and refuting these is generally very effective. It is plain that he possessed a good share of learning, and that he had a firm grasp of the doctrines of Scripture. Not unfrequently he indulges in a kind of sarcastic humor, while in vain against the folly and impiety of the heretics. But at times he gives expression to very strange opinions. He is, for example, quite peculiar in imagining that our Lord lived to be an old man, and that his public ministry embraced at least ten years. But though, on these and some other points, the judgment of Irenaeus is clearly at fault, his work contains a vast deal of sound and valuable exposition of scripture, in opposition to the fanciful systems of interpretation which prevailed in his day. We possess only very scanty accounts of the personal history of Irenaeus. It has been generally supposed that he was a native of Smyrna, or some neighboring city, in Asia Minor. Harvey, however, thinks that he was probably born in Syria, and removed in boyhood to Smyrna. He himself tells us that he was in early youth acquainted with Polycarp, the illustrious bishop of that city. A sort of clue is thus furnished as to the date of his birth. Dodwell supposes that he was born so early as A.D. 97, but this is clearly a mistake, and the general date assigned to his birth is somewhere between A.D. 120 and A.D. 140. It is certain that Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyon in France during the latter quarter of the second century. The exact period or circumstances of his ordination cannot be determined. Eusebius states that he was, while yet a presbyter, sent with a letter from certain members of the Church of Lyon, awaiting martyrdom, to Eleutherus, Bishop of Rome, and that he succeeded Pothinus as Bishop of Lyon, probably about A.D. 177. His great work, Against Heresies, was, we learn, written during the episcopate of Eleutherus, 
that is, between A.D. 182 and A.D. 188. For Victor succeeded to the bishopric of Rome in A.D. 189. This new bishop of Rome took very harsh measures for enforcing uniformity throughout the church as to the observance of the paschal solemnities. On account of the severity thus evinced, Irenaeus addressed to him a letter, only a fragment of which remains, warning him that if he persisted in the course on which he had entered, the effect would be to rend the Catholic Church in pieces. The letter had the desired result, and the question was more temperately debated, until finally settled at the Council of Nicaea. The full title of the principal work of Irenaeus, as given by Eusebius, and indicated frequently by the author himself, was a refutation and subversion of knowledge, falsely so called but it is generally referred to under the shorter title, Against Heresies. Several other smaller treatises are ascribed to Irenaeus, viz. an epistle to Florinus, of which a small fragment has been preserved in Eusebius, a treatise on the Valentinian Ogdoad, a work called forth by the Paschal Controversy entitled On Schism, and another On Science, all of which that remain will be found in our next volume of his writings. Irenaeus is supposed to have died about A.D. 202, but there is probably no real ground for the statement of Jerome, repeated by subsequent writers, that he suffered martyrdom, since neither Tertullian, nor Eusebius, nor other early authorities make any mention of such a fact. As has already been stated, the first printed copy of our author was given to the world by Erasmus. This was the year 1526. Between that date and 1571, a number of reprints were produced in both folio and octavo. All these contained merely the ancient barbarous Latin version, and were deficient towards the end by five entire chapters. These latter were supplied by the edition of Fuerdent, Professor of Divinity at Paris, which was published in 1575, and went through six subsequent editions. Previously to this, however, Another had been set forth by Galasius, a minister of Geneva, which contained the first portions of the Greek text from Epiphanius. Then in 1702 came the edition of Graba, a learned Prussian, who had settled in England. It was published in Oxford, and contained considerable additions to the Greek text with fragments. Ten years after this, there appeared the important Paris edition by the Benedictine monk Mosset, this was reprinted at Venice in the year 1724, in two thin folio volumes, and again at Paris in a large octavo, by the Abbe Migne in 1857. A German edition was published by Stieren in 1853. In the year 1857, there was also brought out a Cambridge edition, by the Reverend Vigan Harvey, in two octavo volumes. The two principal features of this edition are... The additions which have been made to the Greek text from the recently discovered Philosophaumina of Hippolytus, and the further addition of thirty-two fragments of a Syrian version of the Greek text of Irenaeus, culled from the Nitrian collection of Syriac manuscripts in the British Museum. These fragments are of considerable interest, and in some instances rectify the readings of the barbarous Latin version, where, Without such aid, it would have been unintelligible. The edition of Harvey will be found constantly referred to in the notes appended to our translation. End of Introduction Preface of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One Translated by Alexander Roberts and William Rambo Preface One Inasmuch as certain men have set the truth aside, and bring in lying words and vain genealogies, which, as the Apostle says, Minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. 
and by means of their craftily constructed plausibilities draw away the minds of the inexperienced and take them captive, I have felt constrained, my dear friend, to compose the following treatise in order to expose and counteract their machinations. These men falsify the oracles of God and prove themselves evil interpreters of the good word of revelation. They also overthrow the faith of many by drawing them away under the pretense of superior knowledge from him who rounded and adorned the universe, as if, forsooth, they had something more excellent and sublime to reveal than that God who created the heaven and the earth and all things that are therein. By means of specious and plausible words, they cunningly allure the simple-minded to inquire into their system, but they nevertheless clumsily destroy them, while they initiate them into their blasphemous and impious opinions respecting the demiurge, and these simple ones are unable, even in such a matter, to distinguish falsehood from truth. 2. Error, indeed, is never set forth in its naked deformity, lest, being thus exposed, it should at once be detected. But it is craftily decked out in an attractive dress, so as, by its outward form, to make it appear to the inexperienced ridiculous as the expression may seem, more true than the truth itself. One far superior to me has well said, in reference to this point, a clever imitation in glass casts contempt, as it were, on that precious jewel, the emerald, which is most highly esteemed by some, unless it come under the eye of one able to test and expose the counterfeit. Or, again, what inexperienced person can with ease detect the presence of brass when it has been mixed up with silver? Lest, therefore, through my neglect, some should be carried off, even as sheep are by wolves, while they perceive not the true character of these men, because they outwardly are covered with sheep's clothing, against whom the Lord has enjoined us to be on our guard and because their language resembles ours, while their sentiments are very different, I have deemed it my duty, after reading some of the commentaries, as they call them, of the disciples of Valentinus, and after making myself acquainted with their tenets through personal intercourse with some of them, to unfold to thee, my friend, these portentous and profound mysteries which do not fall within the range of every intellect, because all have not sufficiently purged their brains. I do this in order that thou, obtaining an acquaintance with these things, mayest in turn explain them to all those with whom thou art connected, and exhort them to avoid such an abyss of madness and blasphemy against Christ. I intend, then, to the best of my ability, with brevity and clearness, to set forth the opinions of those who are now promulgating heresy. I refer especially to the disciples of Ptolemaeus, whose school may be described as a bud from that of Valentinus. I shall also endeavor, according to my moderate ability, to furnish the means of overthrowing them, by showing how absurd and inconsistent with the truth are their statements. Not that I am practiced either in composition or eloquence, but my feeling of affection prompts me to make known to thee and all thy companions those doctrines which have been kept in concealment until now, but which are at last, through the goodness of God, brought to light." For there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed, nor secret that shall not be made known. 3. Thou wilt not expect from me, who am resident among the Kelche, and am accustomed for the most part to use a barbarous dialect, any display of rhetoric, which I have never learned, or any excellence of composition, which I have never practiced 
or any beauty and persuasiveness of style, to which I make no pretensions. But thou wilt accept in a kindly spirit what I in a like spirit write to thee, simply, truthfully, and in my own homely way, whilst thou thyself, as being more capable than I am, wilt expand those ideas of which I send thee, as it were, only the seminal principles, and in the comprehensiveness of thy understanding, wilt develop to their full extent the points on which I briefly touch, so as to set with power before thy companions those things which I have uttered in weakness. In fine, as I, to gratify thy long-cherished desire for information regarding the tenets of these persons, have spared no pains, not only to make these doctrines known to thee, but also to furnish the means of showing their falsity. So shalt thou, according to the grace given to thee by the Lord, prove an earnest and efficient minister to others, that men may no longer be drawn away by the plausible system of these heretics, which I now proceed to describe. End of Book One Preface Chapters 1 through 3 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 1. Absurd Ideas of the Disciples of Valentinus as to the Origin, Name, Order, and Conjugal Productions of their Fancied Ions, with the Passages of Scripture which they adapt to their Opinions. 1. They maintain, then, that in the invisible and ineffable heights above, there exists a certain perfect pre-existent Ion, whom they call Proarche, Propator and Bithus, and describe as being invisible and incomprehensible. Eternal and unbegotten, he remained throughout innumerable cycles of ages in profound serenity and quiescence. There existed along with him Enoia, whom they also call Charis and Sigi. At last, this Bithus determined to send forth from himself the beginning of all things, and deposited this production, which he had resolved to bring forth, in his contemporary Sigi, even as seed is deposited in the womb. She then, having received this seed, and becoming pregnant, gave birth to Naus, who was both similar and equal to him who had produced him, and was alone capable of comprehending his father's greatness. This Naus, they call also monogenes, and father, and the beginning of all things. Along with him was also produced Aletheia, and these four constituted the first and first begotten Pythagorean tetrad, which they also denominate the root of all things. For there are first Bithus and Segi, and then Naus and Aletheia. And monogenes, perceiving for what purpose he had been produced, also himself sent forth Lagos and Zoe, being the father of all those who were to come after him, and the beginning and fashioning of the entire Pleroma. By the conjunction of Lagos and Zoe were brought forth Anthropos and Ecclesia, and thus was formed the first begotten Ogdoad, the root and substance of all things, called among them by four names, viz. Bithus and Naus, and Lagos and Anthropos. For each of these is masculo-feminine, as follows. Propator was united by conjunction with his Enoia, then Monogenes, that is Naus, with Aletheia, Lagos with Zoe, and Anthropos with Ecclesia. 2. These ions, having been produced for the glory of the Father, 
and wishing, by their own efforts, to effect this object, sent forth emanations by means of conjunction. Lagos and Zoe, after producing Anthropos and Ecclesia, sent forth other ten ions, whose names are the following, Bithias and Mixus, Agaratos and Henosis, Autophias and Hedoni, Asenetos and Syncrasis, Monogenes and Macaria. These are the ten ions whom they declare to have been produced by Lagos and Zoe. They then add that Anthropos himself, along with Ecclesia, produced twelve ions, to whom they give the following names, Paracletus and Pistis, Patricos and Elpis, Metricos and Agape, Inos and Synesis, Ecclesiasticus and Macariotes, Theletos and Sophia. 3. Such are the thirty ions in the erroneous system of these men, and they are described as being wrapped up, so to speak, in silence, and known to none except these professing teachers. Moreover, they declare that this invisible and spiritual pleroma of theirs is tripartite, being divided into an ogdoad, a decad, and a duodecad. And for this reason, they affirm it was that the Savior, for they do not please to call him Lord, did no work in public during the space of thirty years, thus setting forth the mystery of these ions. They maintain also that these thirty ions are most plainly indicated in the parable of the laborers sent into the vineyard. For some are sent about the first hour, others about the third hour, others about the sixth hour, others about the ninth hour, and others about the eleventh hour. Now, if we add up the numbers of the hours here mentioned, the sum total will be thirty. For one, three, six, nine, and eleven, when added together, form thirty. And by the hours, they hold that the ions were pointed out, while they maintain that these are great and wonderful and hitherto unspeakable mysteries which it is their special function to develop. And so they proceed when they find anything in the multitude of things contained in the scriptures which they can adopt and accommodate to their baseless speculations. Chapter 2 The Propator was known to Monogenes alone, ambition, disturbance, and danger into which Sophia fell, her shapeless offspring. She is restored by Horos. The production of Christ and of the Holy Spirit, in order to the completion of the Ions. Manner of the production of Jesus. 1. They proceed to tell us that the propator of their scheme was known only to Monogenes, who sprang from him, in other words, only to Nous, while to all the others he was invisible and incomprehensible. And according to them, Nous alone took pleasure in contemplating the Father, and exulted in considering his immeasurable greatness while he also meditated how he might communicate to the rest of the Ions the greatness of the Father, revealing to them how vast and mighty he was, and how he was without beginning, beyond comprehension, and altogether incapable of being seen. But, in accordance with the will of the Father, Sigi restrained him, because it was his design to lead them all to an acquaintance with the aforesaid Propator, and to create within them a desire of investigating his nature. In like manner, the rest of the Ions also, in a kind of quiet way, had a wish to behold the author of their being, and to contemplate that first cause which had no beginning. 2. But there rushed forth in advance of the rest that Ion who was much the latest of them, and was the youngest of the duodecad which sprang from Anthropos and Ecclesia, namely Sophia, and suffered passion apart from the embrace of her consort Theletos. This passion, indeed, first arose among those who were connected with Naus and Aletheia, 
but passed as by contagion to this degenerate Ion, who acted under a pretense of love, but was in reality influenced by temerity, because she had not, like Naus, enjoyed communion with the perfect father. This passion, they say, consisted in a desire to search into the nature of the father, for she wished, according to them, to comprehend his greatness. When she could not attain her end, inasmuch as she aimed at an impossibility, and thus became involved in an extreme agony of mind, while both on account of the vast profundity as well as the unsearchable nature of the father, and on account of the love she bore him, she was ever stretching herself forward. There was danger lest she should at last have been absorbed by his sweetness, and resolved into his absolute essence, unless she had met with that power which supports all things, and preserves them outside of the unspeakable greatness. This power they term Horos. By him, they say, she was restrained and supported, and that then, having with difficulty been brought back to herself, she was convinced that the father is incomprehensible, and so laid aside her original design, along with that passion which had arisen within her from the overwhelming influence of her admiration. 3. But others of them fabulously describe the passion and restoration of Sophia as follows. They say that she, having engaged in an impossible and impractical attempt, brought forth an amorphous substance, such as her female nature enabled her to produce. When she looked upon it, her first feeling was one of grief, on account of the imperfection of its generation, and then of fear, lest this should end her own existence. Next she lost, as it were, all command of herself, and was in the greatest perplexity while endeavouring to discover the cause of all this, and in what way she might conceal what had happened. Being greatly harassed by these passions, she at last changed her mind, and endeavoured to return anew to the father. When, however, she in some measure made the attempt, strength failed her, and she became a suppliant of the father. The other Ions, Naus in particular, presented their supplications along with her and hence they declare material substance had its beginning from ignorance and grief and fear and bewilderment. 4. The father afterwards produces, in his own image, by means of monogenes, the above-mentioned horos, without conjunction, masculo-feminine. For they maintain that sometimes the father acts in conjunction with sigi, but that at other times he shows himself independent both of male and female. And they term this horos both staros and lytrotes, and carpistes, and horothetes, and metagoges. And by this horos they declare that Sophia was purified and established, while she was also restored to her proper conjunction. For her enthymeses, or inborn idea, having been taken away from her, along with its supervening passion, she herself certainly remained within the pleroma. But her enthymesis, with its passion, was separated from her by Horos, fenced off and expelled from that circle. This enthymesis was, no doubt, a spiritual substance, possessing some of the natural tendencies of an ion, but at the same time shapeless and without form, because it had received nothing. And on this account they say that it was an imbecile and feminine production. 5. After this substance had been placed outside of the pleroma of the Ions, and its mother restored to her proper conjunction, they tell us that monogenes, acting in accordance with the prudent forethought of the father, gave origin to another conjugal pair, namely Christ and the Holy Spirit, lest any of the Ions should fall into a calamity similar to that of Sophia, for the purpose of fortifying and strengthening the pleroma, 
and who at the same time completed the number of the Ions. Christ then instructed them as to the nature of their conjunction, and taught them that those who possessed a comprehension of the unbegotten were sufficient for themselves. He also announced among them what related to the knowledge of the Father, namely, that he cannot be understood or comprehended, nor so much as seen or heard, except in so far as he is known by monogenies only. And the reason why the rest of the Ions possess perpetual existence is found in that part of the Father's nature which is incomprehensible. But the reason of their origin and formation was situated in that which may be comprehended regarding him, that is, in the Son. Christ, then, who had just been produced, effected these things among them. 6. But the Holy Spirit taught them to give thanks on being all rendered equal among themselves, and led them to a state of true repose. Thus, then, they tell us that the Ions were constituted equal to each other in form and sentiment, so that all became as Nous, and Logos, and Anthropos, and Christus. The female Ions, too, became all as Aletheia, and Zoe, and Spiritus, and Ecclesia. Everything, then, being thus established, and brought into a state of perfect rest, they next tell us that these beings sang praises with great joy to the Propator, who himself shared in the abounding exaltation. Then, out of gratitude for the great benefit which had been conferred on them, the whole pleroma of the Ions, with one design and desire, and with the concurrence of Christ and the Holy Spirit, their Father also setting the seal of his approval on their conduct, brought together whatever each one had in himself of the greatest beauty and preciousness, and uniting all these contributions so as skillfully to blend the whole, they produced, to the honor and glory of Bythus, a being of most perfect beauty, the very star of the Pleroma, and the perfect fruit of it, namely, Jesus. Him they also speak of under the name of Savior, and Christ, and patronymically, Logos, and everything, because he was formed from the contributions of all. And then we are told that, by way of honor, angels of the same nature as himself were simultaneously produced to act as his bodyguard. Chapter 3. Texts of Holy Scripture used by these heretics to support their opinions. 1. Such, then, is the account they give of what took place within the Pleroma, such the calamities that flowed from the passion which seized upon the Ion, who has been named, and who was within a little of perishing by being absorbed in the universal substance, through her inquisitive searching after the Father, such the consolidation of that Ion from her condition of agony by Horos, and Staros, and Lytrotes, and Carpistes, and Horothetes, and Metagogies. Such also is the account of the generation of the later Ions, namely of the first Christ and of the Holy Spirit, both of whom were produced by the Father after the repentance of Sophia, and of the second Christ, whom they also style Saviour, who owed his being to the joint contributions of the Ions. They tell us, however, that this knowledge has not been openly divulged, because all are not capable of receiving it, but has been mystically revealed by the Saviour through means of parables to those qualified for understanding it. This has been done as follows. The thirty Ions are indicated, as we have already remarked, by the thirty years during which they say the Saviour performed no public act, and by the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Paul also, they affirm, very clearly and frequently names these Ions, and even goes so far as to preserve their order, when he says, To all the generations of the Ions of the Ion. Nay, we ourselves, when at the giving of thanks, we pronounce the words, To Ions of Ions, or for ever and ever, 
do set forth these ions, and in fine, wherever the words ion or ions occur, they at once refer them to these things. 2. The production, again, of the duodecad of the ions is indicated by the fact that the Lord was twelve years of age when he disputed with the teachers of the law, and by the election of the apostles, for of these there were twelve. The other eighteen ions were made manifest in this way, that the Lord, according to them, conversed with his disciples for eighteen months after his resurrection from the dead. They also affirm that these eighteen ions are strikingly indicated by the first two letters of his name, namely, Iota and Eta. And in like manner, they assert that the ten ions are pointed out by the letter Iota, which begins his name, while, for the same reason, they tell us the Saviour said, One Iota, or one tittle, shall by no means pass away until all be fulfilled. 3. They further maintain that the passion which took place in the case of the twelfth ion is pointed at by the apostasy of Judas, who was the twelfth apostle, and also by the fact that Christ suffered in the twelfth month. For their opinion is that he continued to preach for one year only after his baptism. The same thing is also most clearly indicated by the case of the woman who suffered from an issue of blood. For after she had been thus afflicted during twelve years, she was healed by the advent of the Saviour, when she had touched the border of his garment. And on this account the Saviour said, Who touched me? Teaching his disciples the mystery which had occurred among the Ions, and the healing of that Ion who had been involved in suffering. For she who had been afflicted twelve years represented that power whose essence, as they narrate, was stretching itself forth and flowing into immensity, and unless she had touched the garment of the sun, that is, Aletheia of the first tetrad, who is denoted by the hem spoken of, she would have been dissolved into the general essence of which she participated. She stopped short, however, and ceased any longer to suffer. For the power that went forth from the sun, and this power they term Horos, healed her and separated the passion from her. 4. They moreover affirm that the Saviour is shown to be derived from all the Ions, and to be in himself everything by the following passage. Every male that openeth the womb, for he, being everything, opened the womb of the enthinesis of the suffering Ion, when it had been expelled from the Pleroma. This they also style the second Ogdoad, of which we shall speak presently. And they state that it was clearly on this account that Paul said, and he himself is all things. And again, all things are to him, and of him are all things. And further, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. And yet again, all things are gathered together by God in Christ. Thus do they interpret these and any like passages to be found in Scripture. 5. They show, further, that that Horos of theirs, whom they call by a variety of names, has two faculties, the one of supporting and the other of separating, and in so far as he supports and sustains, he is Staros, while in so far as he divides and separates, he is Horos. They then represent the Saviour as having indicated his twofold faculty, first, the sustaining power when he said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross, or staros, and follow after me, cannot be my disciple. And again, Taking up the cross, follow me. But the separating power, when he said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. They also maintain that John indicated the same thing when he said, 
the fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge the floor and will gather the wheat into his garner but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire by this declaration he set forth the faculty of horos for that fan they explain to be the cross or staros which consumes no doubt all material objects as fire does chaff but it purifies all them that are saved as a fan does wheat moreover they affirm that the apostle paul himself made mention of this cross in the following words the doctrine of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but to us who are saved it is the power of god and again god forbid that i should glory in anything save in the cross of christ by whom the world is crucified to me and i unto the world six such then is the account which they all give of their pleroma and of the formation of the universe striving as they do to adapt the good words of revelation to their own wicked inventions and it is not only from the writings of the evangelists and the apostles that they endeavor to derive proofs for their opinions by means of perverse interpretations and deceitful expositions they deal in the same way with the law and the prophets which contain many parables and allegories that can frequently be drawn into various senses according to the kind of exegesis to which they are subjected and others of them with great craftiness adapting such parts of scripture to their own figments lead away captive from the truth those who do not retain a steadfast faith in one god the father almighty and in one lord jesus christ the son of god end of book one chapters one through three chapters four through six of irenaeus against heresies book one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. irenaeus against heresies book one translated by alexander roberts and william h rombo chapter four account given by the heretics of the formation of achimoth origin of the visible world from her disturbances one the following are the transactions which they narrate as having occurred outside of the pleroma the enthymesis of that sophia who dwells above which they also term achimoth being removed from the pleroma together with her passion they relate to have as a matter of course become violently excited in those places of darkness and vacuity to which she had been banished for she was excluded from light and the pleroma and was without form or figure like an untimely birth because she had received nothing from a male parent but the christ dwelling on high took pity upon her and having extended himself through and beyond staros he imparted a figure to her but merely as respected substance and not so as to convey intelligence having effected this he withdrew his influence and returned leaving achimoth to herself in order that she becoming sensible of her suffering as being severed from the pleroma might be influenced by the desire of better things while she possessed in the meantime a kind of odour of immortality left in her by christ and the holy spirit wherefore also she is called by two names sophia after her father for sophia is spoken of as being her father and holy spirit from that spirit who is along with christ having then obtained a form along with intelligence and being immediately deserted by that logos who had been invisibly present with her that is by christ she strained herself to discover that light which had forsaken her but could not affect her purpose inasmuch as she was prevented by horos and as horos thus obstructed her further progress he exclaimed io 
whence they say this name Io derived its origin. And when she could not pass by Horos on account of that passion in which she had been involved, and because she alone had been left without, she then resigned herself to every sort of that manifold and varied state of passion to which she was subject, and thus she suffered grief on the one hand because she had not obtained the object of her desire, and fear on the other hand, lest life itself should fail her as light had already done, while, in addition, she was in the greatest perplexity. All these feelings were associated with ignorance, and this ignorance of hers was not, like that of her mother, the first Sophia, an Ion, due to degeneracy by means of passion, but to an innate opposition of nature to knowledge. Moreover, another kind of passion fell upon her, namely, that of desiring to return to him who gave her life. 2. This collection of passions, they declare, was the substance of the matter from which this world was formed. For, from her desire of returning to him who gave her life, every soul belonging to this world, and that of the demiurge himself, derived its origin. All other things owed their beginning to her terror and sorrow. For, from her tears, all that is of a liquid nature was formed. From her smile, all that is lucent. And from her grief and perplexity, all the corporeal elements of the world. For at one time, as they affirm, she would weep and lament on account of being left alone in the midst of darkness and vacuity while at another time, reflecting on the light which had forsaken her, she would be filled with joy and laugh, then again she would be struck with terror, or at other times would sink into consternation and bewilderment. 3. Now what follows from all this? No light tragedy comes out of it, as the fancy of every man among them pompously explains one in one way and another in another, from what kind of passion and from what element being derived its origin. They have good reason, it seems to me, why they should not feel inclined to teach these things at all in public, but only to such as are able to pay a high price for an acquaintance with such profound mysteries. For these doctrines are not at all similar to those of which our Lord said, freely ye have received, freely give. They are, on the contrary, abstruse and portentous and profound mysteries, to be got at only with great labor by such as are in love with falsehood. For who would not expend all that he possessed, if only he might learn in return, that from the tears of the enthemesis of the Ion involved in passion, seas and fountains and rivers and every liquid substance derived its origin that light burst forth from her smile and that from her perplexity and consternation the corporeal elements of the world had their formation four i feel somewhat inclined myself to contribute a few hints towards the development of their system for when I perceive that waters are in part fresh, such as fountains, rivers, showers, and so on, and in part salt, such as those in the sea, I reflect with myself that all such waters cannot be derived from her tears, inasmuch as these are of a saline quality only. It is clear, therefore, that the waters which are salt are alone those which are derived from her tears. But it is probable that she in her intense agony and perplexity, was covered with perspiration, and hence, following out their notion, we may conceive that fountains and rivers and all the fresh water in the world are due to this source. For it is difficult, since we know that all tears are of the same quality, to believe that waters, both salt and fresh, proceeded from them. The more plausible supposition is, that some are from her tears, and some from her perspiration, 
and since there are also in the world certain waters which are hot and acrid in their nature, thou must be left to guess their origin, how and whence. Such are some of the results of their hypothesis. 5. They go on to state that, when the mother Achimoth had passed through all sorts of passion, and had with difficulty escaped from them, she turned herself to supplicate the light which had forsaken her, that is, Christ. He, however, having returned to the Pleroma, and being probably unwilling again to descend from it, sent forth to her the Paraclete, that is, the Saviour. This being was endowed with all power by the Father, who placed everything under his authority, the Ions doing likewise, so that by him were all things, visible and invisible, created, thrones, divinities, dominions. He then was sent to her along with his contemporary angels. And they relate that Achimoth, filled with reverence, at first veiled herself through modesty, but that, by and by, when she had looked upon him with all his endowments, and had acquired strength from his appearance, she ran forward to meet him. He then imparted to her form as respected intelligence, and brought healing to her passions, separating them from her, but not so as to drive them out of thought altogether. For it was not possible that they should be annihilated as in the former case, because they had already taken root and acquired strength, so as to possess an indestructible existence. All that he could do was to separate them, and set them apart, and then commingle and condense them, so as to transmute them from incorporeal passion into unorganized matter. He then by this process conferred upon them a fitness and a nature to become concretions and corporeal structures, in order that the two substances should be formed, the one evil resulting from the passions, and the other subject indeed to suffering, but originating from her conversion. And on this account, i.e., on account of this hypostasizing of ideal matter, they say that the Saviour virtually created the world. But when Achimoth was freed from her passion, she gazed with rapture on the dazzling vision of the angels that were with him, and in her ecstasy, conceiving by them, they tell us that she brought forth new beings, partly after her own image, and partly a spiritual progeny after the image of the Saviour's attendants. Chapter 5. Formation of the Demiurge. Description of Him. He is the creator of everything outside of the Pleroma. 1. These three kinds of existence, then, having according to them being now formed, one from the passion, which was matter, a second from the conversion, which was animal, and a third, that which she, Achimoth, herself brought forth, which was spiritual, she next addressed herself to the task of giving these form. But she could not succeed in doing this, as respected the spiritual existence, because it was of the same nature with herself. She therefore applied herself to give form to the animal substance which had proceeded from her own conversion, and to bring forth to light the instructions of the Saviour. And they say she first formed out of the animal substance him who was father and king of all things, both of these which are of the same nature with himself, that is, animal substances, which they also call right-handed, and those which spring from the passion and from matter, which they call left-handed. For they affirm that he formed all the things which came into existence after him, being secretly impelled thereto by his mother. From this circumstance they style him Metropator, Apator, Demiurge, and Father, saying that he is father of the substances on the right hand, that is, of the animal, but Demiurge of those on the left, that is, of the material, while he is at the same time the king of all, 
for they say that this enthemesis, desirous of making all things to the honor of the Ions, formed images of them, or rather that the Saviour did so through her instrumentality. And she, in the image of the invisible Father, kept herself concealed from the Demiurge. But he was in the image of the only begotten Son, and the angels and archangels created by him were in the image of the rest of the Ions. 2. They affirm, therefore, that he was constituted the Father and God of everything outside of the Pleroma, being the creator of all animal and material substances. For he it was that discriminated these two kinds of existence hitherto confused, and made corporeal from incorporeal substances, fashioned things heavenly and earthly, and became framer, that is, demiurge, of things material and animal, of those on the right and those on the left, of the light and of the heavy, and of those tending upwards as well as those tending downwards. He created also seven heavens, above which they say that he, the Demiurge, exists. And on this account they term him Hebdomas, and his mother Achemoth Ogdoas, preserving the number of the first begotten and primary Ogdoad of the Pleroma. They affirm, moreover, that these seven heavens are intelligent, and speak of them as being angels, while they refer to the Demiurge himself as being an angel bearing a likeness to God. And in the same strain, they declare that Paradise, situated above the third heaven, is a fourth angel possessed of power, from whom Adam derived certain qualities while he conversed with him. 3. They go on to say that the Demiurge imagined that he created all these things of himself, while he in reality made them in conjunction with the productive power of Achimoth. He formed the heavens, yet was ignorant of the heavens. He fashioned man, yet knew not man. He brought to light the earth, yet had no acquaintance with the earth. And, in like manner, they declare that he was ignorant of the forms of all that he made, and knew not even of the existence of his own mother, but imagined that he himself was all things. They further affirm that his mother originated this opinion in his mind, because she desired to bring him forth, possessed of such a character, that he should be the head and source of his own essence and the absolute ruler over every kind of operation that was afterwards attempted. His mother they also call Ogdoad, Sophia, Terra, Jerusalem, Holy Spirit, and with a masculine reference, Lord. Her place of habitation is an indeterminate one, above the Demiurge indeed, but below and outside of the Pleroma, even to the end. 4. As, then, they represent all material substance to be formed from three passions, these fear, grief, and perplexity, the account they give is as follows. Animal substances originated from fear and from conversion. The Demiurge they also describe as owing his origin to conversion. But the existence of all other animal substances they ascribe to fear such as the souls of irrational animals and of wild beasts and men. And on this account he, that is, the Demiurge, being incapable of recognizing any spiritual essences, imagined himself to be God alone, and declared through the prophets, I am God, and besides me there is none else. They further teach that the spirits of wickedness derived their origin from grief. Hence the devil, whom they also call Cosmocrator, that is, the ruler of the world, and the demons, and the angels, and every wicked spiritual being that exists, found the source of their existence. They represent the Demiurge as being the son of that mother of theirs, that is, Achimoth, 
and Cosmocrator as the creature of the Demiurge. Cosmocrator has knowledge of what is above himself, because he is a spirit of wickedness. But the Demiurge is ignorant of such things, inasmuch as he is merely animal. Their mother dwells in that place which is above the heavens, that is, in the intermediate abode. The Demiurge in the heavenly place, that is, in the Hebdomad, but the Cosmocrator in this, our world. The corporeal elements of this world, again, sprang, as we before remarked, from bewilderment and perplexity, as from a more ignoble source. Thus, the earth arose from her state of stupor, water from the agitation caused by her fear, air from the consolidation of her grief, while fire, producing death and corruption, was inherent in all these elements, even as they teach that ignorance also lay concealed in these three passions. 5. Having thus formed the world, he, that is the demiurge, also created the earthly part of man, not taking him from his dry earth, but from an invisible substance consisting of fusible and fluid matter, and then afterwards, as they define the process, breathed into him the animal part of his nature. It was the latter which was created after his image and likeness. The material part, indeed, was very near to God, so far as the image went, but not of the same substance with him. The animal, on the other hand, was so in respect to likeness, and hence his substance was called the spirit of life, because it took its rise from a spiritual outflowing. After all this, he was, they say, enveloped all round with a covering of skin, and by this they mean the outward sensitive flesh. 6. But they further affirm that the Demiurge himself was ignorant of that offspring of his mother Achimoth, which she brought forth as a consequence of her contemplation of those angels who waited on the Saviour, and which was, like herself, of a spiritual nature. She took advantage of this ignorance to deposit it in him without his knowledge, in order that, being by his instrumentality infused into that animal soul proceeding from himself, and being thus carried as in a womb in this material body, while it gradually increased in strength, might in course of time become fitted for the reception of perfect rationality. Thus it came to pass, then, according to them, that without any knowledge on the part of the Demiurge, the man formed by his inspiration was at the same time, through an unspeakable providence, rendered a spiritual man by the simultaneous inspiration received from Sophia. For as he was ignorant of his mother, so neither did he recognize her offspring. This offspring they also declare to be the Ecclesia, an emblem of the Ecclesia which is above. This, then, is the kind of man whom they conceive of. He has his animal soul from the demiurge, his body from the earth, his fleshly part from matter, and his spiritual part from the mother Achimoth. Chapter 6. The Threefold Kind of Man Feigned by These Heretics Good Works Needless for Them, Though Necessary to Others Their Abandoned Morals 1. There being thus three kinds of substances, they declare of all that is material, which they also describe as being on the left hand, that it must of necessity perish, inasmuch as it is incapable of receiving any inflatus of incorruption. As to every animal existence, which they also denominate on the right hand, they hold that, inasmuch as it is a mean between the spiritual and the material, it passes to the side to which inclination draws it. Spiritual substance, again, they describe as having been sent forth for this end, that, being here united with that which is animal, it might assume shape, 
the two elements being simultaneously subjected to the same discipline. And this they declare to be the salt and the light of the world. For the animal substance has need of training by means of the outward senses. And on this account they affirm that the world was created, as well as that the Savior came to the animal substance, which was possessed of free will, that he might secure for it salvation. For they affirm that he received the first fruits of those whom he was to save, as follows. From Achamoth, that was the spiritual, while he was invested by the demiurge with the animal Christ, but was beget by a special dispensation with a body endowed with an animal nature, yet constructed with unspeakable skill, so that it might be visible and tangible and capable of enduring suffering. At the same time, they deny that he assumed anything material unto his nature, since indeed matter is incapable of salvation. They further hold that the consummation of all things will take place when all that is spiritual has been formed and perfected by gnosis, that is, knowledge. And by this, they mean spiritual men who have attained to the perfect knowledge of God, and been initiated into these mysteries by Achamoth. And they represent themselves to be these persons. 2. Animal men, again, are instructed in animal things. Such men, namely, as are established by their works, and by a mere faith, while they have not perfect knowledge. We, of the church, they say, are these persons. Wherefore also they maintain that good works are necessary to us, for that otherwise it is impossible we should be saved. But as to themselves, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual in nature. For just as it is impossible that material substance should partake of salvation, since indeed they maintain that it is incapable of receiving it, so again it is impossible that spiritual substance, by which they mean themselves, should ever come under the power of corruption, whatever the sort of actions in which they indulged. For even as gold, when submersed in filth, loses not on that account its beauty, but retains its own native qualities, the filth having no power to injure the gold, so they affirm that they cannot in any measure suffer hurt, or lose their spiritual substance, whatever the material actions in which they may be involved. 3. Wherefore also it comes to pass, that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all kinds of forbidden deeds, of which the Scriptures assures us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For instance, they make no scruple about eating meats offered in sacrifice to idols, imagining that they can in this way contract no defilement. Then again, at every heathen festival celebrated in honor of the idols, these men are the first to assemble, and to such a pitch do they go that some of them do not even keep away from that bloody spectacle, hateful both to God and men, in which gladiators either fight with wild beasts, or singly encounter one another. Others of them yield themselves up to the lusts of the flesh, with the utmost greediness, maintaining that carnal things should be allowed to the carnal nature, while the spiritual things are provided for the spiritual. Some of them, moreover, are in the habit of defiling those women to whom they have taught the above doctrine, as has frequently been confessed by those women who have been led astray by certain of them. On their returning to the church of God, and acknowledging this along with the rest of their errors, but of them, too, openly and without a blush, having become passionately attached to certain women, 
seduce them away from their husbands, and contract marriages of their own with them. Others of them, again, who pretend at first to live in all modesty with them as with sisters, have in course of time been revealed in their true colors when the sister has been found with child by her pretended brother. 4. And committing many other abominations and impieties, they run us down, who from the fear of God guard against sinning even in thought or word, as utterly contemptible and ignorant persons, while they highly exalt themselves and claim to be perfect and the elect seed. For they declare that we simply receive grace for use, wherefore also it will again be taken away from us, but that they themselves have grace as their own special possession, which has descended from above by means of an unspeakable and indescribable conjunction, and on this account more will be given them. They maintain, therefore, that in every way it is always necessary for them to practice the mystery of conjunction. And that they may persuade the thoughtless to believe this, they are in the habit of using these very words. Whosoever being in this world does not so love a woman as to obtain possession of her, is not of the truth, nor shall attain the truth. But whosoever being of this world has intercourse with woman, shall not attain the truth, because he has acted under the power of concupiscence. On this account, they tell us that it is necessary for us whom they call animal men, and describe as being of the world, to practice continence and good works, that by this means we may attain at length to the intermediate habitation, but that to them, who are called the spiritual and perfect, such a course of conduct is not at all necessary. For it is not conduct of any kind which leads into the pleroma, but the seed sent forth thence in a feeble, immature state, and here brought to perfection. End of Book 1, Chapters 4 through 6《Chapters 7 through 8 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and W. H. Rombo. — Chapter 7. The Mother Achamoth, When All Her Seed Are Perfected, shall pass into the pleroma, accompanied by those men who are spiritual. The demiurge, with animal men, shall pass into the intermediate habitation, but all material men shall go into corruption. Their blasphemous opinions against the true incarnation of Christ by the Virgin Mary, their views as to the prophecies, stupid ignorance of the demiurge. 1. When all the seed shall have come to perfection, they state that then their mother Achamoth shall pass from the intermediate place and enter in within the pleroma, and shall receive as her spouse the Saviour, who sprang from all the Ions, that thus a conjunction may be formed between the Saviour and Sophia, that is, Achamoth. These then are the bridegroom and bride while the nuptial chamber is the full extent of the pleroma. The spiritual seed, again, being divested of their animal souls, and becoming intelligent spirits, shall, in an irresistible and invisible manner, enter in within the pleroma, and be bestowed as brides on those angels who wait upon the Saviour. The demiurge himself will pass into the place of his mother Sophia, that is, the intermediate habitation. In this intermediate place, also, shall the souls of the righteous repose, but nothing of an animal nature shall find admittance to the pleroma. When these things have taken place as described, 
then shall that fire which lies hidden in the world blaze forth and bloom, and while destroying all matter, shall also be extinguished along with it, and have no further existence. They affirm that the Demiurge was acquainted with none of these things before the advent of the Saviour. 2. There are also some who maintain that he also produced Christ as his own proper son, but of an animal nature, and that mention was made of him by the prophets. This Christ passed through Mary, just as water flows through a tube, and there descended upon him in the form of a dove at the time of his baptism. That Saviour, who belonged to the Pleroma, and was formed by the combined efforts of all its inhabitants, in him there existed also that spiritual seed which proceeded from Achimoth. They hold, accordingly, that our Lord, while preserving the type of the first begotten and primary tetrad, was compounded of these four substances, of that which is spiritual, in so far as he was from Achimoth, and that which is animal, as being from the demiurge by a special dispensation inasmuch as he was formed corporeally with unspeakable skill, and of the Saviour, as respects that dove which descended upon him. He also continued free from all suffering, since indeed it was not possible that he should suffer who was at once incomprehensible and invisible. And for this reason, the Spirit of Christ who had been placed within him was taken away when he was brought before Pilate. They maintain, further, that not even the seed which he had received from the mother, that is, Achimoth, was subject to suffering. For it, too, was impassable, and being spiritual and invisible even to the Demiurge himself. It follows, then, according to them, that the animal Christ, and that which had been formed mysteriously by a special dispensation, underwent suffering, that the mother might exhibit through him a type of the Christ above, namely, of him who extended himself through Staros, and imparted to Achimoth shape, so far as substance was concerned. For they declare that all these transactions were counterparts of what took place above. 3. They maintain, moreover, that those souls which possess the seed of Achimoth are superior to the rest, and are more dearly loved by the Demiurge than others, while he knows not the true cause thereof, but imagines that they are what they are through his favor towards them. Wherefore also they say he distributed them to prophets, priests, and kings, and they declare that many things were spoken by this seed through the prophets, inasmuch as it was endowed with a transcendently lofty nature. The mother also, they say, spake much about things above, and that both through him and through the souls which were formed by him. Then again, they divide the prophecies into different classes, maintaining that one portion was uttered by the mother, a second by her seed, and a third by the demiurge. In like manner, they hold that Jesus uttered some things under the influence of the Saviour, others under that of the Mother, and others still under that of the Demiurge, as we shall show further on in our work. 4. The Demiurge, while ignorant of those things which were higher than himself, was indeed excited by the announcements made through the prophets, but treated them with contempt attributing them sometimes to one cause, and sometimes to another, either to the prophetic spirit which itself possesses the power of self-excitement, or to mere unassisted man, or that it was simply a crafty device of the lower and baser order of men. He remained thus ignorant until the appearing of the Lord. But they relate that when the Saviour came, the Demiurge learned all things from him, and gladly with all, his power joined himself to him. They maintain that he is the centurion mentioned in the Gospel, who addressed the Saviour with these words, 
For I also am one having soldiers and servants under my authority, and whatsoever I command they do. They further hold that he will continue administering the affairs of the world as long as that is fitting and needful, and especially that he may exercise a care over the church, while at the same time he is influenced by the knowledge of the reward prepared for him, namely, that he may attain to the habitation of his mother. 5. They conceive, then, of three kinds of men, spiritual, material, and animal, represented by Cain, Abel, and Seth. These three natures are no longer found in one person, but constitute various kinds of men. The material goes, as a matter of course, into corruption. The animal, if it make choice of the better part, finds repose in the intermediate place, but if the worse, it too shall pass into destruction. But they assert that the spiritual principles which have been sown by Achamoth, being disciplined and nourished here from that time until now in righteous souls, because when given forth by her they were yet but weak, at last attaining to perfection, shall be given as brides to the angels of the Saviour, while their animal souls of necessity rest for ever with the demiurge in the intermediate place. And again, subdividing the animal souls themselves, they say that some are by nature good, and others by nature evil. The good are those who become capable of receiving the spiritual seed. The evil by nature are those who are never able to receive that seed. Chapter 8 how the Valentinians pervert the scriptures to support their own pious opinions. 1. Such, then, is their system, which neither the prophets announced, nor the Lord taught, nor the apostles delivered, but of which they boast that beyond all others they have perfect knowledge. They gather their views from other sources than the scriptures, and to use a common proverb, they strive to weave ropes of sand, while they endeavor to adapt with an air of probability to their own peculiar assertions and parables of the Lord, the sayings of the prophets, and the words of the apostles, in order that their scheme may not seem altogether without support. In doing so, however, they disregard the order and the connection of the scriptures, and so far as in them lies, dismember and destroy the truth. By transferring passages and dressing them up anew, and making one thing out of another, they succeed in deluding many through their wicked art in adapting the oracles of the Lord to their opinions. Their manner of acting is just as if one, when a beautiful image of a king has been constructed by some skillful artist out of precious jewels, should then take this likeness of the man all to pieces, should rearrange the gems, and so fit them together as to make them into the form of a dog or a fox, and even that but poorly executed, and should then maintain and declare that this was the beautiful image of the king which the skillful artist constructed, pointing to the jewels which had been admirably fitted together by the first artist to form the image of the king, but have been with bad effect transferred by the latter one to the shape of a dog, and by thus exhibiting the jewels, should deceive the ignorant, who had no conception what a king's form was like, and persuade them that that miserable likeness of the fox was, in fact, the beautiful image of the king. In like manner do these persons patch together old wives' fables, and then endeavor, by violently drawing away from their proper connection, words, expressions, and parables whenever found, to adapt the oracles of God to their baseless fictions. We have already stated how far they proceed in this way, with respect to the interior of the Pleroma. 2. Then again, as to those things outside of their Pleroma, the following are some specimens of what they attempt to accommodate out of the scriptures to their opinions. They affirm that the Lord came in the last times of the world to endure suffering, for this end, that he might indicate the passion which occurred to the last of the Ions, and might by his own end 
announce the secession of that disturbance which had risen among the Ions. They maintain, further, that that girl of twelve years old, the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue to whom the Lord approached and raised her from the dead, was a type of Achimoth, to whom their Christ, by extending himself, imparted shape, and whom he led anew to the perception of that light which had forsaken her, and that the Saviour appeared to her when she lay outside of the Pleroma as a kind of abortion, they affirm Paul to have declared in his epistle to the Corinthians in these words. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one born out of due time. Again, the coming of the Saviour with his attendance to Achimoth is declared in like manner by him in the same epistle when he says, A woman ought to have a veil upon her head because of the angels. Now that Achimoth, when the Saviour came upon her, drew a veil over herself through modesty, Moses rendered manifest when he put a veil upon his face. So also they say that the passions which she endured were indicated by the Lord upon the cross. Thus, when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He simply showed that Sophia was deserted by the light, and was restrained by Horos from making any advance forward. Her anguish again was indicated when he said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Her fear by the words, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And her perplexity too when he said, And what I shall say I know not. 3. And they teach that he pointed out three kinds of men as follows. The material, when he said to him that asked him, Shall I follow thee? The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. The animal, when he said to him that declared, I will follow thee, but suffer me first to bid them farewell that are in my house. No man putting his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. For this man may declare to be of the intermediate class, even as they do that other who, though he professed to have wrought a large amount of righteousness, yet refused to follow him, and was so overcome by the love of riches as never to reach perfection, this one it pleases them to place in the animal class. The spiritual, again, when he said, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And when he said to Zacchaeus the publican, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide in thine house. For these they declared to have belonged to the spiritual class. Also, the parable of the leaven, which the woman is described as having hid in three measures of meal, they declare to make manifest the three classes. For according to their teaching, the woman represented Sophia, the three measures of meal, the three kinds of men, spiritual, animal, and material, while the leaven denoted the Savior himself. Paul, too, very plainly set forth the material, animal, and spiritual, saying in one place, As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And in another place, But the animal man receiveth not the things of the spirit. And again, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. And this, The animal man receiveth not the things of the spirit they affirm to have been spoken concerning the demiurge, who, as being animal, knew neither his mother, who was spiritual, nor his seed, nor the ions in the pleroma, and that the Saviour received firstfruits of those whom he was to save, Paul declared when he said, And if the firstfruits be holy, the lump is also holy, teaching that the expression firstfruits denoted that which is spiritual, but that the lump meant us, that is, the animal church, the lump of which they say he assumed and blended it with himself, inasmuch as he is the leaven. 4. 
Moreover, that Achimoth wandered beyond the Pleroma, and received form from Christ, and was sought after by the Saviour, they declare that he indicated when he said that he had come after that sheep which was gone astray. For they explain the wandering sheep to mean their mother, by whom they represent the church as having been sown. The wandering itself denotes her stay outside of the Pleroma in a state of varied passion, from which they maintain that matter derived its origin. The woman, again, who sweeps the house and finds the piece of money, they declare to denote the Sophia above, who, having lost her enthymesis, afterwards recovered it, on all things being purified by the advent of the Saviour. Wherefore, this substance also, according to them, was reinstated in Pleroma. They say, too, that Simeon, who took Christ into his arms, and gave thanks to God, and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word, was a type of the Demiurge, who, on the arrival of the Saviour, learned his own change of place, and gave thanks to Bythus. They also assert that by Anna, who is spoken of in the Gospel as a prophetess, and who, after living seven years with her husband, passed all the rest of her life in widowhood until she saw the Saviour, and recognized him, and spoke of him to all, was most plainly indicated Achemoth, who, having for a little while looked upon the Saviour with his associates, and dwelling all the rest of the time in the intermediate place, waited for him till he should come again, and restore her to her proper consort. Her name, too, was indicated by the Saviour when he said, Yet wisdom is justified by her children. This, too, was done by Paul in these words, But we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. They declare also that Paul has referred to the conjunctions within the Pleroma, showing them forth by means of one, for, when writing of the conjugal union in this life, he expressed himself thus, This is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church. 5. Further, they teach that John, the disciple of the Lord, indicated the first Ogdoad, expressing themselves in these words. John, the disciple of the Lord, wishing to set forth the origin of all things, so as to explain how the Father produced the whole, lays down a certain principle, that, namely, which was first begotten by God, which being he has termed both the only begotten Son and God, in whom the Father, after a seminal manner, brought forth all things. By him the word was produced, and in him the whole substance of the ions, to which the word himself afterwards imparted form. Since, therefore, he treats of the first origin of things, he rightly proceeds in his teaching from the beginning, that is, from God and the Word. And he expresses himself thus, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Having first of all distinguished these three, God, the beginning, and the word, he again unites them, that he may exhibit the production of each of them, that is, of the Son and of the word, and may at the same time show their union with one another and with the Father. For the beginning is in the Father and of the Father, while the word is in the beginning and of the beginning. Very properly, then, did he say, in the beginning was the Word, for he was in the Son, and the Word was with God, for he was the beginning, and the Word was God, of course, for that which is begotten of God is God. The same was in the beginning with God. This clause discloses the order of production. All things were made by him and without him was nothing made. For the Word was the author of form and beginning to all the ions that came into existence after him. But, 
what was made in him, says John, is life. Here again he indicated conjunction, for all things, he said, were made by him, and in him was life. This, then, which is in him, is more closely connected with him than those things which were simply made by him, for it exists along with him, and is developed by him. When again he adds, And the life was the light of men. While thus mentioning Anthropos, he indicated also Ecclesia by that one expression, in order that, by using only one name, he might disclose their fellowship with one another in virtue of their conjunction. For Anthropos and Ecclesia spring from Logos and Zoe. Moreover, he styled life, or Zoe, the light of men, because they are enlightened by her, that is, formed and made manifest. This also Paul declares in these words, For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Since, therefore, Zoe manifested and begot both Anthropos and Ecclesia, she is termed their light. Thus, then, did John by these words reveal both other things and the second tetrad, Logos and Zoe, Anthropos and Ecclesia. And still further, he also indicated the first tetrad. For, in discoursing of the Saviour, and declaring that all things beyond the Pleroma received form from him, he says that he is the fruit of the entire Pleroma, for he styles him a light which shineth in darkness, and which was not comprehended. By it, inasmuch as, when he imparted form to all those things which had their origin from passion, he was not known by it. He also styles him sun, and Aletheia, and Zoe, and the word made flesh, whose glory, he says, we beheld, and his glory was that, of the only begotten, given to him by the Father, full of grace and truth. But what John really does say is this, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thus then does he, according to them, distinctly set forth the first tetrad, when he speaks of the Father, and Charis, and Monogenes, and Aletheia. In this way, too, does John tell of the first Ogdoad, and that which is the mother of all the Ions. For he mentions the Father, and Charis, and Monogenes, and Aletheia, and Logos, and Zoe, and Anthropos, and Ecclesia. Such are the views of Ptolemaeus. End of Book 1, Chapters 7 through 8. Chapters 9 through 11 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies. Book 1, translated by Alexander Roberts and W. H. Rombo. Chapter 9. Refutation of the Impious Interpretations of These Heretics. 1. You see, my friend, the method which these men employ to deceive themselves, while they abuse the scriptures by endeavoring to support their own system out of them. For this reason, I have brought forward their modes of expressing themselves, that thus thou mightest understand the deceitfulness of their procedure, and the wickedness of their error. For, in the first place, if it had been John's intention to set forth that Ogdoad above, he would surely have preserved the order of its production, and would doubtless have placed the primary tetrad first as being, according to them, most venerable, and would then have annexed the second, that, by the sequence of the names, the order of the Ogdoad might be exhibited, 
and not after so long an interval, as if forgetful for the moment, and then again calling the matter to mind, he, last of all, made mention of the primary tetrad. In the next place, if he had meant to indicate their conjunctions, he certainly would have omitted the name of Ecclesia, while, with respect to the other conjunctions, he either would have been satisfied with the mention of the male ions, since the others, like Ecclesia, might be understood, so as to preserve a uniformity throughout. Or, if he enumerated the conjunctions of the rest, he would also have announced the spouse of Anthropos, and would not have left us to find out her name by divination. 2. The fallacy, then, of this exposition is manifest. For when John, proclaiming one God, the Almighty, and one Jesus Christ, the only begotten, by whom all things were made, declares that this was the Son of God, this the only begotten, this the former of all things, this the true light who enlighteneth every man, this the creator of the world, this he that came to his own, this he that became flesh and dwelt among us. These men, by a plausible kind of exposition, perverting these statements, maintain that there was another monogenes, according to production, whom they also style Arche. They also maintain that there was another Saviour, and another Logos, the son of Monogenes, and another Christ, produced for the re-establishment of the Pleroma. Thus it is that, resting from the truth every one of the expressions which have been cited, and taking a bad advantage of the names, they have transferred them to their own system, so that, according to them, in all these terms, John makes no mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. For if he has named the Father, and Charis, and Monogenes, and Aletheia, and Logos, and Zoe, and Anthropos, and Ecclesia, according to their hypothesis, he has, by thus speaking, referred to the primary Ogdoad, in which there was as yet no Jesus, and no Christ, the teacher of John but that the Apostle did not speak concerning their conjunctions, but concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, whom he also acknowledges as the word of God, he himself has made evident. For summing up his statements respecting the word previously mentioned by him, he further declares, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. But according to their hypothesis, the word did not become flesh at all, inasmuch as he never went outside of the pleroma, but that Saviour became flesh who was formed by a special dispensation out of all the ions, and was of later date than the word. 3. Learn then, ye foolish men, that Jesus who suffered for us, and who dwelt among us, is himself the word of God. For if any other of the Ions had become flesh for our salvation, it would have been probable that the Apostle spoke of another. But if the word of the Father, who descended, is the same also that ascended, he, namely, the only begotten Son of the only God, who, according to the good pleasure of the Father, became flesh for the sake of men, the Apostle certainly does not speak regarding any other or concerning any Ogdoad, but respecting our Lord Jesus Christ. For according to them, the Word did not originally become flesh. For they maintain that the Saviour assumed an animal body, formed in accordance with a special dispensation by an unspeakable providence, so as to become visible and palpable. But flesh is that which was of old formed for Adam by God out of the dust. And it is this that John has declared the word of God became. Thus is their primary and first begotten Ogdoad brought to naught. For since Logos and Monogenes and Zoe and Phaus and Sorer and Christus and the Son of God and He who became incarnate for us have been proved to be one and the same, 
the Ogdoad, which they have built up at once, falls to pieces. And when this is destroyed, their whole system sinks into ruin, a system which they falsely dream into existence, and thus inflict injury on the scriptures, while they build up their own hypothesis. 4. Then again, collecting a set of expressions and names scattered here and there in scripture, they twist them, as we have already said, from a natural to a non-natural sense. In so doing, they act like those who bring forward any kind of hypothesis they fancy, and then endeavor to support them out of the poems of Homer, so that the ignorant imagine that Homer actually composed the verses bearing upon that hypothesis, which has, in fact, been newly constructed, and many others are led so far by the regularly formed sequence of verses as to doubt whether Homer may not have composed them. Of this kind is the following passage, where one, describing Hercules as having been sent by Eurystheus to the dog in the infernal regions, does so by means of these Homeric verses. For there can be no objection to our citing these by way of illustration, since the same sort of attempt appears in both. Thus saying, there sent forth from his house deeply groaning, Odyssey, Book 10, Line 76. The hero Hercules conversant with mighty deeds. Odyssey, Book 21, Line 26. Eurystheus, the son of Sthenelus, descended from Perseus. Iliad, Book 19, Line 123. That he might bring from Erebus the dog of gloomy Pluto. Iliad, Book 8, line 368. And he advanced like a mountain-bred lion, confident of strength. Odyssey, book 6, line 130. Rapidly through the city where all his friends followed. Iliad, book 24, line 327. Both maidens and youths, and much enduring old men. Odyssey, book 11, line 38 mourning for him bitterly as one going forward to death. Iliad, book 24, line 328. But Mercury and the blue-eyed Minerva conducted him. Odyssey, book 11, 626. For she knew the mind of her brother, how it labored with grief. Iliad, book 2, line 409. Now, what simple-minded man, I ask, would not be led away by such verses as to think that Homer actually framed them so with reference to the subject indicated. But he who is acquainted with the Homeric writings will recognize these verses indeed, but not the subject to which they are applied, as knowing that some of them were spoken of Ulysses, others of Hercules himself, others still of Priam, and others again of Menelaus and Agamemnon, but if he takes them and restores each of them to its proper position, he at once destroys the narrative in question. In like manner, he also who retains unchangeable in his heart the rule of the truth which he received by means of baptism, will doubtless recognize the names and expressions and the parables taken from the scriptures, but will by no means acknowledge the blasphemous use which these men make of them. For though he will acknowledge the gems, he will certainly not receive the fox instead of the likeness of the king. But when he has restored every one of the expressions quoted to its proper position, and has fitted it to the body of the truth, he will lay bare, and prove to be without any foundation, the figment of these heretics. 5. But since what may prove a finishing stroke to this exhibition is wanting, so that any one, on following out their farce to the end, may then at once append an argument which shall overthrow it, we have judged it well to point out, first of all, in what respects the very fathers of this fable differ among themselves, as if they were inspired by different spirits of error. For this very fact forms an a priori proof that the truth proclaimed by the church is immovable, and that the theories of these men are but a tissue of falsehoods. 
Chapter 10. Unity of the Faith of the Church Throughout the Whole World. 1. The Church, though dispersed through our whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith, she believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations of God and the advents, and the birth from a virgin, and the passion and the resurrection from the dead, and the ascension into heaven in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his future manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father to gather all things in one, and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race, in order that to Christ Jesus, our Lord and God and Savior and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess to him that he should execute just judgments towards all, that he may send spiritual wickednesses, and the angels who transgressed and became apostates, together with the ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane among men, into everlasting fire, but may in the exercise of his grace, confer immortality on the righteous and holy, and those who have kept his commandments, and have persevered in his love, some from the beginning of their Christian course, and others from the date of their repentance, and may surround them with everlasting glory. 2. As I have already observed, the Church, having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, yet, as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. She also believes these points of doctrine, just as if she had but one soul, and one and the same heart, and she proclaims them, and teaches them, and hands them down with perfect harmony, as if she possessed only one mouth. For although the languages of the world are dissimilar, yet the import of the tradition is one and the same, for the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand down anything different, nor do those in Spain, nor those in Gaul, nor those in the East, nor those in Egypt, nor those in Libya, nor those which have been established in the central regions of the world. But as the Son, that creature of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world, so also the preaching of the truth shineth everywhere, and enlightens all men that are willing to come to a knowledge of the truth. Nor will any one of the rulers in the churches, however highly gifted he may be in point of eloquence, teach doctrines different from these, for one is greater than the master. Nor, on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression inflict injury on the tradition. For the faith, being ever one and the same, neither does one who is able at great length to discourse regarding it make any addition to it, nor does one who can say but little diminish it. 3. It does not follow because men are endowed with greater and less degrees of intelligence, that they should therefore change the subject matter of the faith itself and should conceive of some other god besides him who is the framer, maker, and preserver of this universe, as if he were not sufficient for them, or of another Christ, or another only begotten. But the fact referred to simply implies this, that one may, more accurately than another, bring out the meaning of those things which have been spoken in parables, and accommodate them to the general scheme of the faith, and explain with special clearness the operation and dispensation of God connected with human salvation, and show that God manifested long-suffering in regard to the apostasy of the angels who transgressed, as also with respect to the disobedience of men, and set forth why it is that one and the same God 
has made some things temporal and some eternal, some heavenly and others earthly, and understand for what reason God, though invisible, manifested himself to the prophets, not under one form, but differently to different individuals, and show why it was that more covenants than one were given to mankind, and teach what was the special character of each of these covenants, and search out for what reason God hath included every man in unbelief, that he may have mercy upon all, and gratefully describe on what account the word of God became flesh and suffered, and relate why the advent of the Son of God took place in these last times, that is, in the end, rather than in the beginning of the world, and unfold what is contained in the scriptures concerning the end itself, and things to come, and not be silent as to how it is that God has made the Gentiles, whose salvation was despaired of, fellow heirs, and of the same body and partakers with the saints, and discourse how it is that this mortal body shall put on immortality, and this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and proclaim in what sense God says, That is a people who was not a people, and she is beloved who was not beloved. And in what sense he says that, More are the children of her that was desolate than of her who possessed a husband. For in reference to these points, and others of a like nature, the apostle exclaims, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! But the superior skill spoken of is not found in this, that any one should, beyond the creator and framer of the world, conceive of the enthymeses of an erring ion, their mother and his, and should thus proceed to such a pitch of blasphemy, nor does it consist in this that he should again falsely imagine as being above this fancied being a pleroma at one time supposed to contain thirty and at another time an innumerable tribe of ions as these teachers who are destitute of truly divine wisdom maintain while the catholic church possesses one and the same faith throughout the whole world as we have already said chapter eleven the opinions of Valentinus and those of his disciples and others. 1. Let us now look at the inconsistent opinions of those heretics, for there are some two or three of them, how they do not agree in treating the same points, but alike, in things and names, set forth opinions mutually discordant. The first of them, Valentinus, who adapted the principles of the heresy called Gnostic to the peculiar character of his own school, taught as follows. He maintained that there is a certain dyad, or twofold being, who is inexpressible by any name, of whom one part should be called Archytus, or unspeakable, and the other Sigi, or silence. But of this dyad, a second was produced, one part of whom he names Pater, and the other Aletheia, from this tetrad, again, arose Logos and Zoe, Anthropos and Ecclesia. These constitute the primary Ogdoad. He next states that from Logos and Zoe, ten powers were produced, as we have before mentioned. But from Anthropos and Ecclesia proceeded twelve, one of which, separating from the rest, and falling from its original condition, produced the rest of the universe. He also supposed two beings of the name of Horos, and one of whom has his place between Bythus and the rest of the Pleroma, and divides the created Ions from the uncreated Father, while the other separates their mother from the Pleroma. Christ also was not produced from the Ions within the Pleroma, but was brought forth by the mother who had been excluded from it in virtue of her remembrance of better things, but not without a kind of shadow. He indeed, as being masculine, having severed the shadow from himself, returned to the Pleroma, but his mother, being left with the shadow, and deprived of her spiritual substance, brought forth another son, 
namely the Demiurge, whom he also styles the supreme ruler of all those things which are subject to him. He also asserts that along with the Demiurge there was produced a left-hand power, in which particular he agrees with those falsely called Gnostics, of whom we have yet to speak. Sometimes again he maintains that Jesus was produced from him who was separated from their mother, and united to the rest, that is, from Thelitus, sometimes as springing from him who returned into the Pleroma, that is, from Christ, and at other times still as derived from Anthropos and Ecclesia. And he declares that the Holy Spirit was produced by Eletheia for the inspection and fructification of the ions, by entering invisibly into them, and that, in this way, the ions brought forth the plants of truth. 2. Secundus again affirms that the primary Ogdoad consists of the right hand and a left hand tetrad, and teaches that the one of these is called light and the other darkness. But he maintains that the power which separated from the rest and fell away did not proceed directly from the thirty ions, but from their fruits. 3. There is another who is a renowned teacher among them, and who, struggling to reach something more sublime, and to attain to a kind of higher knowledge, has explained the primary tetrad as follows. There is, he says, a certain proarche, who existed before all things, surpassing all thought, speech, and nomenclature, whom I call menotes, or unity. Together with this menotes, there exists a power, which again I term henotes, or oneness. This henotes and monotes, being one, produced, yet not so as to bring forth, apart from themselves as an emanation, the beginning of all things, an intelligent, unbegotten, and invisible being, which beginning language terms monad. With this monad there coexists a power of the same essence, which again I term hen, or one. These powers, then, monotes and henotes and monas and hen, produced the remaining company of the ions. 4. Ayu, ayu, feu, feu, for well we may utter these tragic exclamations at such a pitch of audacity in the coining of names as he has displayed without a blush in devising a nomenclature for his system of falsehoods. For when he declares, there is a certain proarche before all things surpassing all thought whom I call monotes, and again with this monotes there coexists a power which I also call henotes. It is most manifest that he confesses the things which have been said to be his own invention, and that he himself has given names to his scheme of things, which had never been previously suggested by any other. It is manifest also that he himself is the one who has had sufficient audacity to coin these names, so that, unless he had appeared in the world, the truth would still have been destitute of a name. But in that case, nothing hinders any other in dealing with the same subject to affix names after such a fashion as the following. There is a certain proarche, royal, surpassing all thought, a power existing before every other substance, and extended into space in every direction. But along with it, there exists a power which I term a gourd, and along with this gourd, there exists a power which again I term utter emptiness. This gourd and emptiness, since they are one, produced, and yet did not simply produced so as to be apart from themselves, produced a fruit, everywhere visible, eatable, and delicious, which fruit language calls a cucumber. Along with this cucumber exists a power of the same essence, which again I call 
melon. These powers, the gourd, utter emptiness, the cucumber, and the melon, brought forth the remaining multitude of the delirious melons of Valentinus. For if it is fitting that the language which is used respecting the universe be transformed to the primary tetrad, and if any one may assign names at his pleasure, who shall prevent us from adopting these names as being much more credible than the others, as well as in general use and understood by all? 5. Others still, however, have called their primary and first begotten Ogdoad by the following names. First, Proarche, then Anenoetos, thirdly, Arhetos, and fourthly, Eoratos. Then, from the first, Proarche, there was produced, in the first and fifth place, Arche. From Anenoetos, in the second and sixth place, Acetaleptos, from Arhetos, in the third and seventh place, Anonomastos, and from Aoratos, in the fourth and eighth place, Agonetos. This is the pleroma of the first Ogdoad. They maintain that these powers were anterior to Bythus and Sigi, that they may appear more perfect than the perfect, and more knowing than the very Gnostics. To these persons, one may justly exclaim, O oh, ye trifling sophists! Since, even respecting Bythus himself, there are among them many and discordant opinions. For some declare him to be without a consort, and neither male nor female, and in fact nothing at all, while others affirm him to be masculo-feminine, assigning to him the nature of a hermaphrodite. Others again, allot Sigi to him as a spouse, that thus may be formed the first conjunction. End of Book 1, Chapters 9 through 11「but the followers of Ptolemy say that he, Bythos, has two consorts, which they also name diathesis, affections, vitalicit, enoe, and thelesis. For as they affirm, he first conceived the thought of producing something, and then willed to that effect. Wherefore, again, these two affections, or powers, enoea and thelesis, having intercourse, as it were, between themselves, the production of monogenes and aletheia took place according to conjunction. These two came forth as types and images of the two affections of the Father, visible representations of those that were invisible, nous, that is, monogenes, of thelesis, and aletheia of enoea, and accordingly the image resulting from thelesis was masculine, while that from enoea was feminine. Thus, thelesis, will, became, as it were, a faculty of enoelija, thought, for enoea continually yearned after offspring, but she could not of herself bring forth that which she desired. But when the power of Thelesis, the faculty of will, came upon her, then she brought forth that on which she had brooded. These fancied beings, like the Jove of Homer, who is represented as passing an anxious sleepless night in devising plans for honoring Achilles and destroying numbers of the Greeks, will not appear to you, my dear friend, to be possessed of greater knowledge than he who is the god of the universe. He, as soon as he thinks, also performs what he has willed, and as soon as he wills, also thinks that which he has willed. Then, thinking when he wills, and then willing when he thinks, since he is all thought, all will, all mind, all light, all eye, all ear, the one entire fountain of all good things. Those of them, however, who are deemed more skillful than the persons who have just been mentioned, say that the first Ogdoad was not produced gradually, so that one aeon was sent forth by another, 
but that all the aeons were brought into existence at once by Propator in his Enoia. He, Colorbasus, affirms this as confidently as if he had assisted at their birth. Accordingly, he and his followers maintain that Anthropos and Ecclesia were not produced, as others hold, from Logos and Zoe, but, on the contrary, Logos and Zoe from Anthropos and Ecclesia. But they express this in another form as follows. When the Propator conceived the thought of producing something, he received the name of Father. But because what he did produce was true, it was named Alithia. Again, when he wished to reveal himself, this was termed Anthropos. Finally, when he produced those whom he had previously thought of, these were named Ecclesia. Anthropos, by speaking, formed Logos. This is the firstborn son. But Zoe followed upon Logos, and thus the first Obdoad was completed. They have much contention also among themselves respecting the Savior. For some maintain that he was formed out of all, wherefore also he was called Evdositos, because the whole Pleroma was well pleased through him to glorify the Father. But others assert that he was produced from those ten aeons alone who sprung from Logos and Zoe, and that on this account he was called Logos and Zoe, thus preserving the ancestral names. Others, again, affirm that he had his being from those twelve aeons who were with the offspring of Anthropos and Ecclesia, and on this account he acknowledges himself the son of man, as being a descendant of others still assert that he was produced by Christ and the Holy Spirit, who were brought forth for the security of the Pleroma, and that on this account he was called Christ, thus preserving the appellation of the Father, by whom he was produced. And there are yet others among them who declare that the Propator of the whole, Proarche and Proanenoetos, is called Anthropos, and that this is the great and abstruse mystery, namely, that the power which is above all others, and contains all in his embrace, is termed Anthropos. Hence does the Savior style himself the Son of Man. Chapter 13 The Deceitful Arts and Nefarious Practices of Marcus But there is another among these heretics, Marcus by name, who boasts himself as having improved upon his master. He is a perfect adept in magical impostures, and by this means drawing away a great number of men, and not a few women, he has induced them to join themselves to him, as to one who is possessed of the greatest knowledge and perfection, and who has received the highest power from the invisible and ineffable regions above. Thus it appears as if he really were the precursor of Antichrist. For, joining the buffooneries of Anaxilaus to the craftiness of the Magi, as they are called, he is regarded by his senseless and cracked brain followers as working miracles by these means. Pretending to consecrate cups mixed with wine, and protracting to great length the word of invocation, he contrives to give them a purple and reddish color, so that Charis, who is one of those that are superior to all things, should be thought to drop her own blood into that cup through means of his invocation, and that thus those who are present should be led to rejoice to taste of that cup, in order that, by so doing, the Charis, who is set forth by this magician, may also flow in them. Again, handing mixed cups to the women, he binds them consecrate these in his presence. When this has been done, he himself produces another cup of much larger size than that which the deluded woman has consecrated, and pouring from the smaller one consecrated by the woman into that which has been brought forward by himself, he at the same time pronounces these words, May that chaffs who is before all things, and who transcends all knowledge and speech, fill thine inner man, and multiply in thee her own knowledge, by sowing the grain of the mustard seed in thee as in good soil. Repeating certain other like words, and thus goading on the wretched woman to madness, he then appears a worker of wonders when the large cup is seen to have been filled out of the small one, so as even to overflow by what has been obtained from it. By accomplishing several other similar things, he has completely deceived many, and drawn them away after him. It appears probable enough that this man possesses a demon as his familiar spirit, by means of whom he seems able to prophesy, and also enables as many he counts worthy to be partakers of his chadis themselves to prophesy. He devotes himself especially to women, and those such as are well-bred and elegantly attired and of great wealth, whom he frequently seeks to draw after him by addressing them in such seductive words as these, I am eager to make thee a partaker of my charis, since the father of all doth continually behold thy angel before his face. 
Now the place of thy angel is among us. It behoves us to become one. Receive first from me and by me the gift of chaffs. Adorn thyself as a bride who is expecting her bridegroom, that thou mayst be what I am, and I what thou art. Establish the germ of light in thy nuptial chamber. Receive from me a spouse, and become receptive of him while thou art received by him. Behold, Charis has descended upon thee. Open thy mouth and prophesy. On the woman replying, I have never at any time prophesied, nor do I know how to prophesy. Then engaging for the second time in certain invocations, so as to astound his deluded victim, he says to her, Open thy mouth, speak whatsoever occurs to thee, and thou shalt prophesy. She then, vainly puffed up and elated by these words, and greatly excited in soul by the expectation that it is herself who is to prophesy, her heart beating violently from emotion, reaches the requisite pitch of audacity, and idly as well as impudently utters some nonsense as it happens to occur to her, such as might be expected from one heated by an empty spirit. Referring to this, one superior to me has observed that the soul is both audacious and impudent when heated with empty air. Henceforth she reckons herself a prophetess, and expresses her thanks to Marcus for having imparted to her of his own chaffs. She then makes the effort to reward him, not only by the gift of her possessions, in which way he has collected a very large fortune, but also by yielding up to him her person, desiring in every way to be united to him, that she may become altogether one with him. But already some of the most faithful women, possessing of the fear of God and not being deceived, whom, nevertheless, he did his best to seduce like the rest by bidding them prophesy, abhorring and execrating him, have withdrawn from such a vile company of revelers. This they have done, as being well aware that the gift of prophecy is not conferred on men by Marcus the magician, but that only those to whom God sends his grace from above possess the divinely bestowed power of prophesying. And then they speak where and when God pleases, and not when Marcus orders them to do so. For that which commands is greater and of higher authority than that which is commanded, inasmuch as the former rules, while the latter is in a state of subjection. If then Marcus or anyone else does command, as these are accustomed continually at their feasts to play at drawing lots, and in accordance with the lot to command one another to prophesy, giving forth as oracles what is in harmony with their own desires, it will follow that he who commands is greater and of higher authority than the prophetic spirit, though he is but a man, which is impossible. But such spirits as are commanded by these men, and speak when they desire it, are earthly and weak, audacious and impudent, sent forth by Satan for the seduction and perdition of those who do not hold fast that well-compacted faith which they received at first through the church. Moreover, that this Marcus compounds filters and love potions in order to insult the persons of some of these women, if not of all, those of them who have returned to the church of God, a thing which frequently occurs, have acknowledged, confessing, too, that they have been defiled by him, and that they were filled with a burning passion towards him. A sad example of this occurred in the case of a certain Asiatic, one of our deacons, who had received him, Marcus, into his house. His wife, a woman of remarkable beauty, fell a victim both in mind and body to this magician, and for a long time traveled about with him. At last, when, with no small difficulty, the brethren had converted her, she spent her whole time in the exercise of public confession, weeping over and lamenting the defilement which she had received from this magician. Some of his disciples, too, addicting themselves to the same practices, have deceived many silly women and defiled them. They proclaim themselves as being perfect, so that no one can be compared to them with respect to the immensity of their knowledge, nor even were you to mention Paul or Peter or any other of the apostles. They assert that they themselves know more than all others, and that they alone have imbibed the greatness of the knowledge of that power which is unspeakable. They also maintain that they have attained a height above all power, and that therefore they are free in every respect to act as they please, having no one to fear in anything. For they affirm that because of the redemption, it has come to pass that they can neither be apprehended nor even seen by the judge. But even if he should happen to lay hold upon them, then they might simply repeat these words while standing in his presence along with the redemption. O thou who sittest beside God in the mystical eternal sage, thou through whom the angels, mightiness, who continually behold the face of the Father, having thee as their guide and introducer, do derive their forms from above, 
which she and the greatness of her daring inspired with mind on account of the goodness of the propator, producing us as their images, having her mind then intent upon the things above as in a dream. Behold, the judge is at hand, and the crier orders me to make my defense. But do thou, as being acquainted with the affairs of both, present the cause of both of us to the judge, inasmuch as it is in reality but one cause. Now, as soon as the mother hears these words, she puts the Homeric helmet of Pluto upon them, so that they may invisibly escape the judge. And then she immediately catches them up, and ducks them into the bridal chamber, and hands them over to their consorts. Such are the words and deeds by which, in our own district of the Hron, they have deluded many women, who have their consciences seared as with a hot iron. Some of them indeed make a public confession of their sins, but others of them are ashamed to do this, and in a tacit kind of way, despairing of attaining to the life of God, have some of them apostatized altogether, while others hesitate between the two courses, and incur that which is implied in the proverb, neither without nor within, possessing this as the fruit from the seed of the children of knowledge. End of Book 1, Chapters 12 through 13. Recording by James, Fort Myers, Florida. Chapters 14 through 15 of Irenaeus Against Heresies. Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo Chapters 14 through 15 Chapter 14 The Various Hypotheses of Marcus and Others Theories Respecting Letters and Syllables he declares that the infinitely exalted Tetrad descended upon him from the invisible and indescribable places in the form of a woman, for the world could not have borne it coming in its male form, and expounded to him alone its own nature and the origin of all things, which it had never before revealed to any one, either of gods or men. This was done in the following terms. When first the unoriginated, inconceivable father, who is without material substance and is neither male nor female, willed to bring forth that which is ineffable to him, and to endow with form that which is invisible, he opened his mouth and sent forth the word similar to himself, who, standing near, showed him what he himself was, inasmuch as he had been manifested in the form of that which was invisible. Moreover, the pronunciation of his name took place as follows. He spoke the first word of it, which was the beginning of all the rest, and that utterance consisted of four letters. He added the second, and this also consisted of four letters. Next he uttered the third, and this, again, embraced ten letters. Finally he pronounced the fourth, which was composed of twelve letters. Thus took place the enunciation of the whole name consisting of thirty letters and four distinct utterances. Each of these elements has its own peculiar letters and character and pronunciation and forms and images, and there is not one of them that perceives the shape of that utterance of which it is an element. Neither does any one know itself, nor is acquainted with the pronunciation of its neighbor, but each one imagines that by its own utterance it does, in fact, name the whole. For while every one of them is a part of the whole, and imagines its own sound to be the whole name, and does not leave off sounding until, by its own utterance, it has reached the last letter of each of the elements. This teacher declares that the restitution of all things will take place when all these, mixing into one letter, shall utter one and the same sound. He imagines that the emblem of this utterance is found in Amen which we pronounce in concert. The diverse sounds, he adds, are those which give form to that eon who is without material substance and unbegotten. And these, again, are the forms which the Lord has called angels, 
who continually behold the face of the Father. 2. Those names of the elements which may be told and are common, he has called eons, and words, and roots, and seeds, and fullnesses, and fruits. He asserts that each of these, and all that is peculiar to every one of them, is to be understood as contained in the name Ecclesia. Of these elements, the last letter of the last one uttered its voice, and this sound going forth generated its own elements after the image of the other elements, by which he affirms that both the things here below were arranged into the order they occupy, and those that preceded them were called into existence. He also maintains that the letter itself, the sound of which followed that sound below, was received up again by the syllable to which it belonged, in order to the completion of the whole, but that the sound remained below as if cast outside. But the element itself from which the letter with its special pronunciation descended to that below, he affirms to consist of thirty letters, while each of these letters, again, contains other letters in itself by means of which the name of the letter is expressed. And thus, again, others are named by other letters, and others by still others, so that the multitude of letters swells out into infinitude. You may more clearly understand what I mean by the following example. The word delta contains five letters, that is, D-E-L-T-A. These letters, again, are written by other letters, and others by still others. If, then, the entire composition of the word delta, when thus analyzed, runs out into infinitude, letters continually generating other letters and following one another in constant succession, how much vaster than that one word is the entire ocean of letters? And if even one letter be thus infinite, just consider the immensity of the letters in the entire name, out of which the Sieg of Marcus has taught us the Propater is composed. For which reason, the Father, knowing the incomprehensibleness of his own nature, assigned to the elements, which he also terms eons, the power of each one uttering its own enunciation, because no one of them was capable by itself of uttering the whole. 3. Moreover, the Tetrad, explaining these things to him more fully, said, I wish to show thee Aletheia, Truth, herself, for I have brought her down from the dwellings above, that thou mayest see her without a veil, and understand her beauty, that thou mayest also hear her speaking, and admire her wisdom. Behold, then, her head on high, Alpha and Omega, her neck, Beta and Psi, her shoulders with her hands, Gamma and Chi, her breast, Delta and Phi, her diaphragm, Epsilon and Upsilon, her back, Zeta and Tau, her belly, Eta and Sigma, her thighs, Theta and Rho, her knees, Iota and Pi, her legs, Kappa and Omicron, her ankles, Lambda and Z, her feet, Mu and Nu. Such is the body of truth, according to this magician, such the figure of the element, such the character of the letter. And he calls this element Anthropos, man, and says that it is the fountain of all speech, and the beginning of all sound, and the expression of all that is unspeakable, and the mouth of the silent Sieg. This, indeed, is the body of truth. But do thou, elevating the thoughts of thy mind on high, listen from the mouth of truth to the self-begotten word, who is also the dispenser of the bounty of the Father. When she, the Tetrad, had spoken these things, Alethea looked at him, opened her mouth, and uttered a word. That word was a name, and the name was this one, which we do know and speak of, that is, Christ Jesus. When she had uttered this name, she at once relapsed into silence. And as Marcus waited in the expectation that she would say something more, the tetrad again came forward and said, Thou hast reckoned as contemptible that word which thou hast heard from the mouth of Aletheia. This which thou knowest and seemest to possess is not an ancient name, for thou possessest the sound of it merely, whilst thou art ignorant of its power. 
For Jesus is a name arithmetically symbolical, consisting of six letters, and is known by all those that belong to the called. But that which is among the eons of the Pleroma consists of many parts, and is of another form and shape, and is known by these angels who are joined in affinity with him, and whose figures, mightinesses, are always present with him. 5. Know, then, that the four and twenty letters which you possess are symbolical emanations of the three powers that contain the entire number of the elements above. For you are to reckon thus, that the nine mute letters are the images of Pater and Aletheia, because they are without voice, that is, of such nature as cannot be uttered or pronounced. But the semi-vowels represent Logos and Zoe, because they are, as it were, midway between the consonants and the vowels, partaking of the nature of both. The vowels, again, are representative of Anthropos and Ecclesia, inasmuch as a voice proceeding from Anthropos gave being to them all, for the sound of the voice imparted to them form. Thus, then, Logos and Zo possess eight of the letters, Anthropos and Ecclesia, seven, and Pater and Aletheia, nine. But since the number allotted to each was unequal, he who existed in the Father came down, having been specially sent by him from whom he was separated, for the rectification of what had taken place, that the unity of the Pleromas, being endowed with equality, might develop in all that one power which flows from them all. Thus that division, which had only seven letters, received the power of eight, and the three sets were rendered alike in point of number, all becoming agdodes, which three, when brought together, constitute the number four and twenty. The three elements, too, which he declares to exist in conjunction with three powers, and thus form the six from which have flowed the twenty-four letters, being quadrupled by the word of the ineffable Tetrad, give rise to the same number with them. And these elements he maintains to belong to him who cannot be named. These, again, were endowed by the three powers with the resemblance to him who is invisible. And he says that those letters which we call double are the images of the images of the elements. And if these be added to the four and twenty letters, by force of analogy, they form the number thirty. 6. He asserts that the fruit of this arrangement and analogy has been manifested in the likeness of an image, namely, him who, after six days, ascended into the mountain along with three others, and then became one of the six, the sixth, in which character he descended, and was contained in the hebdomad, since he was the illustrious Agdod, and contained in himself the entire number of the elements, which the descent of the dove, who is Alpha and Omega, made clearly manifest when he came to be baptized, for the number of the dove is 801. And for this reason did Moses declare that man was formed on the sixth day. And then, again, according to arrangement, it was on the sixth day, which is the preparation, that the last man appeared, for the regeneration of the first. Of this arrangement, both the beginning and the end were formed at that sixth hour at which he was nailed to the tree. For that perfect being knows, knowing that the number six had the power both of formation and regeneration, declared to the children of light that regeneration which has been wrought out by him who appeared as the Episamon in regard to that number. Whence also he declares it is that the double letters contain the Episamon number. For this Episamon, when joined to the twenty-four elements, completed the name of thirty letters. 7. He employed as his instrument, as the Sieg of Marcus declares, the power of seven letters, in order that the fruit of the independent will of Achamoth may be revealed. Consider this present Episamon, she says, him who was formed after the original Episamon, as being, as it were, divided or cut into two parts, and remaining outside, who, by his own power and wisdom, 
through means of that which had been produced by himself, gave life to this world, consisting of seven powers, after the likeness of the power of the Hebdomad, and so formed it, that is, the soul of everything visible. And he indeed uses this work himself, as if it had been formed by his own free will. But the rest, as being images of what cannot be fully imitated, are subservient to the enthymesis of the mother. And the first heaven indeed pronounces Alpha, the next to this Epsilon, the third Eta, the fourth, which is also in the midst of the seven, utters the sound of Iota, the fifth Omicron, the sixth Upsilon, the seventh, which is also the fourth from the middle, utters the elegant Omega as the Sieg of Marcus, talking a deal of nonsense, but uttering no word of truth, confidently asserts. And these powers, she adds, being all simultaneously clasped into each other's embrace, do sound out the glory of him by whom they were produced, and the glory of that sound is transmitted upward to the propater. She asserts, moreover, that the sound of this uttering of praise, having been wafted to the earth, has become the framer and parent of those things which are on the earth. 8. He instances, in proof of this, the case of infants who have just been born, the cry of whom, as soon as they have issued from the womb, is in accordance with the sound of every one of these elements. As then, he says, the seven powers glorify the word, so also does the complaining soul of infants. For this reason, too, David said, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And again, The heavens declare the glory of God. Hence also it comes to pass, that when the soul is involved in difficulties and distresses, for its own relief it cries out, Oh! in honor of the letter in question, so that its cognate soul above may recognize its distress and send down to it relief. 9. Thus it is that in regard to the whole name, which consists of thirty letters, and by thus, who receives his increase from the letters of this name, and, moreover, the body of Aletheia, which is composed of twelve members, each of which consists of two letters, and the voice which she uttered without having spoken at all, and in regard to the analysis of that name which cannot be expressed in words, and the soul of the world and of man, according as they possess that arrangement, which is after the image of things above, he has uttered his nonsensical opinions. It remains that I relate how the Tetrad showed him, from the names, a power equal in number, so that nothing, my friend, which I have received as spoken by him, may remain unknown to thee, and thus thy request, often proposed to me, may be fulfilled. Chapter 15. Sieg relates to Marcus the generation of the twenty-four elements and of Jesus. Exposure of these absurdities. 1. The all-wise Sieg then announced the production of the four and twenty elements to him as follows. Along with the monotes, there coexisted henotes, from which sprang two productions, as we have remarked above. Monas and Hen, which, added to the other two, make four, for twice two are four. And again, two and four, when added together, exhibit the number six. And further, these six being quadrupled, give rise to the four and twenty forms. And the names of the first tetrad, which are understood to be most holy and not capable of being expressed in words, are known by the Son alone while the Father also knows what they are. The other names which are to be uttered with respect and faith and reverence are, according to him, Eratos and Sieg, Pater and Aletheia. Now the entire number of this tetrad amounts to four and twenty letters, for the name Eratos contains in itself seven letters, Sieg, five, Pater, five, and Aletheia, seven. If all these be added together, twice five and twice seven, they complete the number twenty-four. In like manner, also, the second tetrad, Logos and Zoe, Anthropos and Ecclesia, 
reveal the same number of elements. Moreover, that name of the Savior which may be pronounced, that is, Jesus, consists of six letters, but his unutterable name comprises four and twenty letters. The name Christ the Son comprises twelve letters, but that which is unpronounceable in Christ contains thirty letters. And for this reason he declares that he is Alpha and Omega, that he may indicate the dove, inasmuch as that bird has this number in its name. 2. But Jesus, he affirms, has the following unspeakable origin. From the mother of all things, that is, the first tetrad, there came forth a second tetrad, after the manner of a daughter, and thus an ogdode was formed, from which again a decad proceeded, thus was produced a decad and an ogdode. The decad, then, being joined with the ogdode, and multiplying it ten times, gave rise to the number eighty. And again, multiplying eighty ten times, produced the number eight hundred. Thus, then, the whole number of the letters proceeding from the Ogdodes, multiplied into the Decad, is 888. This is the name of Jesus. For this name, if you reckon up the numerical value of the letters, amounts to 888. Thus, then, you have a clear statement of their opinion as to the origin of the super-celestial Jesus. Wherefore, also, the alphabet of the Greeks contains eight monads, eight decades, and eight hectares, which present the number 888, that is, Jesus, who is formed of all numbers, and on this account he is called Alpha and Omega, indicating his origin from all. And again they put the matter thus, If the first tetrad be added up according to the progression of number, the number ten appears. For one, and two, and three, and four, when added together, form ten. And this, as they will have it, is Jesus. Moreover, Christus, he says, being a word of eight letters, indicates that the first ogdode, and this, when multiplied by ten, gives birth to Jesus. And Christ the Son, he says, is also spoken of, that this, the duodecad. For the name Son contains four letters, and Christ, Christus, eight which being combined point out the greatness of the duodecad. But, he alleges, before the episamen of the name appeared, that is, Jesus the Son, mankind were involved in great ignorance and error. But when this name of six letters was manifested, the person bearing it clothing himself in flesh, that he may come under the apprehension of man's senses, and having in himself these six and twenty-four letters, then, becoming acquainted with him, they ceased from their ignorance, and passed from death unto life, this name serving as their guide to the Father of Truth. For the Father of all had resolved to put an end to ignorance, and to destroy death. But this abolishing of ignorance was just the knowledge of him. And therefore that man, Anthropos, was chosen according to his will, having been formed after the image of the corresponding power above. 3. As to the eons, they proceeded from the tetrad, and in that tetrad were Anthropos and Ecclesia, Logos and Zo. The powers then, he declares, who emanated from these, generated that Jesus who appeared upon the earth. The angel Gabriel took the place of Logos, the Holy Spirit, that of Zo, the power of the highest, that of Anthropos, while the Virgin pointed out the place of Ecclesia. And thus, by a special dispensation, there was generated by him, through Mary, that man, whom, as he passed through the womb, the Father of all chose to obtain the knowledge of himself by means of the word. And on his coming to the water of baptism, there descended on him, in the form of a dove, that being who had formerly ascended on high, and completed the twelfth number, in whom there existed the seed of those who were produced contemporaneously with himself, and who descended and ascended along with him. Moreover, he maintains that power which descended was the seed of the Father, which had in itself both the Father and the Son, 
as well as that power of Sieg, which is known by means of them, but cannot be expressed in language, and also all the eons. And this was that spirit who spoke by the mouth of Jesus, and who confessed that he was the Son of Man, as well as revealed the Father, and who, having descended into Jesus, was made one with him. And he says that the Savior, formed by special dispensation, did indeed destroy death, but that Christ may know the Father. He maintains, therefore, that Jesus is the name of that man formed by a special dispensation, and that he was formed after the likeness and form of that heavenly anthropos who was about to descend upon him. After he received that eon, he possessed anthropos himself, and logos himself, and pater, and eretus, and sieg, and aletheia, and ecclesia, and zo. Four. Such ravings, we may now well say, go beyond ew, ew, few, few, and every kind of tragic exclamation or utterance of misery. For who would not detest one who is the wretched contriver of such audacious falsehoods when he perceives the truth turned by Marcus into a mere image and that punctured all over with the letters of the alphabet? The Greeks confess that they first received sixteen letters from Cadmus and that but recently, as compared with the beginning, the vast antiquity of which is implied in the common proverb, yesterday and before, and afterwards, in the course of time, they themselves invented, at one period, the aspirates, and at another, the double letters, while last of all, they say, Palamides added the long letters to the former. Was it so, then, that until these things took place among the Greeks, truth had no existence? For according to thee, Marcus, the body of truth is posterior to Cadmus and those who preceded him, posterior also to those who added the rest of the letters, posterior even to thyself. For thou alone hast formed that which is called by thee the truth into an outward, visible image. 5. But who will tolerate thy nonsensical sieg, who names him that cannot be named, and expounds the nature of him that is unspeakable, and searches out him that is unsearchable, and declares that he whom thou maintainest to be destitute of body and form, opened his mouth and sent forth the word, as if he were included among organized beings, and that his word, well like to his author, and bearing the image of the invisible, nevertheless consisted of thirty elements and four syllables, It will follow, then, according to thy theory, that the Father of all, in accordance with the likeness of the word, consists of thirty elements and four syllables. Or, again, who will tolerate thee in thy juggling with forms and numbers, at one time thirty, at another twenty-four, and at another, again, only six, whilst thou shuttest up in these the word of God, the founder and framer and maker of all things, and then, again, cutting him up piecemeal into four syllables and thirty elements, and bringing down the Lord of all who founded the heavens to the number 888, so that he should be similar to the alphabet, and subdividing the Father, who cannot be contained, but contains all things, into a tetrad and an ogdode, and a decad, and a duodecad, and by such multiplications, setting forth the unspeakable and inconceivable nature of the Father, as thou thyself declarest it to be, and showing thyself a very Daedalus for evil intention, and the wicked architect of the supreme power, thou dost construct a nature and substance for him, whom thou callest incorporeal and immaterial, out of a multitude of letters, generated the one by the other. And that power whom thou affirmest to be indivisible, thus does nevertheless divide into consonants and vowels and semi-vowels, and, falsely ascribing these letters, which are mute to the Father of all things, 
and to his enua, thought, Thou hast driven on all that place confidence in thee to the highest point of blasphemy and to the grossest impiety. 6. With good reason, therefore, and very fittingly, in reference to thy rash attempt, has that divine elder and preacher of the truth burst forth in verse against thee as follows. Marcus, thou former of idols, inspector of portents, skilled in consulting the stars and deep in the black arts of magic, ever by tricks such as these confirming the doctrines of error, furnishing signs unto those involved by thee in deception, wonders of power that is utterly severed from God and apostate, which Satan, thy true father, enables thee still to accomplish, by means of Azazel, that fallen and yet mighty angel, thus making thee the precursor of his own impious actions. Such are the words of the saintly elder, and I shall endeavor to state the remainder of their mystical system, which runs out to great length, in brief compass, and to bring to light what has for a long time been concealed. For in this way, such things will become easily susceptible of exposure by all. End of Book 1, Chapters 14 through 15 Recording by Abigail Bartels, Ham Lake, Minnesota Chapter 16 through 18 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 16. Absurd Interpretations of the Marcosians. 1. Blending in one the production of their own ions and the strain and recovery of the sheep spoken of in the gospel, these persons endeavor to set forth things in a more mystical style, while they refer everything to numbers, maintaining that the universe has been formed out of a monad and a dyad, and then, reckoning from unity on to four, they thus generate the decad. For when one, two, three, and four are added together, they give rise to the number of the ten ions. And again, the dyad advancing from itself by twos up to six, two and four and six, brings out the duodecad. Once more, if we reckon in the same way up to ten, the number thirty appears, in which are found eight, and ten, and twelve. They, therefore, term the duodecad, because it contains the episemon, and because the episemon, so to speak, waits upon it, the passion. And for this reason, because an error occurred in connection with the twelfth number, the sheep frisked off and went astray, for they assert that a defection took place from the duodecad. In the same way, they oracularly declare that one power having departed also from the duodecad has perished, and this was represented by the woman who lost the drachma, and, lighting a lamp, again found it. Thus, therefore, the numbers that were left, these nine, as respects the pieces of money, and eleven in regard to the sheep, when multiplied together, give birth to the number ninety-nine. For nine times eleven are ninety-nine. Wherefore also they maintain the word Amen contains this number. 2. I will not, however, weary thee by recounting their other interpretations, that you may perceive the results everywhere. They maintain, for instance, that the letter Eta, along with the Episemon, constitutes an ogdoad, inasmuch as it occupies the eighth place from the first letter. Then again, without the episemon, 
reckoning the number of the letters and adding them up till we come to eta they bring out the triacontad for if one begins at alpha and ends at eta omitting the episemon and adds together the values of the letters in succession he will find their number altogether to amount to thirty for up to epsilon fifteen are formed then adding seven to that number the sum of twenty-two is reached next eta being added to these since its value is eight the most wonderful triacontad is completed and hence they give forth that the ogdoad is the mother of the thirty ions since therefore the number thirty is composed of three powers the ogdoad decad and duodecad when multiplied by three it produces ninety for three times thirty are ninety likewise this triad when multiplied by itself gives rise to nine thus the ogdoad generates by these means ninety-nine and since the twelfth ion by her defection left eleven in the heights above they maintain that therefore the position of the letters is a true coordinate of the method of their calculation for lambda is the eleventh in order among the letters and represents the number thirty and also forms a representation of the arrangement of affairs above since on from alpha omitting episemon the number of the letters up to lambda when added together according to the successive value of the letters and including lambda itself forms the sum of ninety-nine but that this lambda being the eleventh in order descended to seek after one equal to itself so as to complete the number of twelve letters and when it found such a one the number was completed is manifest from the very configuration of the letter for lambda being engaged as it were in the quest of one similar to itself and finding such a one and clasping it to itself thus filled up the place of the twelfth the letter mu being composed of two lambdas wherefore also they by means of their knowledge avoid the place of ninety-nine that is the defection a type of the left hand but endeavor to secure one more which when added to the ninety and nine has the effect of changing their reckoning to the right hand three i know well my dear friend that when thou hast read through all this thou wilt indulge in a hearty laugh over this their inflated wise folly but those men are really worthy of being mourned over who promulgate such a kind of religion and who so frigidly and perversely pull to pieces the greatness of the truly unspeakable power and the dispensations of god in themselves so striking by means of alpha and beta and through the aid of numbers but as many as separate from the church and give heed to such old wives fables as these are truly self-condemned and these men paul commands us after a first and second admonition to avoid and john the disciple of the lord has intensified their condemnation when he desires us not even to address to them the salutation of good speed for says he he that bids them be of good speed is a partaker with their evil deeds and that with reason for there is no good speed to the ungodly saith the lord impious indeed beyond all impiety are these men who assert that the maker of heaven and earth the only god almighty besides whom there is no god was produced by means of a defect which itself sprang from another defect so that according to them he was the product of the third defect such an opinion we should detest and execrate while we ought everywhere to flee far apart from those that hold it and in proportion as they vehemently maintain and rejoice in their fictitious doctrines so much the more should we be convinced that they are under the influence of the wicked spirits of the ogdoad just as those persons who fall into a fit of frenzy 
the more they laugh and imagine themselves to be well and do all things as if they were in good health both of body and mind yea some things better than those who really are so are only thus shown to be the more seriously diseased in like manner do these men the more they seem to excel others in wisdom and waste their strength by drawing the bow too tightly the greater fools do they show themselves for when the uncertain spirit of folly has gone forth and when afterwards he finds them not waiting upon god but occupied with mere worldly questions then taking seven other spirits more wicked than himself and inflating the minds of these men with the notion of their being able to conceive of something beyond god and having fitly prepared them for the reception of deceit he implants within them the ogdoad of the foolish spirits of wickedness chapter seventeen the theory of the marcosians that created things were made after the image of things invisible One i wish also to explain to thee their theory as to the way in which the creation itself was formed through the mother by the demiurge as it were without his knowledge after the image of things invisible they maintain then that first of all the four elements fire water earth and air were produced after the image of the primary tetrad above and that then we add their operations viz heat cold dryness and humidity in exact likeness of the ogdoad is presented they next reckon up ten powers in the following manner there are seven globular bodies which they also call heavens then that globular body which contains these which also they name the eighth heaven and in addition to these the sun and moon these being ten in number they declare to be types of the invisible decad which proceeded from logos and zoe as to the duodecad it is indicated by the zodiacal circle as it is called for they affirm that the twelve signs do most manifestly shadow forth the duodecad the daughter of anthropos and ecclesia and since the highest heaven beating upon the very sphere of the seventh heaven has been linked with the most rapid procession of the whole system as a check and balancing that system with its own gravity so that it completes the cycle from sign to sign in thirty years they say that this is an image of horos encircling their thirty named mother and then again as the moon travels through her allotted space of heaven in thirty days they hold that by these days she expresses the number of the thirty ions the sun also who runs through his orbit in twelve months and then returns to the same point in the circle makes the duodecad manifest by these twelve months and the days as being measured by twelve hours are a type of the invisible duodecad moreover they declare that the hour which is the twelfth part of the day is composed of thirty parts in order to set forth the image of the triacontad also the circumference of the zodiacal circle itself contains three hundred and sixty degrees for each of its signs comprises thirty and thus also they affirm that by means of this circle an image is preserved of that connection which exists between the twelve and the thirty still further asserting that the earth is divided into twelve zones and that in each zone it receives power from the heavens according to the perpendicular position of the sun above it bringing forth productions corresponding to that power which sends down its influence upon it they maintain that this is a most evident type of the duodecad and its offspring two in addition to these things they declare that the demiurge desiring to imitate the infinitude and eternity and immensity and freedom from all measurement by time of the ogdoad above but as he was the fruit of defect being unable to express its permanence and eternity 
had recourse to the expedient of spreading out its eternity into times and seasons and vast numbers of years imagining that by the multitude of such times he might imitate its immensity they declare further that the truth having escaped him he followed that which was false and that for this reason when the times are fulfilled his work shall perish chapter eighteen passages from moses which the heretics pervert to the support of their hypothesis one and while they affirm such things as these concerning the creation every one of them generates something new day by day according to his ability for no one is deemed perfect who does not develop among them some mighty fictions it is thus necessary first to indicate what things they metamorphose to their own use out of the prophetical writings and next to refute them moses then they declare by his mode of beginning the account of the creation has at the commencement pointed out the mother of all things when he says in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth for as they maintain by naming these four god beginning heaven and earth he set forth their tetrad indicating also its invisible and hidden nature he said now the earth was invisible and unformed they will have it moreover that he spoke of the second tetrad the offspring of the first in this way by naming an abyss and darkness in which were also water and the spirit moving upon the water then proceeding to mention the decad he names light day night the firmament the evening the morning dry land sea plants and in the tenth place trees thus by means of these ten names he indicated the ten ions the power of the duodecad again was shadowed forth by him thus he names the sun moon stars seasons years whales fishes reptiles birds quadrupeds wild beasts and after all these in the twelfth place man thus they teach that the tria contad was spoken of through moses by the spirit moreover man also being formed after the image of the power above had in himself the ability which flows from the one source this ability was seated in the region of the brain from which four faculties proceeded after the image of the tetrad above and these are called the first sight the second hearing the third smell and the fourth taste and they say that the ogdoad is indicated by man in this way that he possesses two ears and a like number of eyes also two nostrils and a twofold taste namely of bitter and sweet moreover they teach that the whole man contains the entire image of the tria contad as follows in his hands by means of his fingers he bears the decad and in his whole body the duodecad inasmuch as his body is divided into twelve members for they portion that out as the body of truth is divided by them a point of which we have already spoken but the ogdoad as being unspeakable and invisible is understood as hidden in the viscera two again they assert that the sun the great light-giver was formed on the third day with a reference to the number of the tetrad so also according to them the courts of the tabernacle constructed by moses being composed of fine linen and blue and purple and scarlet pointed to the same image moreover they maintain that the long robe of the priest falling over his feet as being adorned with four rows of precious stones indicates the tetrad and if there are any other things in the scriptures which can possibly be dragged into the number four they declare that these had their being with a view to the tetrad the ogdoad again was shown as follows 
they affirm that man was formed on the eighth day, for sometimes they will have him to have been made on the sixth day, and sometimes on the eighth, unless perchance they mean that his earthly part was formed on the sixth day, but his fleshly part on the eighth, for these two things are distinguished by them. Some of them also hold that one man was formed after the image and likeness of God, masculo-feminine, and that this was the spiritual man, and that another man was formed out of the earth. 3. Further, they declare that the arrangement made with respect to the ark in the deluge, by means of which eight persons were saved, most clearly indicates the Ogdoad which brings salvation. David also shows forth the same, as holding the eighth place in point of age among his brethren. Moreover, that circumcision which took place on the eighth day represented the circumcision of the Ogdoad above. In a word, whatever they find in the scriptures capable of being referred to the number eight, they declare to fulfill the mystery of the Ogdoad. With respect again to the Decad, they maintain that it is indicated by those ten nations which God promised to Abraham for a possession. The arrangement also made by Sarah, when, after ten years, she gave her handmaid Hagar to him, that by her she might have a son, showed the same thing. Moreover, the servant of Abraham, who was sent to Rebekah, and presented her at the well with ten bracelets of gold, and her brethren who detained her for ten days, Jeroboam also, who received the ten scepters, or tribes, and the ten courts of the tabernacle, and the columns of ten cubits high, and the ten sons of Jacob, who were at first sent into Egypt to buy corn, and the ten apostles to whom the Lord appeared after his resurrection, Thomas being absent, represented, according to them, the invisible decad. 4. As to the duodecad, in connection with which the mystery of the passion of the defect occurred, from which passion they maintain that all things visible were framed, they assert that it is to be found strikingly and manifestly everywhere in Scripture. For they declare that the twelve sons of Jacob, from whom also sprung twelve tribes, the breastplate of the high priest, which bore twelve precious stones and twelve little bells, the twelve stones which were placed by Moses at the foot of the mountain, the same number which was placed by Joshua in the river, and again, on the other side, the bearers of the Ark of the Covenant, those stones which were set up by Elijah when the heifer was offered as a burnt offering, the number two of the apostles, and, in fine, Every event which embraces in it the number twelve set forth their duodecad. And then the union of all these, which is called the triacontad, they strenuously endeavor to demonstrate by the ark of Noah, the height of which was thirty cubits, by the case of Samuel, who assigned Saul the chief place among thirty guests, by David, when for thirty days he concealed himself in the field, by those who entered along with him into the cave, also by the fact that the length or height of the holy tabernacle was thirty cubits. And if they meet with any other like numbers, they still apply these to their triacontad. End of Book 1, Chapters 16-18 through 18. Chapters 19 through 22 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Martin. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 19. Passages of Scripture by which they attempt to prove that the Supreme Father was unknown before the coming of Christ. 1. I judge it necessary to add to these details also what, by garbling passages of Scripture, they try to persuade us concerning their propator, 
who was unknown to all before the coming of Christ. Their object in this is to show that our Lord announced another Father than the Maker of this universe, whom, as we said before, they impiously declare to have been the fruit of a defect. For instance, when the prophet Isaiah says, But Israel hath not known me, and my people have not understood me, they pervert his words to mean ignorance of the invisible Bithus. And that which is spoken by Hosea, there is no truth in them, nor the knowledge of God, they strive to give the same reference. And there is none that understandeth, or that seeketh after God. They have all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, they maintain to be said concerning ignorance of Bithus. Also that which is spoken by Moses, No man shall see God and live, has, as they would persuade us, the same reference. 2. For they falsely hold that the Creator was seen by the prophets. But this passage, No man shall see God and live, they would interpret as spoken of his greatness, unseen and unknown by all. And indeed that these words, No man shall see God, are spoken concerning the invisible Father, the Maker of the universe, is evident to us all, but that they are not used concerning that Bithos whom they conjure into existence, but concerning the Creator, and He is the invisible God, shall be shown as we proceed. They maintain that Daniel also set forth the same thing when he begged of the angels explanations of the parables, as being himself ignorant of them. But the angel, hiding from him the great mystery of Bithos, said unto him, Go thy way quickly, Daniel, for these sayings are closed up until those who have understanding do understand them, and those who are white be made white. Moreover, they vaunt themselves as being the white and the men of good understanding. Chapter 20 The Apocryphal and Spurious Scriptures of the Marcosians with Passages of the Gospels which they pervert. 1. Besides the above misrepresentations, they adduce an unspeakable number of apocryphal and spurious writings, which they themselves have forged, to bewilder the minds of foolish men, and of such as are ignorant of the scriptures of truth. Among other things, they bring forward that false and wicked story, which relates that our Lord, when he was a boy learning his letters, on the teacher saying to him, as is usual, pronounce Alpha, replied, as he was bid, Alpha. But when again the teacher bade him say, Beta, the Lord replied, Do thou first tell me what Alpha is, and then I will tell thee what Beta is. This they expound as meaning that he alone knew the unknown, which he revealed under its type Alpha. 2. Some passages also, which occur in the Gospels, receive from them a colouring of the same kind, such as the answer which he gave his mother when he was twelve years of age. Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Thus, they say, he announced to them the father of whom they were ignorant. On this account also, he sent forth the disciples to the twelve tribes, that they might proclaim to them the unknown God. And to the person who said to him, Good master, he confessed that God who is truly good, saying, Why callest thou me good? There is one who is good, the Father in the heavens. And they assert that in this passage the eons receive the name of heavens. Moreover, by his not replying to those who said to him, By what power doest thou this? But by a question on his own side, put them to utter confusion. By his thus not replying, according to their interpretation, he showed the unutterable nature of the Father. Moreover, when he said, I have often desired to hear one of these words, and I had no one who could utter it, they maintain that by his expression, one, he set forth the one true God whom they knew not. Further, when as he drew nigh to Jerusalem, he wept over it and said, If thou hadst known, even thou in this thy day, the things that belong unto thy peace, but they are hidden from thee. By this word hidden, he showed the abstruse nature of Bithus. And again, when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and learn of me, he announced the father of truth. For what they knew not, these men say that he promised to teach them. 3. But they adduced the following passage as the highest testimony, and as it were, the very crown of their system. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them to babes. 
Even so, my father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things have been delivered to me by my father, and no one knoweth the father but the son, or the son but the father, and he to whom the son will reveal him. In these words they affirm that he clearly showed that the father of truth, conjured into existence by them, was known to no one before his advent, and they desired to construe the passage as if teaching that the maker and framer of the world was always known by all, while the Lord spoke these words concerning the Father unknown to all, whom they now proclaim. Chapter 21 The Views of Redemption Entertained by These Heretics 1. It happens that their tradition respecting redemption is invisible and incomprehensible as being the mother of things which are incomprehensible and invisible, and on this account, since it is fluctuating, it is impossible simply and all at once to make known its nature, for every one of them hands it down just as his own inclination prompts. Thus there are as many schemes of redemption as there are teachers of these mystical opinions, and when we come to refute them, we shall show in its fitting place that this class of men have been instigated by Satan to a denial of that baptism which is regeneration to God, and thus to a renunciation of the whole Christian faith. 2. They maintain that those who have attained to perfect knowledge must of necessity be regenerated into that power which is above all, for it is otherwise impossible to find admittance within the pleroma, since this regeneration it is which leads them down into the depths of Bithus. For the baptism instituted by the visible Jesus was for the remission of sins, but the redemption brought in by that Christ who descended upon him was for perfection, and they allege that the former is animal, but the latter spiritual. And the baptism of John was proclaimed with a view to repentance, but the redemption by Jesus was brought in for the sake of perfection. And to this he refers when he says, And I have another baptism to be baptized with and I hasten eagerly towards it. Moreover, they affirm that the Lord added this redemption to the sons of Zebedee, when their mother asked that they might sit, the one on his right hand and the other on his left, in his kingdom, saying, Can ye be baptized with the baptism which I shall be baptized with? Paul too, they declare, has often set forth, in express terms, the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, and this was the same which is handed down by them in so varied and discordant forms. 3. For some of them prepare a nuptial couch, and perform a sort of mystic rite, pronouncing certain expressions, with those who are being initiated, and affirm that it is a spiritual marriage which is celebrated by them, after the likeness of the conjunctions above. Others, again, lead them to a place where water is, and baptize them, with the utterance of these words, Into the name of the unknown Father of the universe, into truth, the mother of all things, into him who descended on Jesus, into union and redemption and communion with the powers. Others still repeat certain Hebrew words, in order the more thoroughly to bewilder those who are being initiated, as follows, Basema chamose baonaora mistadia ruada costa babafort kalastei. The interpretation of these terms runs thus I invoke that which is above every power of the Father, which is called light and good spirit and life, because thou hast reigned in the body. Others again set forth the redemption thus The name which is hidden from every deity and dominion and truth which Jesus of Nazareth was clothed with in the lives of the light of Christ, who lives by the Holy Ghost for the angelic redemption. The name of restitution stands thus, Messiah ufareg namem soeman shaldoer mosomedoea akfranoe psaua Jesus Nataria. The interpretation of these words is as follows, I do not divide the Spirit of Christ, neither the heart nor the supercelestial power which is merciful, May I enjoy thy name, O Saviour of Truth. Such are words of the initiators, but he who is initiated replies, I am established and I am redeemed. I redeem myself from this age, world, and from all things connected with it in the name of Yao, who redeemed his own soul into redemption in Christ who liveth. Then the bystanders add these words, Peace be to all on whom this name rests. After this, they anoint the initiated person with balsam, for they assert that this unguent is a type of that sweet odour which is above all things. 4. 
but there are some of them who assert that it is superfluous to bring persons to the water. But mixing oil and water together, they place this mixture on the heads of those who are to be initiated, with the use of some such expressions as we have already mentioned, and this they maintain to be the redemption. They too are accustomed to anoint with balsam. Others, however, reject all these practices, and maintain that the mystery of the unspeakable and invisible power ought not to be performed by visible and corruptible creatures, nor should that of those beings who are inconceivable, and incorporeal, and beyond the reach of sense, be performed by such as are the objects of sense, and possessed of a body. These hold that the knowledge of the unspeakable greatness is itself perfect redemption. For since both defect and passion flowed from ignorance, the whole substance of what was thus formed is destroyed by knowledge, and therefore knowledge is the redemption of the inner man. This, however, is not of a corporeal nature, for the body is corruptible, nor is it animal, since the animal soul is the fruit of a defect, and is, as it were, the abode of the spirit. The redemption must therefore be of a spiritual nature, for they affirm that the inner and spiritual man is redeemed by means of knowledge, and that they, having acquired the knowledge of all things, stand thenceforth in need of nothing else. This, then, is the true redemption. 5. Others still there are who continue to redeem persons even up to the moment of death, by placing on their heads oil and water, or the pre-mentioned ointment with water, using at the same time the above-named invocations, that the persons referred to may become incapable of being ceased or seen by the principalities and powers, and that their inner man may ascend on high in an invisible manner, as if their body were left among created things in this world, while their soul is sent forward to the demiurge. And they instruct them, on their reaching the principalities and powers, to make use of these words, I am a son from the Father, who had a pre-existence, and a son in him who is pre-existent. I have come to behold all things, both those which belong to myself and others, although, strictly speaking, they do not belong to others, but to Akamoth, who is female in nature, and made these things for herself. For I derive being from him who is pre-existent, and I come again to my own place whence I went forth. And they affirm that, by saying these things, he escapes from the powers. He then advances to the companions of the Demiurge, and thus addresses them, I am a vessel more precious than the female who formed you. If your mother is ignorant of her own descent, I know myself, and I am aware whence I am, and I call upon the incorruptible Sophia, who is in the father, and is the mother of your mother, who has no father, nor any male consort, but a female springing from a female formed you, while ignorant of her own mother, and imagining that she alone existed. But I call upon her mother, and they declare that when the companions of the Demiurge hear these words, they are greatly agitated, and upbraid their origin and the race of their mother. But he goes into his own place, having thrown off his chain, that is, his animal nature. These, then, are the particulars which have reached us respecting redemption. But since they differ so widely among themselves, both as respects doctrine and tradition, and since those of them who are recognized as being most modern make it their effort daily to invent some new opinion, and to bring out what no one ever before thought of, it is a difficult matter to describe all their opinions. Chapter 22. Deviations of Heretics from the Truth 1. The rule of truth which we hold is that there is one God Almighty, who made all things by His word, and fashioned and formed, out of that which had no existence, all things which exist. Thus saith the scripture, to that effect, By the word of the Lord were the heavens established, and all the might of them by the Spirit of His mouth. And again, All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made. There is no exception or deduction stated, but the Father made all things by Him, whether visible or invisible, objects of sense or of intelligence, temporal on account of a certain character given them, or eternal, and these eternal things He did not make by angels, or by any power separated from His annoyer. For God needs none of all these things, but is He who, by His word and spirit, makes and disposes, and governs all things, and commands all things into existence. He who formed the world, for the world is of all, he who fashioned man, he who is the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, 
above whom there is no other god, nor initial principle, nor power, nor pleroma. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we shall prove. Holding therefore this rule, we shall easily show, notwithstanding the great variety and multitude of their opinions, that these men have deviated from the truth. For almost all the different sects of heretics admit that there is one God, but then, by their pernicious doctrines, they change this truth into error, even as the Gentiles do through idolatry, thus proving themselves ungrateful to him that created them. Moreover, they despise the workmanship of God, speaking against their own salvation, becoming their own bitterest accusers, and being false witnesses against themselves. Yet reluctant as they may be, these men shall one day rise again in the flesh, to confess the power of him who raises them from the dead, but they shall not be numbered amongst the righteous on account of their unbelief. 2. Since, therefore, it is a complex and multiform task to detect and convict all the heretics, and since our design is to reply to them all according to their special characters, we have judged it necessary, first of all, to give an account of their source and root, in order that, by getting a knowledge of their most exalted Bethus, thou mayest understand the nature of the tree which has produced such fruits. End of Book 1 Chapters 19 through 22《Chapters 23 through 25 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Martin. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 23. Doctrines and Practices of Simon Magus and Menander 1. Simon the Samaritan was that magician of whom Luke, the disciple and follower of the apostles, says, But there was a certain man, Simon by name, who before time used magical arts in that city, and led astray the people of Sumeria, declaring that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this is the power of God, which is called great, and to him they had regard, because that of long time he had driven them mad by his sorceries. This Simon, then, who feigned faith, supposing that the apostles themselves performed their cures by the art of magic, and not by the power of God, and with respect to their filling with the Holy Ghost, through the imposition of hands, those that believed in God through him who was preached by them, namely Christ Jesus, suspecting that even this was done through a kind of greater knowledge of magic, and offering money to the apostles, thought he too might receive this power of bestowing the Holy Spirit on whomsoever he would, was addressed in these words by Peter, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. He then, not putting faith in God a whit the more, set himself eagerly to contend against the apostles, in order that he himself might seem to be a wonderful being, and applied himself, with still greater zeal, to the study of the whole magic art, that he might the better bewilder and overpower multitudes of men. Such was his procedure in the reign of Claudius Caesar, by whom also he is said to have been honoured with a statue, on account of his magical power. This man, then, was glorified by many as if he were a god, and he taught that it was himself who appeared among the Jews as the son, but descended in Samaria as the father, while he came to other nations in the character of the Holy Spirit. He represented himself, in a word, as being the loftiest of all powers, that is, the being who is the father over all, and he allowed himself to be called by whatsoever title men were pleased to address him. 2. Now this Simon of Samaria, from whom all sorts of heresies derive their origin, formed his sect out of the following materials. Having redeemed from slavery at Tyre, a city of Phoenicia, a certain woman named Helena, he was in the habit of carrying her about with him, declaring that this woman was the first conception of his mind, the mother of all, by whom in the beginning he conceived in his mind the thought of forming angels and archangels. For this Ennoia, leaping forth from him, and comprehending the will of her father, descended to the lower regions of space, 
and generated angels and powers, by whom also he declared this word was formed. But after she had produced them, she was detained by them through motives of jealousy, because they were unwilling to be looked upon as the progeny of any other being. As to himself, they had no knowledge of him whatever, but his Inoya was detained by those powers and angels who had been produced by her. She suffered all kinds of contumely from them, so that she could not return upwards to her father, but was even shut up in a human body, and for ages passed in succession from one female body to another, as from vessel to vessel. She was, for example, in that Helen on whose account the Trojan war was undertaken, for whose sake also Stesichorus was struck blind, because he had cursed her in his verses, but afterwards, repenting and writing what are called palinodes, in which he sang her praise, he was restored to sight. Thus she, passing from body to body, and suffering insults in every one of them, at last became a common prostitute, and she it was that was meant by the lost sheep. 3. For this purpose, then, he had come that he might win her first, and free her from slavery, while he conferred salvation upon men, by making himself known to them. For since the angels ruled the world ill, because each one of them coveted the principal power for himself, he had come to amend matters, and had descended, transfigured, and assimilated the powers and principalities and angels, so that he might appear among men to be a man, while yet he was not a man, and that thus he was thought to have suffered in Judea, when he had not suffered. Moreover, the prophets uttered their predictions under the inspiration of those angels who formed the world, for which reason those who placed their trust in him and Helena no longer regarded them, but, as being free, live as they please. For men are saved through his grace, and not on account of their own righteous actions. For such deeds are not righteous in the nature of things, but by mere accident, just as those angels who made the world have thought fit to constitute them seeking by means of such precepts to bring men into bondage on this account he pledged himself that the world should be dissolved and that those who were his should be freed from the rule of them who made the world for thus then the mystic priests belonging to this sect both lead profligate lives and practice magical arts each one to the extent of his ability they use exorcisms and incantations, love potions too, and charms, as well as those beings who are called Baredri, familiars, and Onir or Pompey, dream senders, and whatever other curious arts can be had recourse to, are eagerly pressed into their service. They also have an image of Simon fashioned after the likeness of Jupiter, and another of Helena in the shape of Minerva, and these they worship. In fine, they have a name derived from Simon, the author of these most impious doctrines, being called Simonians, and from them knowledge, falsely so called, received its beginning, as one may learn even from their own assertions. 5. The successor of this man was Menander, also a Samaritan by birth, and he too was a perfect adept in the practice of magic. He affirms that the primary power continues unknown to all, but that he himself is the person who has been sent forth from the presence of the invisible beings as a saviour for the deliverance of men. The world was made by angels, whom, like Simon, he maintains to have been produced by Anoya. He gives, too, as he affirms, by means of that magic which he teaches, knowledge to this effect, that one may overcome those very angels that made the world, for his disciples obtain the resurrection by being baptised into him, and can die no more, but remain in the possession of immortal youth. Chapter 24 Doctrines of Saturninus and Basilides 1. Arising among these men, Saturninus, who was of that Antioch which is near Daphne, and Basilides, laid hold of some favorable opportunities, and promulgated different systems of doctrine, the one in Syria, the other at Alexandria. Saturninus, like Menander, set forth one father unknown to all, who made angels, archangels, powers, and potentates. The world, again, and all things therein, were made by a certain company of seven angels. Man, too, was the workmanship of angels, a shining image bursting forth below from the presence of the supreme power. And when they could not, he says, keep hold of this, because it immediately darted upwards again, they exhorted each other, saying, Let us make man after our image and likeness. 
he was accordingly formed yet was unable to stand erect through the inability of the angels to convey to him that power but wriggled on the ground like a worm then the power above taking pity upon him since he was made after his likeness sent forth a spark of life which gave man an erect posture compacted his joints and made him live he declares therefore that this spark of life after the death of a man returns to those things which are of the same nature with itself and the rest of the body is decomposed into its original elements two he has also laid it down as a truth that the saviour was without birth without body and without figure but was by supposition a visible man and he maintained that the god of the jews was one of the angels and on this account because all the powers wished to annihilate his father christ came to destroy the god of the jews but to save such as believe in him that is those who possess the spark of his life this heretic was the first to affirm that two kinds of men were formed by the angels the one wicked and the other good and since the demons assist the most wicked the saviour came for the destruction of evil men and of the demons but for the salvation of the good they declare also that marriage and generation are from satan many of those too who belong to his school abstain from animal food and draw away multitudes by a rain temperance of this kind they hold moreover that some of the prophecies were uttered by those angels who made the world and some by satan whom saturninus represents as being himself an angel the enemy of the creators of the world but especially of the god of the jews three basilides again that he may appear to have discovered something more sublime and plausible gives an immense development to his doctrines he sets forth that nous was first born of the unborn father that from him again was born logos from logos phronesis from phronesis sophia and dynamis and from dynamis and sophia the powers and principalities and angels whom he also calls the first and that by them the first heaven was made then other powers being formed by emanation from these created another heaven similar to the first and in like manner when others again had been formed by emanation from them corresponding exactly to those above them these two framed another third heaven and then from this third in downward order there was a fourth succession of descendants and so on after the same fashion they declare that more and more principalities and angels were formed and three hundred and sixty-five heavens wherefore the year contains the same number of days in conformity with the number of the heavens four those angels who occupy the lowest heaven that namely which is visible to us formed all the things which are in the world and made allotments among themselves of the earth and of those nations which are upon it the chief of them is he who is thought to be the god of the jews and inasmuch as he desired to render the other nations subject to his own people that is the jews all the other princes resisted and opposed him wherefore all other nations were at enmity with his nation but the father without birth and without name perceiving that they would be destroyed sent his own first begotten noose he it is who is called christ to bestow deliverance on them that believe in him from the power of those who made the world he appeared then on earth as a man to the nations of these powers and wrought miracles wherefore he did not himself suffer death but simon a certain man of cyrene being compelled bore the cross in his stead so that this latter being transfigured by him that he might be thought to be jesus was crucified through ignorance and error while jesus himself received the form of simon and standing by laughed at them for since he was an incorporeal power and the noose mind of the unborn father he transfigured himself as he pleased and thus ascended to him who had sent him deriding them inasmuch as he could not be laid hold of and was invisible to all those then who know these things have been freed from the principalities who formed the world so that it is not incumbent on us to confess him who was crucified but him who came in the form of a man and was thought to be crucified and was called jesus and was sent by the father that by this dispensation he might destroy the works of the makers of the world if any one therefore he declares confesses the crucified that man is still a slave and under the power of those who formed our bodies but he who denies him has been freed from these beings and is acquainted with the dispensation of the unborn father five salvation belongs to the soul alone for the body is by nature subject to corruption 
He declares, too, that the prophecies were derived from those powers who were the makers of the world, but the law was especially given by their chief, who led the people out of the land of Egypt. He attaches no importance to the question regarding meats offered in sacrifice to idols, thinks them of no consequence, and makes use of them without any hesitation. He holds also the use of other things, and the practice of every kind of lust a matter of perfect indifference. These men, moreover, practice magic, and use images, incantations, invocations, and every other kind of curious art. Coining also certain names as if they were those of the angels, they proclaim some of these as belonging to the first, and others to the second heaven, and then they strive to set forth the names, principles, angels, and powers of the three hundred and sixty-five imagined heavens, they also affirm that the barbarous name in which the Saviour ascended and descended is Kaulakao. 6. He then who has learned these things and known all the angels and their causes is rendered invisible and incomprehensible to the angels and all the powers, even as Kaulakao also was. And as the sun was unknown to all, so must they also be known by no one. But while they know all and pass through all, they themselves remain invisible and unknown to all. 4. Do thou, they say, know all, but let nobody know thee. For this reason, persons of such a persuasion are also ready to recant their opinions. Yea, rather it is impossible that they should suffer on account of a mere name, since they are like to all. The multitude, however, cannot understand these matters, but only one out of a thousand, or two out of ten thousand. They declare that they are no longer Jews, and that they are not yet Christians, and that it is not at all fitting to speak openly of their mysteries, but right to keep them secret by preserving silence. 7. They make out the local position of the 365 heavens in the same way as do mathematicians. For accepting the theorems of these latter, they have transferred them to their own type of doctrine. They hold that their chief is Abraxas, and on this account that word contains in itself the numbers amounting to 365. Chapter 25. Doctrines of Carpocrates. 1. Carpocrates again and his followers maintain that the world and the things which are therein were created by angels greatly inferior to the unbegotten God. They also hold that Jesus was the son of Joseph and was just like other men, with the exception that he differed from them in this respect, that inasmuch as his soul was steadfast and pure, he perfectly remembered those things which he had witnessed within the sphere of the unbegotten God. On this account, a power descended upon him from the Father, that by means of it he might escape from the creators of the world, and they say that it, after passing through them all, and remaining in all points free, ascended again to him, and to the powers, which in the same way embraced like things to itself. They further declare that the soul of Jesus although educated in the practices of the Jews, regarded these with contempt, and that for this reason he was endowed with faculties by means of which he destroyed those passions which dwelt in men as a punishment for their sins. 2. The soul, therefore, which is like that of Christ, can despise those rulers who were the creators of the world, and in like manner receives power from accomplishing the same results. This idea has raised them to such a pitch of pride that some of them declare themselves similar to Jesus, while others, still more mighty, maintain that they are superior to his disciples, such as Peter and Paul, and the rest of the apostles, whom they consider to be in no respect inferior to Jesus. For their souls, descending from the same sphere as his, and therefore despising in like manner the creators of the world, are deemed worthy of the same power, and again depart to the same place. But if any one shall have despised the things in this world more than he did, he thus proves himself superior to him. 3. They practice also magical arts and incantations, filters also, and love potions, and have recourse to familiar spirits, dream-sending demons, and other abominations, declaring that they possess power to rule over, even now, the princes and formers of this world, and not only them, but also all things that are in it. These men, even as the Gentiles, have been set forth by Satan to bring dishonor upon the church, so that in one way or another, men hearing the things which they speak, and imagining that we all are such as they, may turn away their ears from the preaching of the truth, or again, seeing the things they practice, may speak evil of us all, who have in fact no fellowship with them, 
either in doctrine or in morals, or in our daily conduct. But they lead a licentious life, and to conceal their impious doctrines, they abuse the name of Christ, as a means of hiding their wickedness, so that their condemnation is just, when they receive from God a recompense suited to their works. 4. So unbridled is their madness, that they declare they have in their power all things which are irreligious and impious, and are at liberty to practice them, for they maintain that things are evil or good, simply in virtue of human opinion. They deem it necessary, therefore, that by means of transmigration from body to body, soul should have experience of every kind of life, as well as every kind of action, unless, indeed, by a single incarnation, one may be able to prevent any need for others, by once for all, and with equal completeness, doing all those things which we dare not either speak or hear of, nay, which we must not even conceive in our thoughts, nor think credible, if any such thing is mooted among those persons who are our fellow-citizens, in order that, as their writing express it, their souls, having made trial of every kind of life, may at their departure not be wanting in any particular. It is necessary to insist upon this, lest on account of some one thing being still wanting to their deliverance, they should be compelled once more to become incarnate. They affirm that for this reason Jesus spoke the following parable. Whilst thou art with thine adversary in the way, give all diligence, that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he give thee up to the judge, and the judge surrender thee to the officer, and he cast thee into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt not go out thence until thou pay the very last farthing. They also declare the adversary is one of those angels who are in the world, whom they call the devil, maintaining that he was formed for this purpose, that he might lead those souls which have perished from the world to the supreme ruler. They describe him also as being chief among the makers of the world, and maintain that he delivers such souls, as have been mentioned, to another angel, who ministers to him, that he may shut them up in other bodies, for they declare that the body is a prison. Again they interpret these expressions, Thou shalt not go out thence until thou pay the very last farthing, as meaning that no one can escape from the power of those angels who made the world, but that he must pass from body to body, until he has experience of every kind of action which can be practised in this world, and when nothing is longer wanting to him, then his liberated soul should soar upwards to that God who is above the angels, the makers of the world. In this way also all souls are saved, whether their own, which guarding against all delay, participate in all sorts of actions during one incarnation, or those again who, by passing from body to body, are set free on fulfilling and accomplishing what is requisite in every form of life into which they are sent, so that at length they shall no longer be shut in the body. 5. And thus, if ungodly, unlawful, and forbidden actions are committed among them, I can no longer find ground for believing them to be such. And in their writings we read as follows the interpretation which they give of their views, declaring that Jesus spoke in a mystery to his disciples and apostles privately, and that they requested and obtained permission to hand down the things thus taught them to others who should be worthy and believing. We are saved indeed by means of faith and love, but all other things, while in their nature indifferent, are reckoned by the opinion of men, some good and some evil, there being nothing really evil by nature. 6. Others of them employ outward marks, branding their disciples inside the lobe of the right ear. From among these also arose Marcellina, who came to Rome under the episcopate of Anicetus, and holding these doctrines, she led multitudes astray. They style themselves Gnostics. They also possess images, some of them painted, and others formed from different kinds of material, while they maintain that a likeness of Christ was made by Pilate at that time when Jesus lived among them. They crown these images and set them up along with the images of the philosophers of the world, that is to say, with the images of Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle and the rest. They have also other modes of honoring these images, after the same manner of the Gentiles. End of Book 1 Chapters 23 through 25《Chapters 26 through 29 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 26 Doctrines of Cerinthus, the Ebionites, and Nicolaitanus. 1. Cerinthus again, a man who was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians, taught that the world was not made by the primary God, but by a certain power far separated from him, and at a distance from that principality who is supreme over the universe, and ignorant of him who is above all. He represented Jesus as having not been born of a virgin, but as being the son of Joseph and Mary according to the ordinary course of human generation, while he nevertheless was more righteous, prudent, and wise than other men. Moreover, after his baptism, Christ descended upon him in the form of a dove from the supreme ruler, and that then he proclaimed the unknown father and performed miracles. But at last, Christ departed from Jesus, and that then Jesus suffered and rose again, while Christ remained impassable, inasmuch as he was a spiritual being. 2. Those who are called Ebionites agree that the world was made by God, but their opinions with respect to the Lord are similar to those of Cerinthus and Carpocratus. They use the gospel according to Matthew only and repudiate the apostle paul maintaining that he was an apostate from the law as to the prophetical writings they endeavor to expound them in a somewhat singular manner they practice circumcision persevere in the obedience of those customs which are enjoined by the law and are so judaic in their style of life that they even adore jerusalem as if it were the house of god Three. The Nicolaitanists are the followers of that Nicholas, who was one of the seven first ordained to the diaconate by the apostles. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. The character of these men is very plainly pointed out in the Apocalypse of John, when they are represented as teaching that it is a manner of indifference to practice adultery, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Wherefore, the word has also spoken of them thus. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitanists, which I also hate. Chapter 27 Doctrines of Cerdo and Marcion 1. Cerdo was one who took his system from the followers of Simon, and came to live at Rome in the time of Hyginus who held the ninth place in the Episcopal succession from the Apostles downwards. He taught that the God proclaimed by the Law and the Prophets was not the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the former was known, but the latter unknown, while the one also was righteous, but the other benevolent. 2. Marcion of Pontus succeeded him, and developed his doctrine. In so doing, he advanced the most daring blasphemy against him who is proclaimed as God by the law and the prophets, declaring him to be the author of evils, to take delight in war, to be infirm of purpose, and even to be contrary to himself. But Jesus, being derived from that Father who is above the God that made the world, and coming into Judea in the times of Pontius Pilate the governor, who was the procurator of Tiberius Caesar, was manifested in the form of a man to those who were in Judea, abolishing the prophets and the law, and all the works of that God who made the world, whom also he calls Cosmocrator. Besides this, he mutilates the gospel which is according to Luke, removing all that is written respecting the generation of the Lord, and setting aside a great deal of the teaching of the Lord, in which the Lord is recorded as most dearly confessing that the Maker of the universe is his Father. He likewise persuaded his disciples that he himself was more worthy of credit than are those apostles who have handed down the gospel to us, furnishing them not with the gospel, but merely a fragment of it. In like manner, too, he dismembered the epistles of Paul, removing all that is said by the apostle respecting that God who made the world, to the effect 
that he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and also those passages from the prophetical writings which the Apostle quotes, in order to teach us that they announced beforehand the coming of the Lord. 3. Salvation will be the attainment only of those souls which had learned his doctrine, while the body, as having been taken from the earth, is incapable of sharing in salvation. In addition to his blasphemy against God himself, he advanced this also, truly speaking as with the mouth of the devil, and saying all things in direct opposition to the truth, that Cain, and those like him, and the Sodomites, and the Egyptians, and others like them, and in fine, all the nations who walked in all sorts of abomination, were saved by the Lord on his descending into Hades, and on their running unto him, and that they welcomed him into their kingdom. But the serpent which was in Marcion declared that Abel and Enoch and Noah and those other righteous men who sprang from the patriarch Abraham with all the prophets and those who were pleasing to God did not partake in salvation. For since these men, he says, knew that their God was constantly tempting them, so now they suspected that he was tempting them, and did not run to Jesus or believe his announcement, and for this reason he declared that their souls remained in Hades. 4. But since this man is the only one who has dared openly to mutilate the scriptures, and unblushingly above all others to inveigh against God, I propose specially to refute him, convicting him out of his own writings, and, with the help of God, I shall overthrow him out of those discourses of the Lord and the apostles, which are of authority with him, and of which he makes use. At present, however, I have simply been led to mention him, that thou mightest know that all those who in any way corrupt the truth, and injuriously affect the preaching of the church, are the disciples and successors of Simon Magus of Samaria, although they do not confess the name of their master, in order all the more to seduce others, yet they do teach his doctrines. They set forth, indeed, the name of Christ Jesus as a sort of lure, but in various ways they introduce the impieties of Simon, and thus they destroy multitudes, wickedly disseminating their own doctrines by the use of a good name, and through means of its sweetness and beauty, extending to their hearers the bitter and malignant poison of the serpent, the great author of apostasy. Chapter 28 Doctrines of Tatian, the Encratites, and Others 1. Many offshoots of numerous heresies have already been formed from those heretics we have described. This arises from the fact that numbers of them, indeed, we may say all, desire themselves to be teachers, and to break off from the particular heresy in which they have been involved. Forming one set of doctrines out of a totally different system of opinions, and then again others from others, they insist upon teaching something new, declaring themselves the inventors of any sort of opinion which they may have been able to call into existence. To give an example, springing from Saturninus and Marcion, those who are called Encratites, or self-controlled, preached against marriage, thus setting aside the original creation of God, and indirectly blaming him who made the male and female for the propagation of the human race. Some of those reckoned among them have also introduced abstinence from animal food, thus proving themselves ungrateful to God who formed all things. They deny, too, the salvation of him who was first created. It is but lately, however, that this opinion has been invented among them. A certain man, named Tatian, first introduced the blasphemy. He was a hearer of Justin's and as long as he continued with him, he expressed no such views. But after his martyrdom, he separated from the church, and excited and puffed up by the thought of being a teacher, as if he were superior to others, he composed his own peculiar type of doctrine. 
he invented a system of certain invisible ions, like the followers of Valentinus, while, like Marcion and Saturninus, he declared that marriage was nothing else than corruption and fornication. In his denial of Adam's salvation was an opinion due entirely to himself. 2. Others again, following upon Basilides and Carpocrates, have introduced promiscuous intercourse and a plurality of wives, and are indifferent about eating meats sacrificed to idols, maintaining that God does not greatly regard such matters. But why continue? For it is an impractical attempt to mention all those who, in one way or another, have fallen away from the truth. Chapter 29 Doctrines of various other Gnostic sects, and especially of the Barbeliotes, or Borborians. 1. Besides those, however, among these heretics who are Simonians, and of whom we have already spoken, a multitude of Gnostics have sprung up, and have been manifested like mushrooms growing out of the ground. I now proceed to describe the principal opinions held by them. Some of them, then, set forth a certain ion who never grows old, and exists in a virgin spirit. Him they style Barbelos. They declare that somewhere or other there exists a certain father who cannot be named, and that he was desirous to reveal himself to this Barbelos. Then this Enoia went forward, stood before his face, and demanded from him prognosis, or prescience. But when prognosis had come forth, these two asked for aftharsia, or incorruption, which also came forth, and after that, zoe ionios, or eternal life. Barbelos, glorifying in these, and contemplating their greatness, and in conception thus formed, rejoicing in this greatness, generated light similar to it. They declare that this was the beginning both of light and of the generation of all things, and that the Father, beholding this light, anointed it with his own benignity, that it might be rendered perfect. Moreover, they maintain that this was Christ, who again, according to them, requested that Naus should be given him as an assistant, and Naus came forth accordingly. Besides these, the Father sent forth Logos. The conjunctions of Enoia and Logos, and of Aftharsia and Christ, will thus be formed, while Zoe Ionios was united to Thelema, and Naus to Prognosis. These, then, magnified the great light and Barbelos. 2. They also affirm that Autogenes was afterwards sent forth from Enoia and Logos to be a representation of the great light, and that he was greatly honored, all things being rendered subject unto him. Along with him was sent forth Aletheia, and a conjunction was formed between Autogenes and Aletheia. But they declare that from the light, which is Christ, and from Aftharsia, four luminaries were sent forth to surround Autogenes. And again, from Thelema and Zoe Ionios, four other emissions took place, to wait upon these four luminaries, and these they name Charis, or Grace, Thelesis, or Will, Synesis, or Understanding, and Phronesis, or Prudence. Of these, Charis is connected with the great and first luminary. Him they represent as Soter, or Savior, and style Autogenes. Thelesis, again, is united to the second luminary, whom they also name Raguel, Synesis to the third, whom they call David, and Phronesis to the fourth, whom they name Eleleth. 3. All these, then, being thus settled, Autogenes, moreover, produces a perfect and true man, whom they also call Adamus, inasmuch as neither has he himself ever been conquered, nor have those from whom he sprang. He also was, along with the first light, severed from Armogenes. Moreover, 
perfect knowledge was sent forth by autogenes along with man and was united to him hence he attained to the knowledge of him that is above all invincible power was also conferred on him by the virgin spirit and all things then rested in him to sing praises to the great ion hence also they declare were manifested the mother the father and the son while from anthropos and gnosis that tree was produced which they also style gnosis itself four next they maintain that from the first angel who stands by the side of monogenes the holy spirit has been sent forth whom they also term sophia and prunicus he then perceiving that all the others had consorts while he himself was destitute of one searched after a being to whom he might be united and not finding one he exerted and extended himself to the uttermost and looked down into the lower regions in the expectation of their finding a consort and still not meeting with one he leaped forth from his place in a state of great impatience which had come upon him because he had made his attempt without the good will of his father afterwards under the influence of simplicity and kindness he produced a work in which were to be found ignorance and audacity this work of his they declare to be protarchontus the former of this lower creation but they relate that a mighty power carried him away from his mother and that he settled far away from her in the lower regions and formed the firmament of heaven in which also they affirm that he dwells and in his ignorance he formed those powers which are inferior to himself angels and firmaments and all things earthly they affirm that he being united to Althadia or audacity produced cachia or wickedness zelos or emulation phthonos or envy erinais or fury and epithymia or lust when these were generated the mother sophia deeply grieved fled away departed into the upper regions and became the last of the ogdoad reckoning it downwards on her thus departing he imagined he was the only being in existence and on this account declared i am a jealous god and besides me there is no one such are the falsehoods which these people invent end of book 1 chapters 26 through 29Chapter Thirty of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter Thirty, Doctrines of the Ophites and Sethians. One others again portentously declare that there exists in the power of bythus a certain primary light blessed incorruptible and infinite this is the father of all and is styled the first man they also maintain that his enoia going forth from him produced a son and that this is the son of man the second man below these again is the holy spirit and under this superior spirit the elements were separated from each other viz water darkness the abyss chaos above which they declare the spirit was born calling him the first woman afterwards they maintain the first man with his son delighting over the beauty of the spirit that is of the woman and shedding light upon her begat by her an incorruptible light the third male, whom they call Christ, the son of the first and second man, and of the Holy Spirit, the first woman. 2. The father and the son, thus, both had intercourse with the woman, whom they also call the mother of the living. When, however, 
she could not bear nor receive into herself the greatness of the lights. They declared that she was filled to repletion, and became ebullient on the left side, and that thus their only son Christ, as belonging to the right side, and never tending to what was higher, was immediately caught up with his mother to form an incorruptible ion. This constitutes the true and holy church, which has become the appellation, the meeting together, and the union of the father of all, of the first man, of the son, of the second man, of Christ their son, and of the woman who has been mentioned. 3. They teach, however, that the power which proceeded from the woman by ebullition, being besprinkled with light, fell downward from the place occupied by its progenitors, yet possessing by its own will that besprinkling of light, and it they call sinistra, prunicus, and sophia, as well as masculo-feminine. This being, in its simplicity, descended into the waters while they were yet in a state of immobility and imparted motion to them also, wantingly acting upon them even to their lowest depths, and assumed from them a body. For they affirm that all things rushed towards and clung to that sprinkling of light, and begirt it all around. Unless it had possessed that, it would perhaps have been totally absorbed in, and overwhelmed by, material substance being therefore bound down by a body which was composed of matter and greatly burdened by it, this power regretted the course it had followed and made an attempt to escape from the waters and ascend to its mother. It could not effect this, however, on account of the weight of the body lying over and around it. But feeling very ill at ease, it endeavored at least to conceal that light which came from above, fearing lest it too might be injured by the inferior elements, as had happened to itself. And when it had received power from that besprinkling of light which it possessed, it sprang back again, and was borne aloft, and being on high, it extended itself, covered a portion of space, and formed this visible heaven out of its body, yet remained under the heaven which it made as still possessing the form of a watery body. But when it had conceived a desire for the light above, and had received power by all things, it laid down this body, and was freed from it. This body which they speak of that power as having thrown off, they call a female from a female. 4. They declare, moreover, that her son had also himself a certain breath of incorruption left him by his mother, and that, through means of it, he works. And becoming powerful, he himself, as they affirm, also sent forth from the waters a son without a mother, for they do not allow him either to have known a mother. His son, again, after the example of his father, sent forth another son. This third one, too, generated a fourth, the fourth also generated a son. They maintain that again a son was generated by the fifth, and the sixth too generated a seventh. Thus was the hebdomad, according to them, completed, the mother possessing the eighth place, and as in the case of their generations, so also in regard to dignities and powers, they precede each other in turn. 5. They have also given names to the several persons in their system of falsehood, such as the following. He who was the first descendant of the mother is called Ildabioth. He again, descended from him, is named Iol. He, from this one, is called Sabaoth. The fourth is named Adonius. The fifth, Elius. The sixth, Oreus. And the seventh and last of all, Astenphius. Moreover, they represent these heavens, potentates, powers, angels, and creators, as sitting in their proper order in heaven, according to their generation, and as invisibly ruling over things celestial and terrestrial. The first of them, namely Ildabaoth, holds his mother in contempt, 
inasmuch as he produced sons and grandsons without the permission of any one, yea, even angels, archangels, powers, potentates, and dominions. After these things had been done, his sons turned to strive and quarrel with him about the supreme power, conduct which deeply grieved Ialdabaoth, and drove him to despair. In these circumstances, he cast his eyes upon the subjacent dregs of matter, and fixed his desire upon it, to which they declare his son owes his origin. This son is Naus himself, twisted into the form of a serpent, and hence were derived the spirit, the soul, and all mundane things. From this too were generated all oblivion, wickedness, emulation, envy, and death. They declare that the father imparted still greater crookedness to this serpent-like and contorted nous of theirs, when he was with their father in heaven and paradise. 6. On this account, Ialdabaoth, becoming uplifted in spirit, boasted himself over all those things that were below him, and exclaimed, I am father and God, and above me there is no one. But his mother, hearing him speak thus, cried out against him, Do not lie, Ialdabaoth, for the father of all, the first Anthropos, is above thee, and so is Anthropos, the son of Anthropos. Then, as all were disturbed by this new voice, and by the unexpected proclamation, and as they were inquiring whence the noise proceeded, in order to lead them away and attract them to himself, they affirm that Ialdabaoth exclaimed, Come, let us make a man after our image. The six powers, on hearing this, and their mother furnishing them with the idea of a man, in order that by means of him she might empty them of their original power, jointly formed a man of immense size, both in regard to breadth and length, but as he could merely writhe along the ground, they carried him to their father, Sophia so laboring in this matter, that she might empty him, that is, Ialdabaoth, of the light with which he had been sprinkled, so that he might no longer, though still powerful, be able to lift himself against the powers above. They declare, then, that by breathing into man the spirit of life, he was secretly emptied of his power, that hence man became a possessor of nous, or intelligence, and enthymesis, or thought, and they affirm that these are the faculties which partake in salvation. He, they further assert, at once gave thanks to the first Anthropos, forsaking those who had created him. 7. But, Ialdabaoth, feeling envious at this, was pleased to form the design and again emptying man by means of woman, and proceeded a woman from his own enthymesis, whom that Pronicus, mentioned above, laying hold of, imperceptibly emptied her of power. But the others, coming and admiring her beauty, named her Eve, and falling in love with her, begat sons by her, whom they also declare to be the angels. But their mother, Sophia, cunningly devised a scheme to seduce Eve and Adam by means of the serpent, to transgress the command of Ialdabaoth. Eve listened to this as if it had proceeded from a son of God, and yielded an easy belief. She also persuaded Adam to eat of the tree regarding which God had said that they should not eat of it. They then declare that, on their thus eating, they attained to the knowledge of that power which is above all, and departed from those who had created them. When Prunicus perceived that the powers were thus baffled by their own creature, she greatly rejoiced, and again cried out, that since the father was incorruptible, he, that is, Ialdabaoth, who formerly called himself the father, was a liar, and that, while Anthropos and the first woman, being the spirit, existed previously, this one, being Eve, sinned, 
by committing adultery. 8. Ialdabaoth, however, through that oblivion in which he was involved, and not paying any regard to these things, cast Adam and Eve out of paradise, because they had transgressed his commandment. For he had a desire to beget sons by Eve, but did not accomplish his wish, because his mother opposed him in every point, and secretly emptied Adam and Eve of the light with which they had been sprinkled, in order that that spirit which proceeded from the supreme power might participate neither in the curse nor opprobrium caused by transgression. They also teach that, thus being emptied of the divine substance, they were cursed by him and cast down from heaven to this world. But the serpent also, who was acting against the father, was cast down by him into this lower world, he reduced, however, under his power the angels here, and begat six sons, he himself forming the seventh person, after the example of that hebdomad which surrounds the father. They further declare that these are the seven mundane demons, who always oppose and resist the human race, because it was on their account that their father was cast down to this lower world. 9. Adam and Eve previously had light, and clear, and as it were, spiritual bodies, which, as they were at their creation. But when they came to this world, they changed into bodies more opaque, and gross, and sluggish. Their soul also was feeble and languid, inasmuch as they had received from their Creator a merely mundane inspiration. This continued until Prunicus, moved with compassion towards them, restored to them the sweet savor of the besprinkling of light, by means of which they came to a remembrance of themselves, and knew that they were naked, as well as that the body was a material substance, and thus recognized that they bore death about with them. They thereupon became patient, knowing that only for a time they would be enveloped in the body. They also found out food through the guidance of Sophia, and when they were satisfied, they had carnal knowledge of each other, and begat Cain, whom the serpent, that had been cast down along with his sons, immediately laid hold of, and destroyed by filling him with mundane oblivion, and urging him into folly and audacity, so that, by slaying his brother Abel, he was the first to bring to light envy and death. After these, they affirm that, by the forethought of Prunicus, Seth was begotten, and then Norea, from whom they represent all the rest of mankind as being descended. They were urged on to all kinds of wickedness by the inferior hebdomad, and to apostasy, idolatry, and a general contempt of everything by the superior holy hebdomad, since the mother was always secretly opposed to them, and carefully preserved what was peculiarly her son, that is, the besprinkling of light. They maintain, moreover, that the hebdomad is the seven stars which they call planets, and they affirm that the serpent cast down has two names, Michael and Samael. 10. Ialdabaoth, again, being incensed with men, because they did not worship or honor him as father and God, sent forth a deluge upon them, that he might at once destroy them all. But Sophia opposed him in this point also, and Noah and his family were saved in the ark by means of the besprinkling of that light which proceeded from her. And through it the world was again filled with mankind. Ialdabaoth himself chose a certain man named Abraham from among these, and made a covenant with him, to the effect that, if his seed continued to serve him, he would give to them the earth for an inheritance. Afterwards, by means of Moses, he brought forth Abraham's descendants from Egypt, and gave them the law, and made them the Jews. Among that people he chose seven days, which they also call the Holy Hebdomad. 
each of these receives his own herald for the purpose of glorifying and proclaiming God, so that, when the rest hear these praises, they too may serve those who are announced as gods by the prophets. 11. Moreover, they distribute the prophets in the following manner. Moses and Joshua the son of Nun and Amos and Habakkuk belonged to Ialdabaoth, Samuel and Nathan, and Jonah and Micha to Io, Elijah, Joel, and Zechariah to Sabaoth, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel to Adonai, Tobias and Haggai to Eloi, Micaiah and Nahum to Oreus, Esdras and Zephaniah to Astenphaius. Each one of these, then, glorifies his own father and God, and they maintain that Sophia herself has also spoken many things through them regarding the first Anthropos, and concerning that Christ who is above, thus admonishing and reminding men of the incorruptible light, the first Anthropos, and of the descent of Christ. The other powers, being terrified by these things, and marveling at the novelty of those things which were announced by the prophets, Prunicus brought it about by means of Ialdabaoth, who knew not what he did, that emissions of two men took place, the one from the barren Elizabeth, and the other from the Virgin Mary. 12. And since she herself had no rest, either in heaven or on earth, she invoked her mother to assist her in her distress. Upon this, her mother, the first woman, was moved with compassion towards her daughter on her repentance, and begged from the first man that Christ should be sent to her assistance, who, being sent forth, descended with his sister to the besprinkling of light. When he recognized her, that is, the Sophia below, her brother descended to her, and announced his advent through means of John, and prepared the baptism of repentance, and adopted Jesus beforehand, in order that, on Christ descending, he might find a pure vessel, and that by the son of that Ialdabaoth, the woman might be announced by Christ. They further declare that he descended through the seven heavens, having assumed the likeness of their sons, and gradually emptied them of their power. For they maintain that the whole besprinkling of light rushed to him, and that Christ, descending to this world, first clothed his sister Sophia with it, and that then both exulted in the mutual refreshment they felt in each other's society. This scene they describe as relating to bridegroom and bride. But Jesus inasmuch as he was begotten of the virgin through the agency of God, was wiser, purer, and more righteous than all other men. Christ, united to Sophia, descended into him, and thus Jesus Christ was produced. 13. They affirm that many of his disciples were not aware of the descent of Christ into him, but that, when Christ did descend on Jesus, he then began to work miracles, and heal, and announce the unknown Father, and openly to confess himself the Son of the first man. The powers and the Father of Jesus were angry at these proceedings, and labored to destroy him, and when he was being led away for this purpose, they say that Christ himself, along with Sophia, departed from him into the state of an incorruptible ion, while Jesus was crucified. Christ, however, was not forgetful of his Jesus, and sent down a certain energy into him from above, which raised him up again in the body, which they call both animal and spiritual, for he sent the mundane parts back again into the world. When his disciples saw that he had risen, they did not recognize him, no, not even Jesus himself, by whom he rose again from the dead, and they assert that this very great error prevailed among his disciples, that they imagined he had risen in a mundane body, not knowing that flesh and blood do not attain to the kingdom of God. 14. 
They strove to establish the descent and ascent of Christ, by the fact that neither before his baptism nor after his resurrection from the dead do his disciples state that he did any mighty works, not being aware that Jesus was united to Christ, and the incorruptible Ion to the Hebdomad. And they declare his mundane body to be of the same nature as that of animals. But after his resurrection, he tarried on earth eighteen months, and knowledge descending into him from above, he taught what was clear. He instructed a few of his disciples, whom he knew to be capable of understanding so great mysteries, in these things, and was then received up into heaven. Christ, sitting down at the right hand of his father Ialdabaoth, that they may receive to himself the souls of those who have known them, after they have laid aside their mundane flesh, thus enriching himself without the knowledge or perception of his father, so that, in proportion as Jesus enriches himself with holy souls, to such an extent does his father suffer loss and is diminished, being emptied of his own power by these souls. For he will not now possess holy souls to send them down again into the world, except those only which are of his substance, that is, those into which he has breathed. But the consummation of all things will take place, when the whole besprinkling of the spirit of light is gathered together, and is carried off to form an incorruptible ion. 15. Such are the opinions which prevail among these persons, by whom, like the Lernaean Hydra, a many-headed beast has been generated from the school of Valentinus. For some of them assert that Sophia herself became the serpent, on which account she was hostile to the creator of Adam, and implanted knowledge in men, for which reason the serpent was called wiser than all others. Moreover, by the position of our intestines, through which the food is conveyed, and by the fact that they possess such a figure, our internal configuration in the form of a serpent reveals our hidden generatrix. End of Book 1, Chapter 30Chapter 31 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 31. Doctrines of the Cainites. 1. Others again declare that Cain derived his being from the power above, and acknowledge that Esau, Korah, the Sodomites, and all such persons are related to themselves. On this account, they add, they have been assailed by the Creator, yet no one of them has suffered injury. For Sophia was in the habit of carrying off that which belonged to her, from them to herself. They declare that Judas the traitor was thoroughly acquainted with these things, and that he alone, knowing the truth as no others did, accomplished the mystery of the betrayal. By him all things, both earthly and heavenly, were thus thrown into confusion. They produce a fictitious history of this kind, which they style the Gospel of Judas. 2. I have also made a collection of their writings in which they advocate the abolition of the doings of Hystera. Moreover, they call this Hystera the creator of heaven and earth. They also hold, like Carpocrates, that men cannot be saved until they have gone through all kinds of experience. An angel, they maintain, attends them in every one of their sinful and abominable actions and urges them to venture on audacity and incur pollution. Whatever may be the nature of the action, they declare that they do it in the name of the angel, saying, O thou angel, I use thy work. 
O thy power, I accomplish my operation. And they maintain that this is perfect knowledge, without shrinking to rush into such actions as it is not lawful even to name. 3. It was necessary clearly to prove that, as their very opinions and regulations exhibit them, those who are of the school of Valentinus derive their origin from such mothers, fathers and ancestors, and also to bring forward their doctrines, with the hope that perchance some of them, exercising repentance and returning to the only Creator, and God the former of the universe, may obtain salvation, and that others may not henceforth be drawn away by their wicked, although plausible persuasions, imagining that they will obtain from them the knowledge of some greater and more sublime mysteries. But let them rather, learning to good effect from us the wicked tenets of these men, look with contempt upon their doctrines, while at the same time they pity those who, still cleaving to these miserable and baseless fables, have reached such a pitch of arrogance as to reckon themselves superior to all others on account of such knowledge, or as it should rather be called ignorance. They have now been fully exposed, and simply to exhibit their sentiments is to obtain a victory over them. 4. Wherefore I have laboured to bring forth, and make clearly manifest, the utterly ill-conditioned carcass of this miserable little fox. For there will not now be need of many words to overcome their system of doctrine, when it has been made manifest to all. It is as when, on a beast hiding itself in a wood, and by rushing forth from it is in the habit of destroying multitudes, one who beats round the wood and thoroughly explores it, so as to compel the animal to break cover, does not strive to capture it, seeing that it is truly a ferocious beast. But those present can then watch and avoid its assaults, and can cast darts at it from all sides, and wound it, and finally slay that destructive brute. So in our case, since we have brought their hidden mysteries, which they keep in silence among themselves to the light, it will not now be necessary to use many words in destroying their system of opinions. For it is now in thy power, and in the power of all thy associates, to familiarize yourselves with what has been said, to overthrow their wicked and undigested doctrines, and to set forth doctrines agreeable to the truth. Since then the case is so, I shall, according to promise, and as my ability serves, labor to overthrow them, by refuting them all in the following book. Even to give an account of them is a tedious affair, as thou seest, but I shall furnish means for overthrowing them, by meeting all their opinions in the order in which they have been described, that I may not only expose the wild beast to view, but may inflict wounds upon it from every side. End of Book 1, Chapter 31 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Preface through Chapter 2 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rambeau. Preface. In the first book, which immediately precedes this, exposing knowledge falsely so called, I showed thee, my very dear friend, that the whole system devised, in many and opposite ways, by those who are of the school of Valentinus, was false and baseless. I also set forth the tenets of their predecessors, proving that they not only differ among themselves, but had long previously swerved from the truth itself. I further explained, with all diligence, the doctrine as well as practice of Marcus the Magician, since he too belongs to these persons. 
and they carefully notice the passages which they garble from the scriptures, with the view of adapting them to their own fictions. Moreover, I minutely narrated the manner in which, by means of numbers and by the twenty-four letters of the alphabet, they boldly endeavor to establish what they regard as truth. I have also related how they think and teach that creation at large was formed after the image of their invisible pleroma, and what they hold respecting the demiurg, declaring at the same time the doctrine of Simon Magus of Samaria, their progenitor, and of all those who succeeded him. I mention, too, the multitude of those Gnostics who are sprung from him, and notice the points of difference between them, their several doctrines, and the order of their succession, while I set forth all those heresies which have been originated by them. I showed, moreover, that all these heretics, taking their rise from Simeon, have introduced impious and irreligious doctrines into this life. And I explained the nature of the redemption, and their method of initiating those who are rendered perfect, along with their invocations and their mysteries. I proved also that there is one God, the Creator, and that He is not the fruit of any defect, nor is there anything either above Him or after Him. In the present book I shall establish those points which fit in with my design, so far as time permits, and overthrow, by means of lengthened treatment under distinct heights, their whole system, for which reason, since it is an exposure and subversion of their opinions, I have so entitled the composition of this work. For it is fitting, by a plain revelation and overthrow of their conjunctions, to put an end to these hidden alliances, and to Bythus himself, and thus to obtain a demonstration that he never existed at any previous time, nor now has any existence. Chapter 1 There is but one God, the impossibility of its being otherwise. It is proper, then, that I should begin with the first and most important heed, that is, God the Creator, who made the heaven and the earth, and all things that are therein, whom these men blasphemously style the fruit of a defect, and to demonstrate that there is nothing either above him nor after him, nor that, influenced by any one but of his own free will, he created all things, since he is the only God, the only Lord, the only Creator, the only Father, alone containing all things, and himself commanding all things into existence. For how can there be any other fullness or principle or power of, or God above him, since it is matter of necessity that God, the pleroma, fullness, of all these, should contain all things in his immensity, and should be contained by no one? But if there is anything beyond him, he is not then the pleroma of all, nor does he contain all. For that which they declare to be beyond him will be wanting to the pleroma, or, in other words, to that God who is above all things. But that which is wanting and falls in any way short is not the pleroma of all things. In such a case, he would have both beginning, middle, and end with respect to those who are beyond him. And if he has an end in regard to those things which are below, he has also a beginning with respect to those things which are above. In like manner, there is an absolute necessity that he should experience the very same thing at all other points, and should be held in, bounded, and enclosed by those existences that are outside of him. For that being who is the end downwards necessarily circumscribes and surrounds him who finds his end in it. And thus, according to them, the father of all, that is, he whom they call Proon or Proarchi, with their Pleroma, and the good God of Marcion, is established and enclosed in some other, and is surrounded from without by another mighty being, who must of necessity be greater, inasmuch as that which contains is greater than that which is contained. But then that which is greater is also stronger, and in a greater degree lord, 
and that which is greater and stronger, and in a greater degree Lord, must be God. Now, since there exists, according to them, also something else which they declare to be outside of the Pleroma, into which they further hold, there descended that higher power who went astray. It is in every way necessary that the Pleroma either contains that which is beyond, yet is contained, for otherwise it will not be beyond the Pleroma. For if there is anything beyond the Pleroma, there will be a Pleroma within this very Pleroma, which they declare to be outside of the Pleroma, and the Pleroma will be contained by that which is beyond. And with the Pleroma is understood also the first God. Or again, they must be an infinite distance separated from each other, the Pleroma, I mean, and that which is beyond it. But if they maintain this, there will be then a third kind of existence, which separates by immensity the Pleroma and that which is beyond it. This third kind of existence will therefore bound and contain both the others, and will be greater both than the Pleroma and than that which is beyond it, inasmuch as it contains both in its bosom. In this way, talk might go on for ever, concerning those things which are contained and those which contain. For if this third existence has its beginning above and its end beneath, there is an absolute necessity that it be also bounded on the sides, either beginning or ceasing, at certain other points, where new existences begin. These again and others which are above or below will have their beginnings and certain other points, and so on ad infinitum, so that their thoughts would never rest in one God, but in consequence of seeking after more than exists, would wander away to that which has no existence, and depart from the true God. These remarks are, in like manner, applicable against the followers of Marcion, for his two gods will also be contained and circumscribed by an immense interval, which separates them from one another. But then there is a necessity to suppose a multitude of gods, separated by an immense distance from each other on every side, beginning with one another and ending in one another. Thus, by that very process of reasoning, on which they depend for teaching, that there is a certain pleroma or God above the Creator of heaven and earth, any one who chooses to employ it may maintain that there is another pleroma above the pleroma, above that again another, and above both another ocean of deity, while in like manner the same successions hold with respect to the sides, and thus their doctrine flowing out into immensity there will always be a necessity to conceive of other pleroma and other bathy, so as never at any time to stop, but always to continue seeking for others, besides those already mentioned. Moreover, it will be uncertain whether these which we conceive of are below, or are in fact themselves the things which are above, and in like manner will be doubtful respecting those things which are said by them to be above, whether they are really above or below. And thus our opinions will have no fixed conclusion or certainty, but will of necessity wander forth after worlds without limits, and gods that cannot be numbered. These things then being so, each deity will be contented with his own possessions, and will not be moved with any curiosity respecting the affairs of others. Otherwise he would be unjust and rapacious and would cease to be what God is. Each creation, too, will glorify its own Maker and will be contented with Him, not knowing any other. Otherwise it would be most justly be deemed an apostate by all the others and would receive a richly deserved punishment. For it must be either that there is one being who contains all things and formed in his own territory all those things which have been created, according to his own will, or again, that there are numerous and limited creators and gods, who begin from each other and end in each other on every side, and it will then be necessary to allow 
that all the rest are contained from without by someone who is greater, and that they are each of them shut up within their own territory and remain in it. No one of them all, therefore, is God, for there will be much wanting to every one of them, possessing, as he will do, only a very small part when compared with all the rest. The name of the Omnipotent will thus be brought to an end, and such an opinion will of necessity fall to impiety. Chapter 2 The world was not formed by angels, or by any other being, contrary to the will of the Most High God, but was made by the Father through the Word. Those, moreover, who say that the world was formed by angels, or by any other maker of it, contrary to the will of Him, who is the Supreme Father, err, first of all, in this very point, that they maintain that angels formed such and so mighty a creation, contrary to the will of the Most High God. This would imply that angels were more powerful than God, or if not so, that He was either careless or inferior, or paid no regard to those things which took place among his own possessions, whether they turned out ill or well, so that he might drive away and prevent the one, while he praised and rejoiced over the other. But if one would not ascribe such conduct, even to a man of any ability, how much less to God? Next, let them tell us whether these things have been formed within the limits which are contained by him, and in his proper territory, or in regions belonging to others, and lying beyond him. But if they say that these things were done beyond him, then all the absurdities already mentioned will face them, and the supreme God will be enclosed by that which is beyond him, in which also it will be necessary that he should find his end. If, on the other hand, these things were done within his own proper territory, it will be very idle to say, that the world was thus formed within his proper territory against his will, by angels, who are themselves under his power, or by any other being, as if either he himself did not behold all things which take place among his own possessions, or was not aware of the things to be done by angels. If, however, the things referred to were done, not against his will, but with his concurrence and knowledge, as some of these men think, the angels, or the former of the world, whoever that may have been, will no longer be the causes of that formation, but the will of God. For if he is the former of the world, he too made the angels, or at least was the cause of their creation, and he will be regarded as having made the world, who prepared the causes of its formation." Although they maintain that the angels were made by a long succession downwards, or that the former of the world sprang from the Supreme Father, as Basilides asserts, nevertheless that which is the cause of those things which have been made will still be traced to him who was the author of such a succession. The case stands just as regards success in war, which is ascribed to the king, who prepared those things which are the cause of victory, and in like manner, the creation of any state or of any work is referred to him who prepared materials for the accomplishment of those results which were afterwards brought about. Wherefore we do not say that it was the axe which cut the wood, or the saw which divided it, but one would very properly say that the man cut and divided it, who formed the axe and the saw for this purpose and who also formed at a much earlier date all the tools by which the axe and the saw themselves were formed. With justice, therefore, according to an analogous process of reasoning, the father of all will be declared the former of this world, and not the angels, nor any other so-called former of the world, other than he who was its author, and had formerly been the cause of the preparation for a creation of this kind. This manner of speech may perhaps be plausible or persuasive to those who know not God and who liken him to needy human beings and to those who cannot immediately and without assistance form anything, but require many instrumentalities to produce what they intend. But it will not be regarded as at all probable by those 
who knows that God stands in need of nothing, and that he created and made all things by his word, while he neither required angels to assist him in the production of those things which are made, nor of any power greatly inferior to himself, and ignorant of the Father, nor of any defect or ignorance, in order that he who should know him might become man. But he himself in himself, after a fashion which we can neither describe nor conceive, predestinating all things, formed them as he pleased, bestowing harmony on all things, and assigning them their own place, and the beginning of their creation. In this way he conferred on spiritual things a spiritual and invisible nature, on super-celestial things a celestial, on angels an angelical, on animals an animal, on beings that swim a nature suited to the water, and in those that live on the land, one fitted for the land, on all, in short, a nature suitable to the character of the life assigned them, while he formed all things that were made by his word that never varies. For this is a peculiarity of the preeminence of God, not to stand in need of other instruments for the creation of those things which are summoned into existence. His own word is both suitable and sufficient for the formation of all things, even as John, the disciple of the Lord, declares regarding him. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. Now, among all things, our world must be embraced. It too, therefore, was made by his word, as Scripture tells us in the book of Genesis, that he made all things connected with our world by his word. David also expresses the same truth when he says, For he spake, and they were made. He commanded, and they were created. Whom therefore shall we believe as to the creation of the world, these heretics who have been mentioned, that prayed so foolishly and inconsistently on the subject, or the disciples of the Lord and Moses, who was both a faithful servant of God and a prophet? He at first narrated the formation of the world in these words. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and all other things in succession, but neither gods nor angels had any share in the work. Know that as God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul the Apostle also has declared, saying, There is one God, the Father, who is above all, and through all things, and in us all. I have indeed proved already that there is only one God, but I shall further demonstrate this from the apostles themselves, and from the discourses of the Lord. For what sort of conduct would it be, were we to forsake the utterances of the prophets, of the Lord, and of the apostles, that they might give heed to these persons, who speak not a word of sense? End of Book 2 Preface through chapter 2 Chapters 3 through 5 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2 Translated by Alexander Roberts and W. H. Rambeau Chapter 3 the Bythus and Pleroma of the Valentinians, as well as the God of Marcion, shown to be absurd. The world was actually created by the same being who had conceived the idea of it, and was not the fruit of defect or ignorance. 1. The Bythus, therefore, whom they conceive of with his Pleroma, and the God of Marcion, are inconsistent. If indeed, as they affirm, he has something subjacent and beyond himself, which they style vacuity and shadow, this vacuum is then proved to be greater than their pleroma. But it is inconsistent even to make this statement, that while he contains all things within himself, the creation was formed by some other. For it is absolutely necessary that they acknowledge a certain void and chaotic kind of existence, below the spiritual pleroma, in which this universe was formed, and that the propator purposely left this chaos as it was, either knowing beforehand what things were to happen in it, or being ignorant of them. If he was really ignorant, 
then God will not be prescient of all things. But they will not even in that case be able to assign a reason on what account he thus left this place void during so long a period of time. If again he is prescient, and contemplated mentally that creation which was about to have a being in that place, then he himself created it, who also formed it beforehand ideally in himself. 2. Let them cease, therefore, to affirm that the world was made by any other, for as soon as God formed a conception in his mind, that was also done which he had thus mentally conceived. For it is not possible that one being should mentally form the conception, and another actually produce the things which had been conceived by him in his mind. But God, according to these heretics, mentally conceived either an eternal world or a temporal one, both of which suppositions cannot be true. Yet if he had mentally conceived of it as eternal, spiritual, and visible, it would also have been formed such. But if it was formed such as it really is, then he made it such who had mentally conceived of it as such, or he willed it to exist in the ideality of the Father, according to the conception of his mind, such as it now is, compound, mutable, and transient. Since then, it is just such as the Father had ideally formed in counsel with himself, it must be worthy of the Father. But to affirm that what was mentally conceived and pre-created by the Father of all, just as it has been actually formed, is the fruit of defect, and the production of ignorance, is to be guilty of great blasphemy. For, according to them, the Father of all will thus be regarded as generating in his breast according to his own mental conception, the emanations of defect and the fruits of ignorance, since the things which he had conceived in his mind have actually been produced. Chapter 4. The absurdity of the supposed vacuum and defect of the heretics is demonstrated. 1. The cause, then, of such a dispensation on the part of God is to be inquired after, but the formation of the world is not to be ascribed to any other and all things are to be spoken of as having been so prepared by God beforehand that they should be made as they have been made, but shadow and vacuity are not to be conjured into existence. But whence, let me ask, came this vacuity, of which they speak? If it was indeed produced by him who, according to them, is the father and author of all things, then it is both equal in honor and related to the rest of the eons, perchance even more ancient than they are. Moreover, if it proceeded from the same source as they did, it must be similar in nature to him who produced it, as well as to those along with whom it was produced. There will therefore be an absolute necessity, both that the Baithus of whom they speak, along with Saiji, be similar in nature to a vacuum, that is, that he really is a vacuum, and that the rest of the eons, since they are the brothers of vacuity, should also be devoid of substance. If, on the other hand, it has not been thus produced, it must have sprang from and been generated by itself, and in that case it will be equal in point of age to that Baithus who is, according to them, the father of all. And thus vacuity will be of the same nature and of the same honor with him who is, according to them, the universal father for it must of necessity have been either produced by someone, or generated by itself, and sprung from itself. But if, in truth, vacuity was produced, then its producer Valentinus is also a vacuum, as are likewise his followers. If, again, it was not produced, but was generated by itself, then that which is really a vacuum is similar to, and the brother of, and of the same honor with, that father who has been proclaimed by Valentinus. While it is more ancient, and dating its existence from a period greatly anterior, and more exalted in honor than the remaining eons of Ptolemy himself, and Heraclion, and all the rest who hold the same opinions. 2. But if, driven to despair in regard to these points, they confess that the father of all contains all things, and that there is nothing whatever outside of the pleroma, for it is an absolute necessity that, if there be anything outside of it, it should be bounded and circumscribed by something greater than itself, and that they speak of what is without and what within, 
in reference to knowledge and ignorance, and not with respect to local distance, but that, in the pleroma, or in those things which are contained by the Father, the whole creation which we know to have been formed, having been made by the demiurge or by the angels, is contained by the unspeakable greatness, as the center is in a circle, or as a spot is in a garment, then in the first place, what sort of a being must that Bythus be, who allows a stain to have place in his own bosom, and permits another one to create or produce within his territory, contrary to his own will? Such a mode of acting would truly entail the charge of degeneracy upon the entire pleroma, since it might from the first have cut off that defect, and those emanations which derive their origin from it, and not have agreed to permit the formation of creation, either in ignorance, or passion, or in defect. For he who can afterwards rectify a defect, and does, as it were, wash away a stain, could at a much earlier date have taken care that no such stain should, even at first, be found among his possessions. For if at the first he allowed that the things which were made should be as they are, since they could not, in fact, be formed otherwise, then it follows that they must always continue in the same condition. For how is it possible that those things which cannot at the first obtain rectification should subsequently receive it? Or how can men say that they are called to perfection when those very beings who are the causes from which men derive their origin, either the demiurge himself or the angels, are declared to exist in defect? And if, as is maintained, the Supreme Being, inasmuch as he is benignant, did at last take pity upon men, and bestow on them perfection, he ought at first to have pitied those who were the creators of man, and to have conferred on them perfection. In this way, men too would verily have shared in his compassion, being formed perfect by those who were perfect. For if he pitied the work of these beings, he ought long before to have pitied themselves, and not to have allowed them to fall into such awful blindness. 3. Their talk also about shadow and vacuity, in which they maintain that the creation with which we are concerned was formed, will be brought to nothing, if the things referred to were created within the territory which is contained by the Father. For if they hold that the light of their Father is such that it fills all things which are inside of him, and illuminates them all, how can any vacuum or shadow possibly exist within that territory which is contained by the pleroma and by the light of the Father? For in that case it behoves them to point out some place within the propator, or within the pleroma, which is not illuminated, nor kept possession of by any one, and in which either the angels or the demiurge formed whatever they pleased nor will it be a small amount of space in which such and so great a creation can be conceived of as having been formed. There will therefore be an absolute necessity that, within the pleroma, or within the father of whom they speak, they should conceive of some place, void, formless, and full of darkness, in which those things were formed which have been formed. By such a supposition, however, the light of their father would incur a reproach, as if he could not illuminate and fill those things which are within himself. Thus then, when they maintain that these things were the fruit of defect and the work of error, they do moreover introduce defect and error within the pleroma and into the bosom of the Father. Chapter 5 This world was not formed by any other beings within the territory which is contained by the Father. 1. The remarks, therefore, which I made a little while ago, are suitable in answer to those who assert that this world was formed outside of the Pleroma, or under a good God, and such persons, with the Father they speak of, will be quite cut off from that which is outside the Pleroma, in which, at the same time, it is necessary that they should finally rest. In answer to those, again, who maintain that this world was formed by certain other beings within that territory, which is contained by the Father, all those points which have now been noticed will present themselves as exhibiting their absurdities and incoherencies, and they will be compelled either to acknowledge all those things which are within the Father, lucid, full, and energetic, 
or to accuse the light of the Father as if he could not illuminate all things, or, as a portion of their pleroma is so described, the whole of it must be confessed to be void, chaotic, and full of darkness. And they accuse all other created things as if these were merely temporal, or at the best, if eternal, yet material. But these, the eons, ought to be regarded as beyond the reach of such accusations, since they are within the pleroma, or the charges in question will equally fall against the entire pleroma. And thus the Christ of whom they speak is discovered to be the author of ignorance. For, according to their statements, when he had given a form so far as substance was concerned to the mother they conceive of, he cast her outside of the pleroma, that is, he cut her off from knowledge. He, therefore, who separated her from knowledge, did in reality produce ignorance in her. How then could the very same person bestow the gift of knowledge on the rest of the eons, those who were anterior to him in production, and yet be the author of ignorance to his mother? For he placed her beyond the pale of knowledge when he cast her outside of the pleroma. 2. Moreover, if they explain being within and without the pleroma as implying knowledge and ignorance respectively, as certain of them do, since he who has knowledge is within that which knows, then they must of necessity grant that the Saviour himself, whom they designate all things, was in a state of ignorance. For they maintain that, on his coming forth outside of the pleroma, he imparted form to their mother, Achamoth. If, then, they assert that whatever is outside the pleroma is ignorant of all things, and if the Saviour went forth to impart form to their mother, then he was situated beyond the pale of the knowledge of all things, that is, he was in ignorance. How, then, could he communicate knowledge to her when he himself was beyond the pale of knowledge? For we, too, they declare to be outside the pleroma, inasmuch as we are outside of the knowledge which they possess. And once more, if the Saviour really went forth beyond the pleroma to seek after the sheep which was lost, but the pleroma is coextensive with knowledge, then he placed himself beyond the pale of knowledge, that is, in ignorance. For it is necessary either that they grant that what is outside the pleroma is so in a local sense, in which case all the remarks formerly made will rise up against them, or if they speak of that which is within in regard to knowledge, and of that which is without in respect to ignorance, then their Saviour, and Christ long before him, must have been formed in ignorance, inasmuch as they went forth beyond the pleroma, that is, beyond the pale of knowledge, in order to impart form to their mother. 3. These arguments may, in like manner, be adapted to meet the case of all those who, in any way, maintain that the world was formed either by angels or by any other one than the true God. For the charges which they bring against the demiurge and those things which were made material and temporal, will in truth fall back on the Father, if indeed the very things which were formed in the bosom of the Pleroma began by and by in fact to be dissolved in accordance with the permission and good will of the Father. The immediate Creator, then, is not the real author of this work, thinking as he did that he formed it very good, but he who allows and approves of the productions of defect and the works of error having a place among his own possessions, and that temporal things should be mixed up with eternal, corruptible with incorruptible, and those which partake of error with those which belong to truth. If, however, these things were formed without the permission or approbation of the Father of all, then that being must be more powerful, stronger, and more kingly, who made these things within a territory which properly belongs to him, the Father, and did so without his permission. If again, as some say, their father permitted these things without approving of them, then he gave the permission on account of some necessity, being either able to prevent such procedure or not able. But if indeed he could not hinder it, then he is weak and powerless, while if he could, he is a seducer, a hypocrite, and a slave of necessity, inasmuch as he does not consent to such a course, and yet allows it as if he did consent. And allowing error to arise at the first, 
and to go on increasing, he endeavors in later times to destroy it, when already many have miserably perished on account of the original defect. 4. It is not seemly, however, to say of him who is God over all, since he is free and independent, that he was a slave to necessity, or that anything takes place with his permission, yet against his desire. Otherwise they will make necessity greater and more kingly than God, since that which has the most power is superior to all others. And he ought at the very beginning to have cut off the causes of the fancied necessity, and not to have allowed himself to be shut up to yielding to that necessity, by permitting anything besides that which became him. For it would have been much better, more consistent, and more godlike, to cut off at the beginning the principle of this kind of necessity, than afterwards, as if moved by repentance, to endeavor to extirpate the results of necessity when they had reached such a development. And if the father of all be a slave to necessity, and must yield to fate, while he unwillingly tolerates the things which are done, but is at the same time powerless to do anything in opposition to necessity and fate, like the Homeric Jupiter, who says of necessity, I have willingly given thee, yet with unwilling mind, then, according to this reasoning, the Bythus of whom they speak will be found to be the slave of necessity and fate. End of Book 2, Chapters 3 through 5《Chapters 6 through 8 of Irenaeus against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Martin. Irenaeus against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 6. The angels and the creator of the world could not have been ignorant of the supreme God. How, again, could either the angels or the creator of the world have been ignorant of the supreme God, seeing they were his property and his creatures, and were contained by him? He might indeed have been invisible to them on account of his superiority, but he could by no means have been unknown to them on account of his providence, for though it is true, as they declare, that they were very far separated from him through their inferiority of nature, yet, as his dominion extended over all of them, it behoved them to know their ruler, and to be aware of this in particular, that he who created them is Lord of all. For since his invisible essence is mighty, it confers on all a profound mental intuition and perception of his most powerful, yea, omnipotent greatness. Wherefore, although no one knows the Father except the Son, nor the Son except the Father, and those to whom the Son will reveal him, yet all beings do know this one fact at least, because reason, implanted in their minds, moves them, and reveals to them the truth that there is one God, the Lord of all. And on this account, all things have been, by general consent, placed under the sway of him who is styled the Most High and the Almighty. By calling upon him, even before the coming of our Lord, men were saved both from most wicked spirits and from all kinds of demons and from every sort of apostate power. This was the case not as if earthly spirits or demons had seen him, but because they knew of the existence of him, who is God over all, at whose invocation they trembled, as there does tremble every creature, and principality, and power, and every being endowed with energy under his government. By way of parallel, shall not those who live under the empire of the Romans, although they have never seen the emperor, but are far separated from him both by land and sea, know very well, as they experience his rule, who it is that possesses the principal power in the state? How then could it be, that those angels who were superior to us in nature, or even he whom they call the creator of the world, did not know the Almighty, when even dumb animals tremble and yield at the invocation of his name? And as, although they have not seen him, yet all things are subject to the name of our Lord, 
so must they also be to his who made and established all things by his word, since it was no other than he who formed the world. And for this reason do the Jews even now put demons to flight by means of this very adjuration, inasmuch as all beings fear the invocation of him who created them. If then they shrink from affirming that the angels are more irrational than the dumb animals, they will find that it behoved these, although they had not seen him who is God over all, to know his power and sovereignty. For it will appear truly ridiculous if they maintain that they themselves indeed, who dwell upon the earth, know him who is God over all whom they have never seen, but will not allow him who, according to their opinion, formed them and the whole world, although he dwells in the heights and above the heavens, to know those things with which they themselves, though they dwell below, are acquainted. This is the case, unless perchance they maintain that Bythus lives in Tartarus below the earth, and that on this account they have attained to a knowledge of him before those angels who have their abode on high. Thus do they rush into such an abyss of madness as to pronounce the creator of the world void of understanding. They are truly deserving of pity, since with such utter folly they affirm that he, the creator of the world, neither knew his mother, nor her seed, nor the pleroma of the eons, nor the propator, nor what the things were which he made, but that these are images of those things which are within the pleroma, the Saviour having secretly laboured that they should be so formed by the unconscious demiurge, in honour of those things which are above. Chapter 7 Created things are not the images of those eons who are within the pleroma. While the demiurge was thus ignorant of all things, they tell us that the Saviour conferred honour upon the pleroma by the creation which he summoned into existence through means of his mother, inasmuch as he produced similitudes and images of those things which are above. But I have already shown that it was impossible that anything should exist beyond the pleroma, in which external region they tell us that images were made of those things which are within the pleroma or that this world was formed by any other one than the supreme God. But if it is a pleasant thing to overthrow them on every side, and to prove them vendors of falsehood, let us say, in opposition to them, that if these things were made by the Saviour, to the honour of those which are above, after their likeness, then it behoved them always to endure, that those things which have been honoured should perpetually continue in honour, but if they do in fact pass away, what is the use of this very brief period of honour? An honour which at one time had no existence, and which shall again come to nothing. In that case I shall prove that the Saviour is rather an aspirant after vainglory than one who honours those things which are above. For what honour can those things which are temporal confer on such as are eternal and endure for ever? or those which pass away on such as remain, or those which are corruptible on such as are incorruptible. Since, even among men who are themselves mortal, there is no value attached to that honour which speedily passes away, but to that which endures as long as it possibly can. But those things which, as soon as they are made, come to an end, may justly be said rather to have been formed for the contempt of such as are thought to be honoured by them, and that that which is eternal is contumeliously treated when its image is corrupted and dissolved. But what if their mother had not wept and laughed and been involved in despair? The Saviour would not then have possessed any means of honouring the fullness, inasmuch as her last state of confusion did not have substance of its own, by which it might honour the propator. Alas for the honour of vainglory which at once passes away, and no longer appears. There will be some eon in whose case such honour will not be thought at all to have had an existence, and then the things which are above will be unhonoured, or it will be necessary to produce once more another mother weeping, and in despair, in order to the honour of the pleroma. What a dissimilar and at the same time blasphemous image! 
Do you tell me that an image of the only begotten was produced by the former of the world, whom again ye wish to be considered the noose, mind, of the father of all, and yet maintain that this image was ignorant of itself, ignorant of creation, ignorant too of the mother, ignorant of everything that exists, and of those things which were made by it. And are you not ashamed while, in opposition to yourselves, you ascribe ignorance even to the only begotten himself? For if these things below were made by the Saviour, after the similitude of those which are above, while he, the Demiurge, who was made after such similitude, was in so great ignorance, it necessarily follows that around him, and in accordance with him, after whose lightness be, that is thus ignorant, was formed, ignorance of the kind in question spiritually exists. For it is not possible, since both were produced spiritually, and neither fashioned nor composed, that in some the lightness was preserved, while in others the lightness of the image was spoiled. That image which was here produced, that it might be according to the image of that production which is above. But if it is not similar, the charge will then attach to the Saviour, who produced a dissimilar image, of being, so to speak, an incompetent workman. For it is out of their power to affirm that the Saviour had not the faculty of production, since they style him all things. If then the image is dissimilar, he is a poor workman, and the blame lies, according to their hypothesis, with the Saviour. If, on the other hand, it is similar, then the same ignorance will be found to exist in the noose, mind, of their propator, that is, the only begotten. The noose of the father, in that case, was ignorant of himself, ignorant too of the father, ignorant, moreover, of those very things which were formed by him. But if he has knowledge, it necessarily follows also that he who was formed after his likeness by the Saviour should know the things which are like, and thus, according to their own principles, their monstrous blasphemy is overthrown. Apart from this, however, how can those things which belong to creation, various, manifold, and innumerable as they are, be the images of those thirty eons which are within the pleroma, whose names, as these men fix them, I have set forth in the book which precedes this? And not only will they be unable to adapt the vast variety of creation at large to the comparative smallness of their pleroma, but they cannot do this even with respect to any one part of it, whether that possessed by celestial or terrestrial beings, or those that live in the waters. For they themselves testify that their pleroma consists of thirty eons. But any one will undertake to show that in a single department of those created beings which have been mentioned, they reckon that there are not thirty, but many thousands of species. How then can those things which constitute such a multiform creation, which are opposed in nature to each other, and disagree among themselves, and destroy the one the other, be the images and likenesses of the thirty eons of the pleroma, if indeed, as they declare, these being possessed of one nature, are of equal and similar properties, and exhibit no differences among themselves? For it was incumbent, if these things are images of those eons, inasmuch as they declare that some men are wicked by nature, and some, on the other hand, naturally good, to point out such differences also among their eons, and to maintain that some of them were produced naturally good, while some were naturally evil, so that the supposition of the likeness of those things might harmonize with the eons. Moreover, since there are in the world some creatures that are gentle, and others that are fierce, some that are innocuous, while others are hurtful and destroy the rest, some have their abode on the earth, others in the water, others in the air, and others in the heaven. In like manner they are bound to show that the eons possess such properties, if indeed the one are the images of the others. And besides, the eternal fire which the Father has prepared for the devil and his angels, they ought to show of which of those eons that are above it is the image. 
for it too is reckoned part of the creation. If, however, they say that these things are the images of the anthemesis of that eon who fell into passion, then, first of all, they will act impiously against their mother by declaring her to be the first cause of evil and corruptible images. And then again, how can those things which are manifold and dissimilar and contrary in their nature be the images of one and the same being? And if they say that the angels of the Pleroma are numerous, and that those things which are many are the images of these, not in this way either will the account they give be satisfactory. For, in the first place, they are then bound to point out differences among the angels of the Pleroma, which are mutually opposed to each other, even as the images existing below are of a contrary nature among themselves. And then again, since there are many, yea, innumerable angels, who surround the Creator, as all the prophets acknowledge, saying, for instance, ten thousand times ten thousand stood beside him, and many thousands of thousands ministered unto him, then, according to them, the angels of the Pleroma will have as images the angels of the Creator, and the entire creation remains in the image of the Pleroma, but so that the thirty eons no longer correspond to the manifold variety of the creation. Still further, if these things below were made after the similitude of those above, after the likeness of which again will those then be made? For if the Creator of the world did not form these things directly from His own conception, but like an architect of no ability, or a boy receiving his first lesson, copied them from archetypes furnished by others, then whence did their Bythus obtain the forms of that creation which he at first produced? It clearly follows that he must have received the model from some other who is above him, and that one in turn from another. And none the less for these suppositions, the talk about images, as about gods, will extend to infinity, if we do not at once fix our mind on one artificer, and on one god, who of himself formed those things which have been created. Or is it really the case that, in regard to mere men, one will allow that they have of themselves invented what is useful for the purposes of life, but will not grant to that God who formed the world that of himself he created the forms of those things which have been made and imparted to it its orderly arrangement? But again, how can these things below be images of those above since they are really contrary to them and can in no respect have sympathy with them? For those things which are contrary to each other may indeed be destructive of those to which they are contrary, but can by no means be their images, as, for instance, water and fire, or again, light and darkness, and other such things, can never be the images of one another. In like manner, neither can those things which are corruptible and earthly, and of a compound nature, and transitory, be the images of those which, according to these men, are spiritual, unless these very things themselves be allowed to be compound, limited in space, and of a definite shape, and thus no longer spiritual, and diffused, and spreading into vast extent, and incomprehensible. For they must of necessity be possessed of a definite figure, and confined within certain limits, that they may be true images, and then it is decided that they are not spiritual. If, however, these men maintain that they are spiritual, and diffused, and incomprehensible, how can those things which are possessed of figure, and confined within certain limits, be the images of such as are destitute of figure, and incomprehensible? If again they affirm that neither according to configuration nor formation, but according to number and the order of production, those things above are the images of these below, then, in the first place, these things below ought not to be spoken of as images and likenesses of those eons that are above. For how can the things which have neither the fashion nor shape of those above be their images? And in the next place, they would adapt both the numbers and productions of the eons above, so as to render them identical with and similar to those that belong to the creation below. But now, since they refer to only thirty eons, 
and declare that the vast multitude of things which are embraced within the creation below are images of those that are but thirty, we may justly condemn them as utterly destitute of sense. Chapter 8. Created things are not a shadow of the pleroma. If again they declare that these things below are a shadow of those above, as some of them are bold enough to maintain, so that in this respect they are images, then it will be necessary for them to allow that those things which are above are possessed of bodies. For those bodies which are above do cast a shadow, but spiritual substances do not, since they can in no degree darken others. If, however, we also grant them this point, though it is, in fact, an impossibility, that there is a shadow belonging to those essences which are spiritual and lucent, into which they declare their mother descended, yet since those things which are above are eternal, and that shadow which is cast by them endures forever, it follows that these things below are also not transitory, but endure along with those which cast their shadow over them. If, on the other hand, these things below are transitory, it is a necessary consequence that those above also, of which these are the shadow, pass away, while, if they endure, their shadow likewise endures. If, however, they maintain that the shadow spoken of does not exist as being produced by the shade of those above, but simply in this respect that the things below are far separated from those above, they will then charge the light of their father with weakness and insufficiency, as if it cannot extend so far as these things, but fails to fill that which is empty and to dispel the shadow, and that when no one is offering any hindrance. For, according to them, the light of their father will be changed into darkness and buried in obscurity, and will come to an end in those places which are characterized by emptiness, since it cannot penetrate and fill all things. Let them no longer declare that their bythus is the fullness of all things, if indeed he has neither filled nor illuminated that which is vacuum and shadow. Or, on the other hand, let them cease talking of vacuum and shadow, if the light of their father does in truth fill all things. Beyond the primary Father, then, that is, the God who is over all, there can neither be any pleroma into which they declare the anthemesis of that eon who suffered passion, descended, so that the pleroma itself, or the primary God, should not be limited and circumscribed by that which is beyond, and should in fact be contained by it, nor can vacuum or shadow have any existence, since the Father exists beforehand, so that his light cannot fail and find end in a vacuum. It is, moreover, irrational and impious to conceive of a place in which he, who is according to them, propator and proarch and father of all and of this pleroma, ceases and has an end. Nor again is it allowable, for the reasons already stated, to allege that some other being formed so vast a creation in the bosom of the Father, either with or without his consent. For it is equally impious and infatuated to affirm that so great a creation was formed by angels, or by some particular production ignorant of the true God in that territory which is his own. Nor is it possible that those things which are earthly and material could have been formed within their pleroma, since that is wholly spiritual. And further, it is not even possible that those things which belong to a multiform creation and have been formed with mutually opposite qualities could have been created after the image of the things above, since these, i.e., the eons, are said to be few and of a like formation and homogeneous. Their talk, too, about the shadow of Kenoma, that is, of a vacuum has in all points turned out false their figment then in what way soever viewed has been proved groundless and their doctrines untenable empty too are those who listen to them and are verily descending into the abyss of perdition end of book two chapter six through eight
Chapters 9 through 12 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Martin. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 9. There is but one Creator of the world, God the Father. This is the constant belief of the Church. That God is the Creator of the world is accepted even by those very persons who in many ways speak against Him, and yet acknowledge Him, styling Him the Creator and an angel, not to mention that all the Scriptures call out to the same effect, and the Lord teaches us of this Father who is in heaven, and no other as I shall show in the sequel of this work. For the present, however, that proof which is derived from those who allege doctrines opposite to ours is of itself sufficient, all men, in fact, consenting to this truth, the ancients on their part preserving with special care from the tradition of the first-form man this persuasion, while they celebrate the praises of one God, the Maker of heaven and earth. Others again, after them, being reminded of this fact by the prophets of God, while the very heathen learned it from creation itself. For even creation reveals him who formed it, and the very work made suggests him who made it, and the world manifests him who ordered it. The universal church, moreover, through the whole world, has received this tradition from the apostles. This God, then, being acknowledged, as I have said, and receiving testimony from all the fact of his existence, that Father whom they conjure into existence is beyond doubt untenable, and has no witnesses to his existence. Simon Magus was the first who said that he himself was God over all, and that the world was formed by his angels. Then those who succeeded him, as I have shown in the first book, by their several opinions, still further depraved his teaching through their impious and irreligious doctrines against the creator these heretics now referred to being the disciples of those mentioned render such as are sent to them worse than the heathen for the former serve the creature rather than the creator and those which are not gods notwithstanding that they ascribe the first place in deity to that god who was the maker of this universe but the latter maintain that he, i.e. the creator of this world, is the fruit of a defect, and describe him as being of an animal nature, and as not knowing that power which is above him, while he also exclaims, I am God, and besides me there is no other God. Affirming that he lies, they are themselves liars, attributing all sorts of wickedness to him, and conceiving of one who is not above this being, as really having an existence, they are thus convicted by their own views of blasphemy against that God who really exists, while they conjure into existence a God who has no existence, to their own condemnation. And thus those who declare themselves perfect, and as being possessed of the knowledge of all things, are found to be worse than the heathen, and to entertain more blasphemous opinions even against their own Creator. Chapter 10 Perverse Interpretations of Scripture by the Heretics God created all things out of nothing, and not from pre-existent matter. It is therefore in the highest degree irrational that we should take no account of Him who is truly God, and who receives testimony from all, while we inquire whether there is above Him that other being who really has no existence, and has never been proclaimed by anyone. For that nothing has been clearly spoken regarding him, they themselves furnish testimony. For since they, with wretched success, transfer to that being who has been conceived of by them, those parables of scripture which, whatever the form in which they have been spoken, are sought after for this purpose, it is manifest that they now generate another God, who was never previously sought after. For by the fact that they thus endeavour to explain ambiguous passages of Scripture, ambiguous, however, not as if referring to another God, but as regards the dispensations of the true God, they have constructed another God, weaving, as I said before, 
ropes of sand, and affixing a more important to a less important question. For no question can be solved by means of another, which itself awaits solution, nor, in the opinion of those possessed of sense, can an ambiguity be explained by means of another ambiguity, or enigmas by means of another greater enigma. But things of such character receive their solution from those which are manifest and consistent and clear. But these heretics, while striving to explain passages of scripture and parables, bring forward another more important and indeed impious question to this effect, whether there be really another God above that God who was the creator of the world, they are not in the way of solving the questions which they propose, for how could they find means of doing so? But they append an important question to one of less consequence, and thus insert in their speculations a difficulty incapable of solution. For in order that they may know knowledge itself, yet not learning this fact, that the Lord, when thirty years old, came to the baptism of truth, they do impiously despise that God who was the Creator, and who sent Him for the salvation of men, and that they may be deemed capable of informing us whence is the substance of matter, while they believe not that God, according to His pleasure, in the exercise of His own will and power, formed all things, so that those things which now are should have an existence, out of what did not previously exist, they have collected a multitude of vain discourses. They thus truly reveal their infidelity, for they do not believe in that which really exists, and they have fallen away into the belief of that which has, in fact, no existence. For when they tell us that all moist substance proceeded from the tears of Achamoth, all lucid substance from her smile, all solid substance from her sadness, all mobile substance from her terror, and that thus they have sublime knowledge, on account of which they are superior to others, how can these things fail to be regarded as worthy of contempt and truly ridiculous? They do not believe that God, being powerful and rich in all resources, created matter itself, inasmuch as they know not how much a spiritual and divine essence can accomplish but they do believe that their mother, whom they style a female from a female, produced from her passions aforesaid the so vast material substance of creation. They inquire, too, whence the substance of creation was supplied to the Creator, but they do not inquire whence was supplied to their mother, whom they call the enthymesis, an impulse of the eon that went astray, so great an amount of tears, or perspiration, or sadness or that which produced the remainder of matter. For to attribute the substance of created things to the power and will of whom who is God of all is worthy both of credit and acceptance. It is also agreeable to reason, and there may be well said regarding such a belief that the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. While men indeed cannot make anything out of nothing, but only out of matter already existing, Yet God is in this point proeminently superior to men, that he himself called into being the substance of his creation, when previously it had no existence. But the assertion that matter was produced from the enthymesis of a neon going astray, and that the eon referred to was far separated from her enthymesis, and that again her passion and feeling, apart from herself, became matter, is incredible, infatuated impossible and untenable. Chapter 11 The heretics, from their disbelief of the truth, have fallen into an abyss of error. Reasons for investigating their systems. They do not believe that he, who is God above all, formed by his word, in his own territory, as he himself pleased, the various and diversified works of creation which exist, inasmuch as he is the former of all things, like a wise architect and the most powerful monarch. But they believe that angels, or some power separate from God, and who was ignorant of him, formed this universe. By this course, therefore, not yielding credit to the truth, but wallowing in falsehood, they have lost the bread of true life, and have fallen into vacuity, and an abyss of shadow. 
they are like the dog of Aesop, which dropped the bread and made an attempt at ceasing its shadow, thus losing the real food. It is easy to prove from the very words of the Lord that he acknowledges one father and creator of the world and fashioner of man, who was proclaimed by the law and the prophets, while he knows no other, and that this one is really God over all, and that he teaches that that adoption of sons pertaining to the father, which is eternal life, takes place through himself, conferring it, as he does, on all the righteous. But since these men delight in attacking us, and in their true character of cavillers, assail us with points which really tell not at all against us, bringing forward in opposition to us a multitude of parables and captious questions, I have thought it well, on the other side, first of all to put to them the following inquiries concerning their own doctrines, to exhibit their improbability, and to put an end to their audacity. After this has been done, I intend to bring forward the discourses of the Lord, so that they may not only be rendered destitute of the means of attacking us, but that, since they will be unable reasonably to reply to those questions which are put, they may see that their plan of argument is destroyed, so that, either returning to the truth, and humbling themselves, and ceasing from their multifarious fantasies, they may propitiate God for those blasphemies they have uttered against Him, and obtain salvation, or that, if they still persevere in that system of vainglory which has taken possession of their minds, they may at least find it necessary to change their kind of argument against us. Chapter 12 The Triacontad of the Heretics errs both by defect and excess. Sophia could never have produced anything apart from her consort. Logos and Sigi could not have been contemporaries. We may remark, in the first place, regarding their triacontad, that the whole of it marvellously falls to ruin on both sides, that is, both as respects defect and excess. They say that to indicate it the Lord came to be baptized at the age of thirty years, but this assertion really amounts to a manifest subversion of their entire argument. As to defect, this happens as follows. First of all, because they reckon the propator among the other eons. For the father of all ought not to be counted with other productions, he who was not produced with that which was produced, he who was unbegotten with that which was born, he whom no one comprehends with that which is comprehended by him, and who is on this account himself incomprehensible, and he who is without figure with that which has a definite shape. For inasmuch as he is superior to the rest, he ought not to be numbered with them, and that, so that he who is impassable and not in error, should be reckoned with an eon subject to passion, and actually in error. For I have shown in the book which immediately precedes this, that beginning with Bythus, they reckon up the triacontad to Sophia, whom they describe as the erring eon, and I have also there set forth the names of their eons, but if he be not reckoned, there are no longer, on their own showing, thirty productions of eons, but these then become only twenty-nine. Next, with respect to the first production, Anoya, whom they also term Sigi, from whom again they describe Nus and Aletheia as having been sent forth, they err in both particulars. For it is impossible that the thought, Anoya, of any one, or his silence, Sigi, should be understood apart from himself, and that being sent forth beyond him, it should possess a special figure of its own. But if they assert that the Anoya was not sent forth beyond him, but continued one with the Propator, why then do they reckon her with the other eons, with those who were not one with the Father, and are on this account ignorant of his greatness? If, however, she was so united, let us take this also into consideration. There is then an absolute necessity that from this united and inseparable conjunction, which constitutes but one being, there should proceed an unseparated and united production, so that it should not be dissimilar to him who sent it forth. But if this be so, then just as Bythus and Sigi, so also Nus and Aletheia will form one and the same being, 
ever cleaving mutually together, and inasmuch as the one cannot be conceived of without the other, just as water cannot be conceived of without the thought of moisture, or fire without the thought of heat, or a stone without the thought of hardness, for these things are mutually bound together, and the one cannot be separated from the other, but always coexists with it, so it behoves Pythus to be united in the same way with Anoia, and Nous with Aletheia, Logos and Zoe again, as being set forth by those that are thus united, ought themselves to be united, and to constitute only one being. But according to such a process of reasoning, Homo and Ecclesia too, and indeed all the remaining conjunctions of the eons produced, ought to be united, and always to coexist, the one with the other. For there is a necessity in their opinion that a female eon should exist side by side with the male one, inasmuch as she is, so to speak, the fourth putting of his affection. These things being so, and such opinions being proclaimed by them, they again venture, without a blush, to teach that the younger eon of the duodecad, whom they also style Sophia, did, apart from union with her consort, whom they call Thaletus, endure passion, and separately, without any assistance from him, gave birth to a production which they name a female from a female. They thus rush into such utter frenzy as to form two most clearly opposite opinions respecting the same point. For if Bythus is ever one with Sigi, Nous with Aletheia, Logos with Zoe, and so on, as respects the rest, how could Sophia, without union with her consort, either suffer or generate anything? And if again she did really suffer passion apart from him, it necessarily follows that the other conjunctions also admit of disjunction and separation among themselves, a thing which I have already shown to be impossible. It is also impossible, therefore, that Sophia suffered passion apart from Thaletus, and thus again their whole system of argument is overthrown. For they have yet again derived the whole of remaining material substance, like the composition of a tragedy, from that passion which they affirm she experienced apart from union with her consort. If, however, they impudently maintain, in order to preserve from ruin their vain imaginations, that the rest of the conjunctions also were disjoined and separated from one another on account of this latest conjunction, then I reply that in the first place they rest upon a thing which is impossible. For how can they separate the propator from his Anoia, or Nous from Aletheia, or Logos from Zoe, and so on with the rest? And how can they themselves maintain that they tend again to unity, and are in fact all at one, if indeed these very conjunctions, which are within the pleroma, do not preserve unity, but are separate from one another, and that to such a degree, that they both endure passion, and perform the work of generation without union, one with another, just as hens do, apart from intercourse with cocks. Then again, their first and first begotten obdoad will be overthrown as follows. They must admit that Bythus and Sigi, Nous and Aletheia, Logos and Zoe, Anthropos and Ecclesia, do individually dwell in the same pleroma. But it is impossible that Sigi, silence, can exist in the presence of Logos, speech, or again that Logos can manifest himself in the presence of Sigi, for these are mutually destructive of each other, even as light and darkness can by no possibility exist in the same place. For if light prevails, there cannot be darkness, and if darkness, there cannot be light, since where light appears, darkness is put to flight. In like manner, where Sigi is, there cannot be Logos, and where Logos is, there cannot be Sigi. But if they say that Logos simply exists within, unexpressed, Sigi also will exist within and will not the less be destroyed by the Logos within, but that he really is not merely conceived of in the mind, the very order of the production of their eons shows. Let them not then declare that the first and principal Ogdoad 
consists of Logos and Sigi, but let them, as a matter of necessity, exclude either Sigi or Logos, and then their first and principal Ogdoad is at an end. For if they describe the conjunctions of the eons as united, then their whole argument fails to pieces. Since, if they were united, how could Sophia have generated a defect without union with her consort? If, on the other hand, they maintain that, as in production, each of the eons possesses his own peculiar substance, then how can Sigi and Logos manifest themselves in the same place? So far, then, with respect to defect. But again, their triacontad is overthrown as to excess by the following considerations. They represent Horos, whom they call by a variety of names, which I have mentioned in the preceding book, as having been produced by monogenes, just like the other eons. Some of them maintain that this Horos was produced by monogenes, while others affirm that he was sent forth by the propator himself in his own image. They affirm further that a production was formed by monogenes Christ and the Holy Spirit, and they do not reckon these in the number of the Plerima, nor the Saviour either, whom they also declare to be Totem, all things. Now it is evident, even to a blind man, that not merely thirty productions, as they maintain, were sent forth, but four more along with these thirty, for they reckon the propator himself in the Plerima, and those two who in succession were produced by one another. Why is it, then, that those other beings are not reckoned as existing with these in the same Plerima, since they were produced in the same manner? For what just reason can they assign for not reckoning along with the other eons, either Christ, whom they describe as having, according to the Father's will, been produced by monogenes, or the Holy Spirit, or Horos, whom they also call Soter, Saviour, and not even the Saviour himself, who came to impart assistance and form to their mother. Whether is this as if these latter were weaker than the former, and therefore unworthy of the name of eons, or of being numbered among them, as if they were superior and more excellent? But how could they be weaker, since they were produced for the establishment and rectification of the others? And then again, they cannot possibly be superior to the first and principal tetrad, by which they were also produced, for it too is reckoned in the number above mentioned. These latter beings, then, ought also to have been numbered in the plerima of the eons, or that should be deprived of the honour of those eons which bear this appellation, the tetrad. Since, therefore, their triacontad is thus brought to naught, as I have shown, both with respect to defect and excess, for in dealing with such a number, either excess or defect, to any extent, will render the number untenable, and how much more so great variations, it follows that what they maintain respecting their ogdoad and duodicad is a mere fable which cannot stand. Their whole system, moreover, falls to the ground, when their very foundation is destroyed and dissolved into bythus, that is, into what has no existence. Let them then, henceforth, seek to set forth some other reasons why the Lord came to be baptized at the age of thirty years, and explain in some other way the duodicad of the apostles, and the fact stated regarding her who suffered from an issue of blood, and all the other points respecting which they so madly labor in vain. End of Book 2, Chapters 9 through 12。Chapter 13 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2 。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 13. 
The first order of production maintained by the heretics is altogether indefensible. 1. I now proceed to show as follows, that the first order of production, as conceived of by them, must be rejected. For they maintain that Naus and Aletheia were produced from Bithus and his Enoia, which is proved to be a contradiction. For Naus is that which is itself chief and highest, and, as it were, the principle and source of all understanding. Enoia, again, which arises from him, is any sort of emotion produced by any subject. It cannot be, therefore, that Nos was produced by Bithus and Enoia. It would be more like the truth for them to maintain that Enoia was produced as the daughter of the Propator, and this Nos. For Enoia is not the daughter of Nos, as they assert, but Naus becomes the father of Enoia. For how can Naus have been produced by the Propator when he holds the chief and primary place of that hidden and invisible affection which is within him? By this affection, sense is produced, and Enoia and Enthemesis and other things which are simply synonyms for Naus himself. As I have said already, they are merely certain definite exercises and thought of that very power concerning some particular subject. We understand the several terms according to their length and breadth of meaning, not according to any fundamental change of signification, and the various exercises of thought are limited by the same sphere of knowledge, and are expressed together by the same term the very same sense remaining within, and creating, and administering, and freely governing even by its own power, and as it pleases the things which have been previously mentioned. 2. For the first exercise of that power respecting anything is styled an oia, but when it continues and gathers strength and takes possession of the whole soul, it is called enthemesis. This enthemesis again, when it exercises itself a long time on the same point, and has, as it were, been proved, is named sensation. And this sensation, when it is much developed, becomes counsel. The increase, again, and greatly developed exercise of this counsel becomes the examination of thought judgment, and this, remaining in the mind, is most properly termed logos, reason, from which the spoken logos, word, proceeds. But all the exercises of thought which have been mentioned are fundamentally one and the same, receiving their origin from naus and obtaining different appellation according to their increase. Just as the human body, which is at one time young, then in the prime of life, and then old, has received different appellations according to its increase and continuance, but not according to any change of substance, or on account of any real loss of body, so it is with those mental exercises. For when one mentally contemplates anything, he also thinks of it, and when he thinks of it, he has also knowledge regarding it, and when he knows it, he also considers it, and when he considers it, he also mentally handles it, and when he mentally handles it, he also speaks of it. But as I have already said, it is Naus who governs all these mental processes, while he is himself invisible, and utters speech of himself by means of those processes which have been mentioned as it were by rays proceeding from him, but he himself is not sent forth by any other. 3. These things may properly be said to hold good in men, since they are compound by nature, and consist of a body and a soul. 
But those who affirm that Enoia was sent forth from God, and Naus from Enoia, and then in succession Lagos from Lees, are in the first place to be blamed as having improperly used these productions, and in the next place as describing the affections and passions and mental tendencies of men, while they thus prove themselves ignorant of God. By their manner of speaking they ascribe those things which apply to men to the Father of all, whom they also declare to be unknown to all, and they deny that he himself made the world to guard against attributing want of power to him, while at the same time they endow him with human affections and passions. But if they had known the scriptures, and been taught by the truth, they would have known, beyond doubt, that God is not as men are, and that his thoughts are not like the thoughts of men. For the Father of all is at a vast distance from those affections and passions which operate among men. He is a simple, uncompounded being, without diverse members, and altogether like and equal to himself, since he is holy understanding, and holy spirit, and holy thought, and holy intelligence, and holy reason, and holy hearing, and holy seeing, and holy light, and the whole source of all that is good, even as the religious and pious are wont to speak concerning God. 4. He is, however, above all these properties, and therefore indescribable. For he may well and properly be called an understanding which comprehends all things, but he is not of that account like the understanding of men, and he may most properly be termed light, but he is nothing like that light with which we are acquainted. And so, in all other particulars, the Father of all is in no degree similar to human weakness. He is spoken of in those terms according to the love we bear him. But, in point of greatness, our thoughts regarding him transcend these expressions. If then, even in the case of human beings, understanding itself does not arise from emission, nor is that intelligence which produces other things separated from the living man, while its motions and affections come into manifestation. Much more will the mind of God, who is all understanding, never by any means be separated from himself, nor can anything in this case be produced as if by a different being. 5. For if he produced intelligence... Then he who did thus produce intelligence must be understood in accordance with their views as a compound and corporeal being, so that God, who sent forth the intelligence referred to, is separate from it, and the intelligence which was sent forth separate from him. But if they affirm that intelligence was sent forth from intelligence, they then cut asunder the intelligence of God, and divide it into parts. And whither has it gone? Whence was it sent forth? For whatever is sent forth from any place passes of necessity into some other. But what existence was there more ancient than the intelligence of God, into which they maintain it was sent forth? And what a vast region that must have been, which was capable of receiving and containing the intelligence of God. If, however, they affirm that this emission took place just as a ray proceeds from the sun, then as the subjacent air which receives the ray must have had an existence prior to it, so, by such reasoning, they will indicate that there was something in existence into which the intelligence of God was sent forth. 
capable of containing it, and more ancient than itself. Following upon this, we must hold that, as we see the sun, which is less than all things, sending forth rays from himself to a great distance, so likewise we say that the propator sent forth a ray beyond, and to a great distance from himself. But what can be conceived of beyond, or at a distance from, God, into which he sent forth this ray? 6. If again they affirm that that intelligence was not sent forth beyond the Father, but within the Father himself, then in the first place it becomes superfluous to say, that it was sent forth at all. For how could it have been sent forth if it continued within the Father? For an emission is the manifestation of that which is emitted, beyond him who emits it. In the next place, this intelligence being sent forth, both that Logos who springs from him will still be within the Father as will also be the future emissions proceeding from Logos. These, then, cannot in such a case be ignorant of the Father, since they are within Him, nor, being all equally surrounded by the Father, can any one know Him less than another, according to the descending order of their emissions and all of them must also in an equal measure continue impassable, since they exist in the bosom of their father, and none of them can ever sink into a state of degeneracy or degradation. For with the father there is no degeneracy, unless perchance, as in a great circle a smaller is contained, and within this one again a smaller, or unless they affirm of the Father, that after the manner of a sphere or a square, he contains within himself on all sides the likeness of a sphere, or the production of the rest of the eons in the form of a square, each one of these being surrounded by that one who is above him in greatness, and surrounding in turn that one who is after him in smallness, and that on this account the smallest and the last of all, having its place in the center, and thus being far separated from the Father, was really ignorant of the propator. But if they maintain any such hypothesis, they must shut up their bithus within a definite form and space, while he both surrounds others and is surrounded by them. For they must of necessity acknowledge that there is something outside of him which surrounds him, and none the less will the talk concerning those that contain and those that are contained flow on into infinitude, and all the eons will most clearly appear to be bodies enclosed by one another. 7. Further, they must also confess either that he is mere vacuity, or that the entire universe is within him, and in that case all will in like degree partake of the Father. Just as if one forms circles in water, or round or square figures, all these will equally partake of water, just as those, again, which are framed in the air, must necessarily partake of air, and those which are formed in light, of light. So must those also who are within him all equally partake of the Father, ignorance having no place among them. Where then is this partaking of the Father who fills all things? If indeed he has filled all things, there will be no ignorance among them. On this ground then, their work of supposed degeneracy is brought to nothing, 
and the production of matter with the formation of the rest of the world, which things they maintain to have derived their substance from passion and ignorance. If, on the other hand, they acknowledge that he is vacuity, then they fall into the greatest blasphemy. They deny his spiritual nature. For how can he be a spiritual being who cannot fill even those things which are within him? 8. Now these remarks which have been made concerning the emission of intelligence are in like manner applicable in opposition to those who belong to the school of Basilides as well as in opposition to the rest of the Gnostics, from whom these also, the Valentinians, have adopted the ideas about emissions, and were refuted in the first book. But I have now plainly shown that the first production of Nous, that is, of the intelligence they speak of, is an untenable and impossible opinion. And let us see how the matter stands with respect to the rest of the eons. For they maintain that Logos and Zoe were sent forth by him, i.e. Nous, as fashioners of this Pleroma, while they conceive of an emission of Logos, that is, the word, after the analogy of human feelings, and rationally form conjectures respecting God as if they had discovered something wonderful in their assertion that Logos was produced by Nous. All indeed have a clear perception that this may be logically affirmed with respect to men. But in him who is God over all, since he is all Nous and all Logos, as I have said before, and has in himself nothing more ancient or late than another, and nothing at variance with another, but continues altogether equal and similar and homogeneous, there is no longer ground for conceiving of such production in the order which has been mentioned. Just as he does not err who declares that God is all vision and all hearing, for in what manner he sees, in that also he hears, and in what manner he hears, in that also he sees. So also he who affirms that he is all intelligence and all word, and that in whatever respect he is intelligence, in that also he is word, and that this nous is his logos will still indeed have only an inadequate conception of the Father of all, but will entertain far more becoming thoughts regarding him than do those who transfer the generation of the word to which men give utterance to the eternal word of God, assigning a beginning and course of production to him, even as they do to their own word. And in what respect will the word of God, yea, rather God himself, since he is the word, differ from the word of men, if he follows the same order and process of generation? 9. They have fallen into error, too, respecting Zoe, by maintaining that she was produced in the sixth place, when it behooved her to take precedence of all the rest, since God is life and incorruption and truth. And these and such like attributes have not been produced according to a gradual scale of descent, but they are names of those perfections which always exist in God, so far as it is possible and proper for men to hear and speak of God. For with the name of God, the following words will harmonize. Intelligence, 
word, life, incorruption, truth, wisdom, goodness, and such like. And neither can any one maintain that intelligence is more ancient than life, for intelligence itself is life, nor that life is later than intelligence, so that he who is the intellect of all, that is, God, should at one time have been destitute of life. But if they affirm that life was indeed previously in the Father, but was produced in the sixth place in order that the Word might live, surely it ought long before, according to such reasoning, to have been sent forth in the fourth place, that Nos might have life, and still further, even before him it should have been, with Bithus, that their Bithus might live. For to reckon Sage, indeed, along with their Propator, and to assign her to him as his consort, while they do not join Zoe to the number, is not this to surpass all other madness? 10. Again, as to the second production, which proceeds from these eons, who have been mentioned, that, namely, of Homo and Ecclesia, their very fathers, falsely styled Gnostics, strive among themselves, each one seeking to make good his own opinions, and thus convicting themselves of being wicked thieves. They maintain that it is more suitable to the theory of production as being, in fact, truth-like, that the word was produced by man, and not man by the word, and that man existed prior to the word, and that this is really he who is God over all. And thus it is, as I have previously remarked, that heaping together with a kind of plausibility all human feelings and mental exercises and formation of intentions and utterances of words, they have lied with no plausibility at all against God. For while they ascribe the things which happen to men, and whatsoever they recognize themselves as experiencing, to the divine reason, they seem to those who are ignorant of God to make statements suitable enough. And by these human passions, drawing away their intelligence, while they describe the origin and production of the word of God in the fifth place, they assert that thus they teach wonderful mysteries, unspeakable and sublime, known to no one but themselves. It was, they affirm, concerning these, that the Lord said, Seek, and ye shall find. That is, that they should inquire how Naus and Eletia proceeded from Bithus and Sage, whether Logos and Zoe again derive their origin from these, and then whether Anthropos and Ecclesia proceed from Logos and Zoe. End of Book 2, Chapter 13 Recording by Bill Mosley, Frellsburg, Texas Chapters 14 through 15 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 14. Valentinus and his followers derived the principles of their system from the heathen. The names only are changed. 1. Much liker the truth, and more pleasing, is the account which Antiphanes, one of the ancient comic poets, gives in his Theogony as to the origin of all things. For he speaks of chaos as being produced from night and silence, relates that then love sprang from chaos and night, from this again light, and that from this, in his opinion, 
were derived all the rest of the first generation of the gods. After these, he next introduces a second generation of gods, and the creation of the world. Then he narrates the formation of mankind by the second order of the gods. These men, that is, the heretics, adopting this fable as their own, have ranged their opinions around it, as if by a sort of natural process, changing only the names of the things referred to, and setting forth the very same beginning of the generation of all things and their production. In place of night and silence, they substitute bythos and sigi. Instead of chaos, they put naus. And for love, by whom, says the comic poet, all other things were set in order, they have brought forward the word, while for the primary and greatest gods they have formed the ions. And in place of the secondary gods, they tell us of that creation by their mother which is outside of the pleroma, calling it the second Ogdoad. They proclaim to us, like the writer referred to, that from this Ogdoad came the creation of the world and the formation of man, maintaining that they alone are acquainted with these ineffable and unknown mysteries. Those things which are everywhere acted in the theatres by comedians with the clearest voices, they transfer to their own system, teaching them undoubtedly through means of the same arguments, and merely changing the names. 2. And not only are they convicted of bringing forward, as if their own original ideas, those things which are to be found among the comic poets, but they also bring together the things which have been said by all those who were ignorant of God, and who are termed philosophers, and sewing together, as it were, a motley garment out of a heap of miserable rags, they have, by their subtle manner of expression, furnished themselves with a cloak which is really not their own. They do, it is true, introduce a new kind of doctrine, inasmuch as by a new sort of art it has been substituted for the old. Yet it is in reality both old and useless, since these very opinions have been sewed together out of ancient dogmas redolent of ignorance and irreligion. For instance, Thales of Miletus affirmed that water was the generative and initial principle of all things. Now, it is just the same thing whether we say water or bythus. The poet Homer, again, held the opinion that Oceanus, along with mother Thetis, was the origin of the gods. This idea these men have transferred to bythus and sigi. Anaximander laid it down that infinitude is the first principle of all things, having seminally in itself the generation of them all, and from this he declares the immense worlds which exist were formed. This too they have dressed up anew, and referred to bythus and their ions. Anaxagoras, again, who has also been surnamed atheist, gave it as his opinion that animals were formed from seeds falling down from heaven upon earth. This thought, too, these men have transferred to the seed of their mother, which they maintain to be themselves, thus acknowledging at once, in the judgment of such as are possessed of sense, that they themselves are the offspring of the irreligious Anaxagoras. 3. Again, adopting the ideas of shade and vacuity from Democritus and Epicurus, they have fitted these to their own views, following upon those teachers who had already talked a great deal about a vacuum and atoms, the one of which they called that which is, and the other that which is not. In like manner, these men call those things which are within the pleroma real existences, just as those philosophers did the atoms, while they maintain that those which are without the pleroma have no true existence, even as those did respecting the vacuum. They have thus banished themselves in this world, since they are here outside of the pleroma, 
into a place which has no existence. Again, when they maintain that these things below are images of those which have a true existence above, they again most manifestly rehearse the doctrine of Democritus and Plato. For Democritus was the first who maintained that numerous and diverse figures were stamped, as it were, from the forms of things above, and descended from universal space into this world. But Plato, for his part, speaks of matter and exemplar and God. These men, following those distinctions, have styled what he calls ideas, and exemplar, the images of those things which are above, while, through a mere change of name, they boast themselves as being discoverers and contrivers of this kind of imaginary fiction. 4. This opinion, too, that they hold the Creator formed the world out of previously existing matter, both Anaxagoras, Empedocles, and Plato expressed before them, as forsooth we learn they also do under the inspiration of their mother. Then again, as to the opinion that everything of necessity passes away to those things out of which they maintain it was also formed, and that God is the slave of this necessity, so that he cannot impart immortality to what is mortal, or bestow incorruption on what is corruptible, but every one passes into a substance similar in nature to itself, both those who are named Stoics from the portico, and indeed all that are ignorant of God, poets and historians alike, make the same affirmation. Those heretics who hold the same system of infidelity have ascribed, no doubt, their own proper region to spiritual beings that, namely, which is within the Pleroma, but to animal beings the intermediate space, while to corporeal they assign that which is material. And they assert that God himself can do no otherwise, but that every one of the different kinds of substance mentioned passes away to those things which are of the same nature with itself. 5. Moreover, as to their saying that the Saviour was formed out of all the ions, by every one of them depositing, so to speak, in him his own special flower, they bring forward nothing new that may not be found in the Pandora of Hesoid. For what he says respecting her, these men insinuate concerning the Saviour, bringing him before us as Pandorus, as if each of the ions had bestowed on him what he possessed in the greatest perfection. Again, their opinion as to the indifference of eating of meats and other actions, and as to their thinking that, from the nobility of their nature, they can in no degree at all contract pollution, whatever they either eat or perform, they have derived it from the cynics, since they do in fact belong to the same society as do these philosophers. They also strive to transfer to the treatment of matters of faith that hair-splitting and subtle mode of handling questions which is, in fact, a copying of Aristotle. 6. Again, as to the desire they exhibit to refer this whole universe to numbers, they have learned it from the Pythagoreans. For these were the first who set forth numbers as the initial principle of all things and described that initial principle of theirs as being both equal and unequal, out of which two properties they conceived that both things sensible and immaterial derived their origin. And they held that one set of first principles gave rise to the matter of things, and another of their form. They affirm that from these first principles all things have been made, just as a statue is, of its metal and its special form. Now, the heretics have adopted this to the things which are outside of the Pleroma. The Pythagoreans maintained that the principle of intellect is proportionate to the energy wherewith mind, as a recipient of the comprehensible, pursues its inquiries until, worn out, it is resolved at length in the indivisible and one. 
They further affirm that hen, that is, one, is the first principle of all things, and the substance of all that has been formed. From this again proceed the dyad, the tetrad, the pentad, and the manifold generation of the others. These things the heretics repeat, word for word, with a reference to their pleroma and bythus. From the same source, too, they strive to bring into vogue those conjunctions which proceed from unity. Marcus boasts of such views as if they were his own, and as if he were seen to have discovered something more novel than others, while he simply sets forth the tetrad of Pythagoras as the originating principle and mother of all things. 7. But I will merely say, in opposition to these men, did all those who have been mentioned, with whom you have been proved to coincide in expression, know or not know the truth? If they knew it, then the descent of the Saviour into this world was superfluous. For why, in that case, did he descend? Was it that he might bring that truth which was already known to the knowledge of those who knew it? If, on the other hand, these men did not know it, then how is it that, while you express yourselves in the same terms as do those who knew not the truth, ye boast that yourselves alone possess that knowledge which is above all things, although they who are ignorant of God likewise possess it? Thus, then, by a complete perversion of language, they style ignorance of the truth knowledge. And Paul well says of them that, they make use of novelties of words of false knowledge. For that knowledge of theirs is truly found to be false. If, however, taking an impudent course with respect to these points, they declare that men indeed did not know the truth, but that their mother, the seed of the father, proclaimed the mysteries of truth through such men, even as also through the prophets, while the demiurge was ignorant of the proceeding, then I answer, in the first place, that the things which were predicted were not of such a nature as to be intelligible to no one. For the men themselves knew what they were saying, as did also their disciples, and those again who succeeded these. And in the next place, if either the mother or her seed knew and proclaimed those things which were of the truth, and the Father is truth, then on their theory the Saviour lied when he said, No one knoweth the Father but the Son. Unless indeed they maintain that their seed or mother is no one. 8. Thus far, then, by means of ascribing to their ions human feelings, and by the fact that they largely coincide in their language with many of those who are ignorant of God, they have been seen plausibly drawing a certain number away from the truth. They led them on by the use of those expressions with which they have been familiar, to that sort of discourse which treats of all things, setting forth the production of the word of God and of Zoe, and of Naus, and bringing into the world, as it were, the successive emanations of the deity. The views, again, which they propound, without either plausibility or parade, are simply lies from beginning to end. Just as those who, in order to lure and capture any kind of animals, place their accustomed food before them, gradually drawing them on by means of the familiar ailment, until at length they seize it. But, when they have taken them captive, they subject them to the bitterest of bondage, and drag them along with violence, whithersoever they please. So also do these men gradually and gently persuading others, by means of their plausible speeches, to accept of the emission which has been mentioned then bring forward things which are not consistent, and forms of the remaining emissions which are not such as might have been expected. They declare, for instance, that ten ions were sent forth by Logos and Zoe, 
while from Anthropos and Ecclesia there proceeded twelve, although they have neither proof, nor testimony, nor probability, nor anything whatever of such a nature to support these assertions. And with equal folly and audacity do they wish it to believe that from Logos and Zoe, being Ions, were sent forth Bythus and Mixis, Agaratos and Henosis, Autophias and Hedone, Asenetos and Syncrasis, Monogenes and Massaria. Moreover, as they affirm, there were sent forth in a similar way, from Anthropos and Ecclesia, being Ions, Paracletus and Pistis, Patricos and Elpis, Metricos and Agape, Ainos and Sinesis, Ecclesiasticus and Massariotis, Thelitos and Sophia. 9. The passions and error of this Sophia, and how she ran the risk of perishing through her investigation of the nature of the Father, as they relate, and what took place outside of the Pleroma, and from what sort of a defect they teach that the Maker of the world was produced, I have set forth in the preceding book, describing in it, with all diligence, the opinions of these heretics. I have also detailed their views respecting Christ, whom they describe as having been produced subsequently to all these, and also regarding Soter, who, according to them, derived his being from those ions who were formed within the Pleroma. But I have of necessity mentioned their names at present, that from these the absurdity of their falsehood may be made manifest, and also the confused nature of the nomenclature they have devised. For they themselves detract from the dignity of their ions by a multitude of names of this sort. They give out names plausible and credible to the heathen, as being similar to those who are called their twelve gods, and even these they will have to be images of their twelve ions. But the images, so called, can produce names of their own, much more seemly and more powerfully through their etymology to indicate divinity than are those of their fancied prototypes. Chapter 15 No Account Can Be Given of These Productions 1. But let us return to the forementioned question as to the production of the ions. And, in the first place, let them tell us the reason of the production of the ions being of such a kind that they do not come in contact with any of those things which belong to creation. For they maintain that those things above were not made on account of creation, but creation on account of them and that the former are not images of the latter, but the latter of the former. As, therefore, they render a reason for the images, by saying that the month has thirty days on account of the thirty ions, and the day twelve hours, and the year twelve months, on account of the twelve ions which are within the Pleroma, with other such nonsense of the same kind, let them now tell us also the reason for that production of the ions, why it was of such a nature. For what reason the first and first begotten Ogdoad was sent forth, and not a pentad, or a triad, or a septenad, or any one of those which are defined by a different number? Moreover, how did it come to pass that from Logos and Zoe were sent forth ten ions, and neither more nor less, while again from Anthropos and Ecclesia proceeded twelve, although these might have been either more or less numerous. 2. And then again, with reference to the entire Pleroma, what reason is there that it should be divided into these three, an Ogdoad, a Decad, and a Duodecad, and not into some other number different from these? Moreover, with respect to the division itself, why has it been made into three parts, and not four, or five, or six, or into some other number among those which have no connection with such numbers as belong to creation? For they describe those ions above as being more ancient than these created things below, 
and it behooves them to possess their principle of being in themselves, one which existed before creation and not after the pattern of creation, all exactly agreeing as to the point. 3. The creation which we give of creation is one harmonious with that regular order of things prevailing in the world, for this scheme of ours is adapted to the things which have actually been made. But it is a matter of necessity that they, being unable to assign any reason belonging to these things themselves, with regard to those beings that existed before creation, and were perfected by themselves, should fall into the greatest perplexity. For, as to the points on which they interrogate us as knowing nothing of creation, they themselves, when questioned in turn respecting the pleroma, either make mention of mere human feelings, or have recourse to that sort of speech which bears only upon that harmony observable in creation, improperly giving us replies concerning things which are secondary, and not concerning those which, as they maintain, are primary. For we do not question them concerning that harmony which belongs to creation, nor concerning human feelings, but because they must acknowledge as to their octiform, deciform, and duodeciform pleroma, that is, the image of which they declare creation to be, that their father formed it of that figure vainly and thoughtlessly, and must ascribe to him deformity if he made anything without a reason. Or again, if they declare that the pleroma was so produced in accordance with the foresight of the father for the sake of creation, as if he had thus symmetrically arranged its very essence, then it follows that the pleroma can no longer be regarded as having been formed on its own account, but for the sake of that creation which was to be its image as possessing its likeness, just as the clay model is not molded for its own sake, but for the sake of the statue in brass, or gold, or silver about to be formed. Then creation will have greater honor than the pleroma, if, for its sake, those things above were produced. End of Book 2, Chapters 14 through 15 Chapters 16 through 17 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 16. The Creator of the World either produced of himself the images of things to be made, or the Pleroma was formed after the image of some previous system, and so on ad infinitum. 1. But if they will not yield assent to any one of these conclusions, since in that case they would be proved by us as incapable of rendering any reason for such a production of their pleroma, they will of necessity be shut up to this, that they confess that, above the pleroma, there was some other system more spiritual and more powerful, after the image of which their pleroma was formed. For if the Demiurge did not of himself construct that figure of creation which exists, but made it after the form of those things which are above, then from whom did there Bithus, who, to be sure, brought it about that the Pleroma should be possessed of a configuration of this kind, receive the figure of those things which existed before himself? For it must needs be, either that the intention of creating dwelt in that God who made the world, so that of his own power, and from himself, he obtained the model of its formation, or, if any departure is made from this being, then there will arise a necessity for constantly asking whence there came to that one who is above him the configuration of those things which have been made, what, too, was the number of the productions, 
and what the substance of the model itself. If, however, it was in the power of Bythus to impart of himself such a configuration to the Pleroma, then why may it not have been in the power of the Demiurge to form of himself such a world as exists? And then, again, if creation be an image of those things above, why should we not affirm that those are, in turn, images of others above them, and those above these again, of others, and thus go on supposing innumerable images of images? 2. This difficulty presented itself to Basilides after he had utterly missed the truth and was conceiving that, by an infinite succession of those beings that were formed from one another, he might escape such perplexity. When he had proclaimed that three hundred and sixty-five heavens were formed through succession and similitude by one another, and that a manifest proof of the existence of these was found in the number of the days of the year, as I stated before, and that above these there was a power which they also style unnameable, and its dispensation, he did not even in this way escape such perplexity. For when asked whence came the image of its configuration to that heaven which is above all, and from which he wishes the rest to be regarded as having been formed by means of succession, he will say, from that dispensation which belongs to the unnameable, he must then say, either that the unspeakable formed it of himself, or he will find it necessary to acknowledge that there is some other power above this being, from whom his unnameable one derived such vast numbers of configurations as do, according to him, exist. 3. How much safer and more accurate a course it is, then, to confess at once that which is true, that this God, the Creator, who formed the world, is the only God, and that there is no other God besides Him, He Himself receiving from Himself the model and figure of those things which have been made, than that after wearying ourselves with such an impious and circuitous description, we should be compelled, at some point or another, to fix the mind on someone, and to confess that from him proceeded the configuration of things created. 4. As to the accusation brought against us by the followers of Valentinus, when they declare that we continue in that hebdomad which is below, as if we could not lift our minds on high, nor understand those things which are above, because we do not accept their monstrous assertions, this very charge do the followers of Basilides bring in turn against them, inasmuch as the Valentinians keep circling about those things which are below, going as far as the first and second Ogdoad, and because they unskillfully imagine that, Immediately after the thirty ions, they have discovered him who is above all things Father, not following out in their thought their investigations to that Pleroma, which is above the three hundred and sixty-five heavens, which is above forty-five Ogdoads. And any one, again, might bring against them the same charge, by imagining four thousand three hundred and eighty heavens, or ions, since the days of the year contain that number of hours. If, again, someone adds also the nights, thus doubling the hours which have been mentioned, imagining that in this way he has discovered a great multitude of ogdoads, and a kind of innumerable company of ions, and thus in opposition to him who is above all things father, conceiving himself more perfect than all others, he will bring the same charge against all, inasmuch as they are not capable of rising to the conception of such a multitude of heavens or ions as he has announced, but are either so deficient as to remain among those things which are below, or to continue in the intermediate space. 
Chapter 17 Inquiry into the production of the Ions Whatever its supposed nature, it is in every respect inconsistent. And, on the hypothesis of the heretics, even Naus and the Father himself would be stained with ignorance. 1. That system, then, which has respect to their pleroma, and especially that part of it which refers to the primary Ogdoad, being thus burdened with so great contradictions and perplexities, let me now go on to examine the remainder of their scheme. In doing so, on account of their madness, I shall be making inquiry respecting things which have no real existence. Yet it is necessary to do this, since the treatment of this subject has been entrusted to me, and since I desire all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, as well as because thou thyself hast asked to receive from me full and complete means for overturning the views of these men. 2. I ask, then, in what manner were the rest of the Ions produced? Was it so as to be united with him who produced them, even as the solar rays are with the sun? Or was it actually and separately, so that each of them possessed an independent existence and his own special form, just as has a man from another man, or one herd of cattle from another? Or was it after the manner of germination as branches from a tree? And were they of the same substance with those who produced them? Or did they derive their substance from some other kind of substance? Also, were they produced at the same time, so as to be contemporaries, or after a certain order, so that some of them were older and others younger? And again, are they uncompounded and uniform, and altogether equal and similar among themselves, as spirit and light are produced? Or are they compounded and different, unlike to each other in their members? 3. If each of them was produced, after the manner of men, actually and according to its own generation, then either those thus generated by the Father will be of the same substance with him, and similar to their author, or, if they appear dissimilar, then it must of necessity be acknowledged that they are formed of some different substance. Now, if the beings generated by the Father be similar to their author, then those who have been produced must remain for ever impassable, even as he who produced them. But if, on the other hand, they are of a different substance, which is capable of passion, and whence came this dissimilar substance to find a place within the incorruptible pleroma? Further, too, according to this principle, each one of them must be understood as being completely separated from every other, even as men are not mixed with nor united the one to the other, but each having a distinct shape of his own and a definite sphere of action, while each one of them, too, is formed of a particular size, qualities characteristic of a body, and not of a spirit. Let them, therefore, no longer speak of the pleroma as being spiritual, or of themselves as spiritual, if indeed their ions sit feasting with the Father, just as if they were men and he himself is of such a configuration as those reveal him to be who were produced by him. 4. If, again, the ions were derived from Logos, Logos from Naus, and Naus from Bithus, just as lights are kindled from a light, as, for example, torches are from a torch, then they may no doubt differ in generation and size from one another. But since they are of the same substance with the author of their production, they must either all remain forever impassable, or their father himself must participate in passion. For the torch, which has been kindled subsequently, cannot be possessed of a different light from that which preceded it. Wherefore also their lights, when blended in one, return to the original identity 
since that one light is then formed which has existed even from the beginning. But we cannot speak with respect to light itself, of some part being more recent in its origin, and another being more ancient. For the whole is but one light. Nor can we so speak even regard to those torches which have received the light, for these are all contemporary as respects their material substance. For the substance of torches is one and the same, but simply as to the time of its being kindled, since one was lighted a little while ago, and another has just now been kindled. 5. The defect, therefore, of that passion which has regard to ignorance, will either attach alike to their whole pleroma, since all its members are of the same substance, and the propator will share in this defect of ignorance, that is, will be ignorant of himself, or, on the other hand, all those lights which are within the pleroma will alike remain for ever impassable. Whence, then, comes the passion of the youngest Ion, if the light of the Father is that from which all other lights have been formed, and which is by nature impassable? And how can one Ion be spoken of as either younger or older among themselves, since there is but one light in the entire Pleroma? And if any one calls them stars, they will all nevertheless appear to participate in the same nature. For, if one star differs from another star in glory, but not in qualities nor substance, nor in the fact of being passable or impassable, so all these, since they are alike derived from the light of the Father, must either be naturally impassable or immutable, or they must all, in common with the light of the Father, be passable, and are capable of the varying phases of corruption. 6. The same conclusion will follow, although they affirm that the production of the ions sprang from Logos, as branches from a tree, since Logos has his generation from their father. For all the ions are formed of the same substance with the father, differing from one another only in size and not in nature, and filling up the greatness of the father even as the fingers complete the hand. If, therefore, he exists in passion and ignorance, so must also those ions who have been generated by him. But, if it is impious to ascribe ignorance and passion to the Father of all, how can they describe an ion produced by him as being passable? And while they ascribe the same impiety to the very wisdom or sophia of God, how can they still call themselves religious men? 7. If again they declare that their ions were sent forth just as rays are from the sun, then, since all are of the same substance and sprung from the same source, all must either be capable of passion along with him who produced them, or all will remain impassable for ever. For they can no longer maintain that, of beings so produced, some are impassable and others passable. If, then, they declare all impassable, they do themselves destroy their own argument. For how could the youngest Ion have suffered passion if all were impassable? If, on the other hand, they declare that all partook of this passion, as indeed some of them venture to maintain, then, inasmuch as it originated with Logos, but flowed on towards to Sophia, they will thus be convicted of tracing back the passion to Logos, who is the nous of this propator, and so acknowledging the nous of the propator and the father himself to have experienced passion. For the father of all is not to be regarded as a kind of compound being, who can be separated from his nous, or mind, as I have already shown. But nous is the father, and the father nous. It necessarily follows, therefore, both that he who springs from him has logos, or rather, that nous himself, since he is logos, 
must be perfect and impassable, and that those productions which proceed from him, seeing that they are of the same substance with himself, should be perfect and impassable, and should ever remain similar to him who produced them. 8. It cannot therefore longer be held, as these men teach, that Logos, as occupying the third place in generation, was ignorant of the Father. Such a thing might indeed perhaps be deemed probable in the case of the generation of human beings, inasmuch as these frequently know nothing of their parents. But it is altogether impossible in the case of the Logos of the Father. For if, existing in the Father, he knows him in whom he exists, that is, is not ignorant of himself, then those productions which issue from him, being his powers or faculties, and always present with him, will not be ignorant of him who emitted them, any more than rays may be supposed to be of the sun. It is impossible, therefore, that the Sophia of God, she who is within the Pleroma, inasmuch as she has been produced in such a manner, should have fallen under the influence of passion, and conceived of ignorance. But it is possible that that Sophia who pertains to the scheme of Valentinus, inasmuch as she is a production of the devil, should fall into every kind of passion, and exhibit the profoundest ignorance. For when they themselves bear testimony concerning their mother, to the effect that she was the offspring of an erring Ion, we need no longer search for a reason why the sons of such a mother should be ever swimming in the depths of ignorance. 9. I am not aware that, besides these productions, which have been mentioned, they are able to speak of any other. Indeed, they have not been known to me, although I have had very frequent discussions with them concerning forms of this kind, as ever setting forth any other peculiar kind of being as produced in the manner under consideration. This only they maintain that each one of these was so produced as to know merely that one who produced him, while he was ignorant of the one who immediately preceded. But they do not in this manner go forward in their account with any kind of demonstration as to the manner in which these were produced, or how such a thing could take place among spiritual beings. For in whatsoever they may choose to go forward, they will feel themselves bound, while, as regards the truth, they depart entirely from right reason, to proceed so far as to maintain that their word, who springs from the nous of the propator, to maintain, I say, that he was produced in a state of degeneracy. For they hold that perfect nous, previously begotten by the perfect bythus, was not capable of rendering that production, which issued from him perfect, but could only bring it forth utterly blind to the knowledge and greatness of the Father. They also maintain that the Saviour exhibited an emblem of this mystery in the case of that man who was blind from his birth, since the Ion was in this manner produced by Monogenes blind, that is, in ignorance, thus falsely ascribing ignorance and blindness to the word of God, who, according to their own theory, holds the second place of production from the propator. Admirable sophists and explorers of the sublimities of the unknown father, and rehearsers of those super-celestial mysteries, which the angels desire to look into, that they may learn that, from the nous of that father who is above all, the word was produced blind, that is, ignorant, of the Father who produced him. 10. But, ye miserable sophists, how could the nous of the Father, or rather the very Father himself, since he is nous, and perfect in all things, have produced his own logos as an imperfect and blind ion, 
when he was able also to produce along with him the knowledge of the Father. As ye affirm that Christ was generated after the rest, and yet declare that he was produced perfect, much more than should Logos, who is anterior to him in age, be produced by the same nous, unquestionably perfect, and not blind? Nor could he again have produced Ions still blinder than himself, until at last your Sophia, always utterly blinded, gave birth to so vast a body of evils. And your father is the cause of all this mischief, for ye declare the magnitude and power of your father to be the causes of ignorance, assimilating him to Bythus, and assigning this as a name to him who is the unnameable father. But if ignorance is an evil, and ye declare all evils to have derived their strength from it, while ye maintain that the greatness and power of the Father is the cause of this ignorance, ye do thus set him forth as the author of all evils. For ye state as the cause of evil this fact, that no one could contemplate his greatness. But if it was really impossible for the Father to make himself known from the beginning of those beings, that were formed by him, he must in that case be held free from blame, inasmuch as he could not remove the ignorance of those who came after him. But if, at a subsequent period, when he so willed it, he could take away that ignorance which had increased with the successive productions as they followed each other, and thus became deeply seated in the ions, much more had he so willed it might he formerly have prevented that ignorance, which as yet was not from coming into existence. 11. Since, therefore, as soon as he so pleased, he did become known not only to the Ions, but also to these men who lived in these latter times, but, as he did not so please to be known from the beginning, he remained unknown, the cause of ignorance, according to you, the will of the Father. For if he foreknew that these things would in future happen in such a manner, why then did he not guard against the ignorance of these beings before it had obtained a place among them, rather than afterwards, as if under the influence of repentance, deal with it through the production of Christ? For the knowledge which through Christ he conveyed to all he might long before have imparted through Logos, who was also the first begotten of Monogenes. Or, if knowing them beforehand, he willed that these things should happen, as they have done, then the works of ignorance must endure for ever and never pass away. For the things which have been made in accordance with the will of your Propator must continue along with the will of him who willed them. Or, if they pass away, the will of him also who decreed that they should have a being will pass away along with them. And why did the Ions find rest and attain perfect knowledge through learning, at last, that the Father is altogether incomprehensible? They might surely have possessed this knowledge before they became involved in passion. For the greatness of the Father did not suffer diminution from the beginning, so that these might know that he was altogether incomprehensible? For if, on account of his infinite greatness, he remained unknown, he ought also, on account of his infinite love, to have preserved those impassable who were produced by him, since nothing hindered, and expediency rather required, that they should have known from the beginning that the Father was altogether incomprehensible. End of Book 2, Chapters 16 through 17. Chapters 18 through 19 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. 
Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombel. Chapter 18 Sophia was never really in ignorance or passion. Her enthymeses could not have been separated from herself, or exhibited special tendencies of its own. 1. How can it be regarded as otherwise than absurd, that they also affirm this Sophia, or wisdom, to have been involved in ignorance and degeneracy and passion? For these things are alien and contrary to wisdom, nor can they ever be qualities belonging to it. For wherever there is a want of foresight and an ignorance of the course of utility, there wisdom does not exist. Let them, therefore, no longer call this suffering Ion Sophia, but let them give up either her name or her sufferings. And let them, moreover, not call their entire pleroma spiritual, if this Ion had a place within it when she was involved in such a tumult of passion. For even a vigorous soul, not to say a spiritual substance, could not pass through any such experience. 2. And again, how could her enthymeses, going forth from her along with the passion, have become a separate existence? For enthymeses, or thought, is understood in connection with some person, and can never have an isolated existence by itself. For a bad enthymesis is destroyed and absorbed by a good one, even as a state of disease is by health. What, then, was the sort of enthymesis which preceded that of passion? It was this, to investigate the nature of the father and to consider his greatness. But what did she afterwards become persuaded of, and so was restored to health? This, these, that the father is incomprehensible, and that he is past finding out. It was not, then, a proper feeling that she wished to know the father, and on this account she became passable, but when she became persuaded that he is unsearchable, she was restored to health. And even Naus himself, who was inquiring into the nature of the father, ceased, according to them, to continue his researches on learning that the father is incomprehensible. 3. How then could the enthymeses separately conceive passions, which themselves also were her affections? For affection is necessarily connected with an individual, it cannot come into being or exist apart by itself. This opinion of theirs, however, is not only untenable, but also opposed to that which was spoken by our Lord. Seek, and ye shall find. For the Lord renders his disciples perfect by their seeking after and finding the Father. But that Christ of theirs, who is above, has rendered them perfect by the fact that he has commanded the Ions not to seek after the Father, persuading them that, though they should labor hard, they would not find him. And they declare that they themselves are perfect, by the fact that they maintain they have found their bythos, while the Ions have been made perfect through means of this, that he is unsearchable who was inquired after by them. 4. Since, therefore, the enthymesis herself could not exist separately apart from the Ion, it is obvious that they bring forward still greater falsehood concerning her passion, when they further proceed to divide and separate it from her, while they declare that it was the substance of the matter, as if God were not light, and as if no word existed who could convict them and overthrow their wickedness. For it is certainly true that whatsoever the Ion thought, that she also suffered, and what she suffered that she also thought. And her enthymesis was, according to them, nothing else than the passion of one thinking how she might comprehend the incomprehensible. And thus enthymesis was the passion, for she was thinking of things impossible. How then? 
could affection and passion be separated and set apart from the enthymeses, so as to become the substance of so vast a material creation, when enthymeses herself was the passion, and the passion enthymeses. Neither, therefore, can enthymeses apart from the ion, nor the affections apart from enthymeses, separately possess substance, and thus once more their system breaks down and is destroyed. 5. But how did it come to pass that the ion was both dissolved into her component parts and became subject to passion? She was undoubtedly of the same substance as the pleroma, but the entire pleroma was of the father. Now any substance, when brought into contact with what is of a similar nature, will not be dissolved into nothing, nor will be in danger of perishing but will rather continue and increase, such as fire in fire, spirit in spirit, and water in water. But those which are of a contrary nature to each other do, when they meet, suffer and are changed and destroyed. And in like manner, if there had been a production of light, it would not suffer passion, or incur any danger in light like itself. But would rather glow with the greater brightness, and increase, as the day does from the increasing brilliance of the sun. For they maintain that Bythos himself was the image of the Father. Whatever animals are alien in habits, and strange to each other, or are mutually opposed in nature, fall into danger on meeting together, and are destroyed. Whereas, on the other hand, those who are accustomed to each other, and of a harmonious disposition, suffer no peril from being together in the same place, but rather secure both safety and life by such a fact. If, therefore, this ion was produced by the pleroma of the same substance as the whole of it, she could never have undergone change, since she was consorting with beings similar to and familiar with herself a spiritual essence among those that were spiritual. For fear, terror, passion, disillusion, and such like may perhaps occur through the struggle of contraries among such beings as we are, who are possessed of bodies. But among spiritual beings, and those that have the light diffused among them, no such calamities can possibly happen. But these men appear to me to have endowed their Ion with the same sort of passion as belongs to that character in the comic poet Menander, who was himself deeply in love, but an object of hatred to his beloved. For those who have invented such opinions have rather had an idea and mental conception of some unhappy lover among men than of a spiritual and divine substance. 6. Moreover, to meditate how to search into the nature of the perfect Father, and to have a desire to exist within Him, and to have a comprehension of His greatness, could not entail the stain of ignorance or passion, and that upon a spiritual ion, but would rather give rise to perfection and impassibility and truth. For they do not say that even they, though they be but men, by meditating on him who was before them, and while now, as it were, comprehending the perfect, and being placed within the knowledge of him, are thus involved in a passion of perplexity, but rather attain to the knowledge and apprehension of truth. For they affirm that the Saviour said, Seek, and ye shall find, to his disciples with this view, that they should seek after him who by means of imagination has been conceived of by them as being above the maker of all, the ineffable bythus, and they desire themselves to be regarded as the perfect, because they have sought and found the perfect one while they are still on earth. Yet they declare that that Ion who was within the pleroma, a holy spiritual being, by seeking after the propator and endeavoring to find a place within his greatness, 
in desiring to have a comprehension of the truth of the Father, fell down into the endurance of passion, and such a passion that, unless she had met with that power who upholds all things, she would have been dissolved into the general substance of the ions, and thus come to an end of her personal existence. 7. Absurd is such presumption, and truly an opinion of men totally destitute of the truth. For, that this ion is superior to themselves, and of greater antiquity, they themselves acknowledge, according to their own system, when they affirm that they are the fruit of the enthymesis of that ion who suffered passion, so that this ion is the father of their mother, that is, their own grandfather. And to them, the latter grandchildren, the search after the father brings, as they maintain, truth and perfection and establishment and deliverance from unstable matter and reconciliation to the father. But on their grandfather, this same search entailed ignorance and passion and terror and perplexity, from which disturbances they also declare that the substance of matter was formed. To say, therefore, that the search after and investigation of the perfect Father, and the desire for communion and union with Him, were things quite beneficial to them, but to an ion, from whom they also derive their origin, these things were the cause of dissolution and destruction. How can such assertions be otherwise viewed than as totally inconsistent, foolish, and irrational? Those, too, who listen to these teachers, truly blind themselves, while they possess blind guides, justly are left to follow along with them into the gulf of ignorance which lies below them. Chapter 19 Absurdities of the heretics as to their own origin, their opinions respecting the demiurge shown to be equally untenable and ridiculous. 1. But what sort of talk also is this concerning their seed, that it was conceived by the mother according to the configuration of those angels who wait upon the Saviour, shapeless, without form, and imperfect, and that it was deposited in the demiurge without his knowledge, in order that, through his instrumentality, it might attain to perfection, and form in that soul which he had, so to speak, filled with seed, this is to affirm, in the first place, that those angels who wait upon their Saviour are imperfect, and without figure or form, if indeed that which was conceived according to their appearance was generated by any such kind of being as has been described. 2. Then, in the next place, as to their saying that the Creator was ignorant of that deposit of seed which took place into him, and again, of that impartation of seed which was made by him to man. Their words are futile and vain, and are in no way susceptible to proof. For how could we have been ignorant of it, if that seed had possessed any substance and peculiar properties? If, on the other hand, it was without substance and without quality, and so was really nothing, then, as a matter of course, he was ignorant of it. For those things which have a certain motion of their own, and quality, either of heat, or swiftness, or sweetness, or which differ from others in brilliance, do not escape the notice even of men, since they mingle in the sphere of human action. Far less can they be hidden from God, the maker of this universe. With reason, however, is it said that, their seed was not known to him, since it is without any quality of general utility, and without the substance requisite for any action, and is, in fact, a pure non-entity. It really seems to me that, with a view to such opinions, the Lord expressed himself thus, For every idle word that men speak, they shall give account on the day of judgment. For all teachers of a like character to these, who fill men's ears with idle talk, shall, when they stand at the throne of judgment, render an account for those things which they have vainly imagined, 
and falsely uttered against the Lord. Proceeding, as they have done, to such a height of audacity, as to declare of themselves that, on account of the substance of their seed, they are acquainted with the spiritual pleroma, because that man who dwells within reveals to them the true father, for the animal nature required to be disciplined by means of the senses. But they hold that the demiurge, while receiving into himself the whole of the seed, through its being deposited in him by the mother, still remained utterly ignorant of all things, and had no understanding of anything connected with the pleroma. 3. And that they are truly spiritual, inasmuch as a certain particle of the Father of the universe has been deposited in their souls, since, according to their assertions, they have souls formed of the same substance as the Demiurge himself, yet that he, although he received from the mother once for all the whole of the divine seed, and possessed it in himself, still remained of an animal nature, and had not the slightest understanding of those things which are above, which things they boast that they themselves understand, while they are still on earth, does not this crown all possible absurdity? For to imagine that the very same seed conveyed knowledge and perfection to the souls of these men, while it only gave rise to ignorance in the God who made them, is an opinion that can be held only by those utterly frantic and totally destitute of common sense. 4. Further, it is also a most absurd and groundless thing for them to say that the seed was, by being thus deposited, reduced to form and increased and so was prepared for the reception of perfect rationality. For there will be in it an admixture of matter, that substance which they hold to have been derived from ignorance and defect. And this will prove itself more apt and useful than was the light of their father, if indeed, when born, according to the contemplation of that light, it was without form or figure, but derived from this matter, form and appearance, and increase and perfection. For if that light which proceeds from the pleroma was the cause to a spiritual being that it possessed neither form nor appearance, nor its own special magnitude, while its descent to this world added all these things to it, and brought it to perfection, then a sojourn here, which they also term darkness, would seem much more efficacious and useful than was the light of their father. But how can it be regarded as other than ridiculous to affirm that their mother ran the risk of being almost extinguished in matter, and was almost on the point of being destroyed by it? Had she not then, with difficulty, stretched herself outwards, and leapt, as it were, out of herself, receiving assistance from the father, but that her seed increased in this same matter, and received a form, and was fit for the reception of perfect rationality. And this, too, while bubbling up among substances dissimilar and unfamiliar to itself, according to their own declaration that the earthly is opposed to the spiritual, and the spiritual to the earthly. How, then, could a little particle, as they say, increase and receive shape, and reach perfection in the midst of substances contrary to and unfamiliar to itself. 5. But further, and in addition to what has been said, the question occurs, did their mother, when she beheld the angels, bring forth the seed all at once, or only one by one in succession? if she brought forth the whole simultaneously and at once, that which was thus produced cannot now be of an infantile character. Its descent, therefore, into those men who now exist, must be superfluous. But if one by one, then she did not form her conception according to the figure of those angels whom she beheld. For contemplating them all together, and once for all, so as to conceive by them, she ought to have brought forth once for all 
the offspring of those from whose forms she had once for all conceived. 6. Why was it, too, that, beholding the angels along with the Saviour, she did indeed conceive their images, but not that of the Saviour, who is far more beautiful than they. Did he not please her, and did she not, on that account, conceive after his likeness? How was it, too, that the Demiurge, whom they call an animal being, having, as they maintain, his own special magnitude and figure, was produced perfect as respects his substance, while that which is spiritual, which also ought to be more effective than that which is animal, was sent forth imperfect, and he required to descend into a soul, that in it he might obtain form, and thus becoming perfect, might be rendered fit for the reception of perfect reason. If, then, he obtains form in mere earthly and animal men, he can no longer be said to be after the likeness of angels whom they call lights but after the likeness of those men who are here below. For he will not possess in that case the likeness and appearance of angels, but of those souls in whom also he receives shape, just as water, when poured into a vessel, takes the form of that vessel. And if on any occasion it happens to congeal in it, it will acquire the form of the vessel in which it has thus been frozen since souls themselves possess the figure of the body in which they dwell, for they themselves have been adapted to the vessel in which they exist, as I have said before. If, then, that seed referred to is here solidified and formed into a definite shape, it will possess the figure of a man, and not the form of the angels. How is it possible, therefore, that that seed should be after images of the angels, seeing it has obtained a form after the likeness of men. Why, again, since it was of a spiritual nature, had it any need of descending into flesh? For what is carnal stands in need of that which is spiritual, if indeed it is to be saved, that in it it may be sanctified and cleared from all impurity and that what is mortal may be swallowed up by immortality. But that which is spiritual has no need whatever of those things which are here below. For it is not we who benefit it, but it that improves us. 7. Still more manifestly is that talk of theirs concerning their seed proved to be false, and that in a way which must be evident to every one by the fact that they declare those souls which have received seed from the mother to be superior to all others. Wherefore also they have been honored by the demiurge, and constituted princes and kings and priests. For if this were true, the high priest Caiaphas and Annas, and the rest of the chief priests, and the doctors of the law and rulers of the people, would have been the first to believe in the Lord, agreeing as they did with respect to that relationship, and even before them should have been Herod the king. But since neither he, nor the chief priests, nor the rulers, nor the eminent of the people turned to him in faith, but on the contrary, those who sat begging by the highway, the deaf and the blind, while he was rejected and despised by others, according to what Paul declares, for ye see your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise men among you, not many noble, not many mighty, but those things of the world which were despised hath God chosen. Such souls, therefore, were not superior to others on account of the seed deposited in them, nor on this account were they honored by the demiurge. 8. As to the point, then, that their system is weak and untenable, as well as utterly chimerical, enough has been said. For it is not needful, to use a common proverb, that one should drink up the whole ocean who wishes to learn that its water is salt. But just as in the case of a statue which is made of clay, 
but colored on the outside that it may be thought of to be gold, while it really is of clay, any one who takes out of it a small particle and thus laying it open reveals the clay will set free those who seek the truth from a false opinion. In the same way have I, by exposing not a small part only, but the several heads of their system which are of the greatest importance, shown to as many as do not wish wittingly to be led astray what is wicked, deceitful, seductive, and pernicious, connected with the school of the Valentinians, and all those other heretics who promulgate wicked opinions respecting the demiurge, that is, the fashioner and former of this universe, and who is in fact the only true God, exhibiting, as I have done, how easily their views are overthrown. 9. For who that has any intelligence, and possesses only a small proportion of truth, can tolerate them, while they affirm that there is another God above their Creator, and that there is another Monogenes, as well as another word of God, whom also they describe as having been produced in a state of degeneracy, and another Christ, whom they assert to have been formed, along with the Holy Spirit, later than the rest of the Ions, and another Saviour, whom they say, did not proceed from the Father of all, but was a kind of joint production of those Ions who were formed in a state of degeneracy, and that he was produced of necessity on account of this very degeneracy. It is thus their opinion that, unless the Ions had been made in a state of ignorance and degeneracy, neither Christ, nor the Holy Spirit, nor Horos, nor the Saviour, nor the angels, nor their mother, nor her seed, nor the rest of the fabric of the world, would have been produced at all. But the universe would have been a desert, and destitute of the many good things which exist in it. They are therefore not only chargeable with impiety against the Creator, declaring Him the fruit of a defect, but also against Christ and the Holy Spirit, affirming that they were produced on account of that defect, and in like manner that the Saviour was produced subsequently to the existence of that defect. And who will tolerate the remainder of their vain talk, which they cunningly endeavour to accommodate to the parables, and have in this way plunged both themselves and those who give credit to them in the profoundest depths of impiety? End of Book 2, Chapters 18-19 through 19. Chapters 20 through 22 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 20. Futility of the arguments adduced to demonstrate the sufferings of the twelfth Ion, from the parables, the treachery of Judas, and the passion of our Saviour. 1. That they improperly and illogically apply both the parables and the actions of the Lord to their falsely devised system, I prove as follows. They endeavor, for instance, to demonstrate that passion which, they say, happened in the case of the twelfth Ion, from this fact, that the passion of the Saviour was brought about by the twelfth Apostle, and happened in the twelfth month. For they hold that he preached only for one year after his baptism. They maintain also that the same thing was clearly set forth in the case of her who suffered from the issue of blood. For the woman suffered during twelve years, and through touching the hem of the Saviour's garment, she was made whole by that power which went forth from the Saviour, and which, they affirm, had a previous existence. For that power who suffered was stretching herself outwards and flowing into immensity, 
so that she was in danger of being dissolved into the general substance of the ions. But then, touching the primary tetrad, which is typified by the hem of the garment, she was arrested and ceased from her passion. 2. Then, again as to their assertion that the passion of the twelfth ion was proved through the conduct of Judas, how is it possible that Judas can be compared with this ion as being an emblem of her? He who was expelled from the number of the twelve and never restored to his place? For that ion, whose type they declared Judas to be, after being separated from her in Thymeses, was restored or recalled to her former position. But Judas was deprived of his office and cast out, while Matthias was ordained in his place, according to what is written, and his bishopric let another take. They ought, therefore, to maintain that the twelfth Ion was cast out of the Pleroma, and that another was produced, or sent forth to fill her place, if, that is to say, she is pointed at in Judas. Moreover, they tell us that it was the Ion herself who suffered, but Judas was the betrayer and not the sufferer, even they themselves acknowledge that it was the suffering Christ and not Judas who came to the endurance of passion. How, then, could Judas, the betrayer of him who had to suffer for our salvation, be the type and image of that Ion who suffered? 3. But in truth, the passion of Christ was neither similar to the passion of the Ion, nor did it take place in similar circumstances. For the Ion underwent a passion of dissolution and destruction, so that she who suffered was in danger also of being destroyed. For the Lord, our Christ, underwent a valid and not a merely accidental passion. Not only was he himself not in danger of being destroyed, but he also established fallen man by his own strength and recalled him to incorruption. The Ion, again, underwent passion while she was seeking after the Father, and was not able to find him. But the Lord suffered that he might bring those who have wandered from the Father back to knowledge and to his fellowship. The search into the greatness of the Father became to her a passion leading to destruction. But the Lord, having suffered and bestowing the knowledge of the Father, conferred on us salvation. Her passion, as they declare, gave origin to a female offspring, weak, infirm, unformed and ineffective. But his passion gave rise to strength and power. For the Lord, through means of suffering, ascending into the lofty place, led captivity captive, gave gifts to men, and conferred on those that believe in him the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and on all the power of the enemy, that is, of the leader of apostasy. Our Lord also by his passion destroyed death, and dispersed error, and put an end to corruption, and destroyed ignorance, while he manifested life, and revealed truth, and bestowed the gift of incorruption. But there I own, when she had suffered, established ignorance, and brought forth a substance without shape, out of which all material works have been produced, death, corruption, error, and such like. 4. Judas, then, the twelfth in order of the disciples, was not a type of the suffering Ion, nor, again, was the passion of the Lord, for these two things have been shown to be in every respect mutually dissimilar and inharmonious. This is the case not only as respects the points which I have already mentioned, but with regard to the very number. For that Judas the traitor is the twelfth in order is agreed upon by all, there being twelve apostles mentioned by name in the gospel. But this Ion is not the twelfth, but the thirteenth, 
for according to the views under consideration, there were not twelve ions only produced by the will of the Father, nor was she sent forth the twelfth in order. They reckon her, on the contrary, as having been produced in the thirteenth place. How, then, can Judas, the twelfth in order, be the type and image of that Ion who occupies the thirteenth place? 5. But if they say that Judas, in perishing, was the image of her in Thymesis, neither in this way will the image bear any analogy to the truth which, by hypothesis, corresponds to it. For the enthymesis, having been separated from the Ion, and itself afterwards receiving a shape from Christ, then being made a partaker of intelligence by the Saviour, and having formed all the things which are outside of the Pleroma, after the image of those which are within the Pleroma, is said at last to have been received by them into the Pleroma, and, according to the principle of conjunction, to have been united to that Saviour, who was formed out of all. But Judas, having been once for all cast away, never returns into the number of the disciples. Otherwise, a different person would not have been chosen to fill his place. Besides, the Lord also declared, regarding him, Woe to any man by whom the Son of Man shall be betrayed! And, It were better for him if he had never been born! and he was called the son of perdition by him. If, however, they say that Judas was a type of the enthymesis, not as separated from the Ion, but of the passion entwined with her, neither in this way can the number twelve be regarded as a fitting type of the number three. For in the one case Judas was cast away, and Matthias was ordained instead of him, but in the other case the Ion is said to have been in danger of dissolution and destruction, and there are also her enthymesis and passion, for they markedly distinguish enthymesis from the passion, and they represent the Ion as being restored, and enthymesis as acquiring form, but the passion, when separated from these, as becoming matter. Since, therefore, there are thus these three, the Ion, her enthymesis, and her passion, Judas and Matthias, being only two, cannot be the types of them. Chapter 21 The Twelve Apostles Were Not a Type of the Ions 1. If, again, they maintain that the Twelve Apostles were a type only of that group of Twelve Ions, which Anthropos, in conjunction with Ecclesia, produced, then let them produce ten other apostles as a type of those ten remaining ions, who, as they declare, were produced by Logos and Zoe. For it is unreasonable to suppose that the junior, and for that reason inferior ions, were set forth by the Saviour through the election of the apostles, while their seniors, and on this account their superiors, were not thus foreshown since the Saviour, if, that is to say, he chose the apostles with the view that by means of them he might show forth the ions who are in the Pleroma, might have chosen other ten apostles also, and likewise other eight before these, that thus he might set forth the original and primary Ogdoad. He could not, in regard to the second Duodecad, show forth any emblem of it, through the number of the apostles being already constituted a type. For he made choice of no such other number of disciples, but after the twelve apostles, our Lord is found to have sent forth seventy others before him. Now seventy cannot possibly be the type either of an Ogdoad, a Decad, or a Triocontad. What is the reason, then, that the inferior Ions are, as I have said, represented by means of the apostles, but the superior, from whom too the former derived their being, are not prefigured at all. But if the twelve apostles were chosen with this object, that the number of the twelve ions might be indicated by means of them, 
then the seventy also ought to have been chosen to be the type of seventy ions, and in that case they must affirm that the ions are no longer thirty, but eighty-two in number. For he who made the choice of the apostles, that they might be a type of those ions existing in the Pleroma, would never have constituted them types of some and not of others. But by means of the apostles, he would have tried to preserve an image and to exhibit a type of those ions that existed in the Pleroma. 2. Moreover, we must not keep silence respecting Paul, but demand from them, after the type of what ion that apostle has been handed down to us, unless, perchance, they affirm that he is a representative of the Saviour, compounded of them all, who derived his being from the collected gifts of the whole, and whom they term all things, as having been formed out of them all. Respecting this being, the poet Hesiod has strikingly expressed himself, styling him Pandora, that is, the gift of all, for this reason, that the best gift in the possession of all was centered in him. In describing these gifts, the following account is given. Hermes implanted words of fraud and deceit in their minds, and thievish habits, for the purpose of leading foolish men astray, that such should believe their falsehoods. For their mother, that is, Leto, secretly stirred them up. Whence also she is called Leto, according to the meaning of the Greek word, because she secretly stirred up men. Without the knowledge of the demiurge, to give forth profound and unspeakable mysteries to itching ears. And not only did their mother bring it about that this mystery should be declared by Hesiod, but very skillfully, also by means of the lyric poet Pindar, when he describes to the Demiurge the case of Pelops, whose flesh was cut in pieces by the father, and then collected and brought together, and compacted anew by all the gods, did she in this way indicate Pandora, and these men, having their consciences seared by her, declaring, as they maintain, the very same things are proved of the same family and spirit as the others. Chapter 22 The thirty ions are not typified by the fact that Christ was baptized in his thirtieth year. He did not suffer in the twelfth month after his baptism, but was more than fifty years old when he died. 1. I have shown that the number thirty fails them in every respect, too few ions, as they represent them, being at one time found within the Pleroma, and then again too many to correspond with that number. There are not, therefore, thirty ions, nor did the Saviour come to be baptized when he was thirty years old for this reason, that he might show forth the thirty silent ions of their system. Otherwise, they must first of all separate and eject the Saviour himself from the Pleroma of all. Moreover, they affirm that he suffered in the twelfth month, so that he continued to preach for one year after his baptism, and they endeavored to establish this point out of the prophet. For it is written, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of retribution. Being totally blind, inasmuch as they affirm they have found out the mysteries of Bithus, yet not understanding that which is called by Isaiah the acceptable year of the Lord, nor the day of retribution. For the prophet neither speaks concerning a day which includes the space of twelve hours, nor of a year, the length of which is twelve months. For even they themselves acknowledge that the prophets have very often expressed themselves in parables and allegories, and are not to be understood according to the mere sound of the words. 2. That then was called the day of retribution, on which the Lord will render to every one according to his works, that is, the judgment. The acceptable year of the Lord, again, is this present time, in which those who believe him are called by him, and become acceptable to God, 
that is, the whole time from his advent onwards to the consummation of all things, during which he acquires to himself as fruits of the scheme of mercy those who are saved. For according to the phraseology of the prophet, the day of retribution follows the acceptable year, and the prophet will be proved guilty of falsehood if the Lord preached only for a year, and if he speaks of it. For where is the day of retribution? For the year has passed, and the day of retribution has not yet come. But he still makes his sun to rise upon the good and upon the evil, and sends rain upon the just and the unjust. And the righteous suffer persecution, are afflicted, and are slain, while sinners are possessed of abundance, and drink with the sound of the harp, and psaltery, but do not regard the works of the Lord. But according to the language used by the prophet, they ought to be combined, and the day of retribution to follow the acceptable year. For the words are, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of retribution. This present time, therefore, in which men are called and saved by the Lord, is properly understood to be denoted by the acceptable year of the Lord, and there follows on this the day of retribution, that is, the judgment. And the time thus referred to is not called a year only, but is also named a day, both by the prophet and by Paul, of whom the apostle, calling to mind the scripture, says in the epistle addressed to the Romans, as it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But here the expression, all the day long, is put for all this time during which we suffer persecution and are killed as sheep. As then, this day does not signify one which consists of twelve hours, but the whole time during which believers in Christ suffer and are put to death for his sake. So also the year there mentioned does not denote one which consists of twelve months, but the whole time of faith during which men hear and believe the preaching of the gospel, and those become acceptable to God who unite themselves to him. 3. But it is greatly to be wondered at how it has come to pass that while affirming that they have found out the mysteries of God, they have not examined the Gospels to ascertain how often after his baptism the Lord went up, at the time of the Passover, to Jerusalem, in accordance with what was the practice of the Jews from every land, and every year, that they should assemble at this period in Jerusalem, and there celebrate the feast of the Passover. First of all, after he had made the water wine at Cana of Galilee, he went up to the festival day of the Passover, on which occasion it is written, For many believed in him when they saw the signs which he did. As John, the disciple of the Lord, records, Then, again, withdrawing himself from Judea, he is found in Samaria, on which occasion, too, he conversed with the Samaritan woman. And while at a distance, cured the son of the centurion by a word, saying, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Afterwards he went up the second time to observe the festival day of the Passover in Jerusalem, on which occasion he cured the paralytic man, who had lain beside the pool thirty-eight years, bidding him rise, take up his couch, and depart. Again, withdrawing from thence to the other side of the Sea of Tiberias, he there, seeing a great crowd had followed him, fed all that multitude with five loaves of bread, and twelve baskets of fragments remained over and above. Then, when he had raised Lazarus from the dead, and plots were formed against him by the Pharisees, he withdrew to a city called Ephraim, and from that place, as it is written, he came to Bethany six days before the Passover, and going up from Bethany to Jerusalem, he there ate the Passover, and suffered on the day following. Now that these three occasions of the Passover are not included within one year, 
every person whatever must acknowledge. And that the special month in which the Passover was celebrated, and in which also the Lord suffered, was not the twelfth, but the first. Those men who boast that they know all things, if they know not this, may learn it from Moses. Their explanation, therefore, both of the year and of the twelfth month, have been proved false, and they ought to reject either their explanation or the gospel. Otherwise, this unanswerable question forces itself upon them. How is it possible that the Lord preached for only one year? 4. Being thirty years old when he came to be baptized, and then possessing the full age of a master, he came to Jerusalem so that he might be properly acknowledged by all as a master. For he did not seem one thing while he was another, as those affirm who describe him as being man only in appearance. But what he was, that he also appeared to be. Being a master, therefore, he also possessed the age of a master, not despising or evading any condition of humanity nor setting aside in himself that law which he had appointed for the human race, but sanctifying every age by that period corresponding to it which belonged to himself. For he came to save all through means of himself, all, I say, who through him are born again to God, infants and children and boys and youths and old men. He therefore passed through every age, becoming an infant for infants, thus sanctifying infants, a child for children, thus sanctifying those who are of this age, being at the same time made to them an example of piety, righteousness, and submission, a youth for youths, becoming an example to youths, and thus sanctifying them for the Lord. So likewise he was an old man for old men, that he might be a perfect master for all, not merely as respects the setting forth of the truth, but also as regards age, sanctifying at the same time the aged also, and becoming an example to them likewise. Then, at last, he came on to death itself, that he might be the first born from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, the Prince of Life, existing before all, and going before all. 5. They, however, that they may establish their false opinion regarding that which is written, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, maintain that he preached for one year only, and then suffered in the twelfth month. In speaking thus, they are forgetful to their own disadvantage destroying his whole work, and robbing him of that age which is both necessary and more honorable than any other, that more advanced age, I mean, during which also as a teacher he excelled all others. For how could he have had disciples if he did not teach? And how could he have taught unless he had reached the age of a master? For when he came to be baptized, he had not yet completed his thirtieth year, but was beginning to be about thirty years of age. For thus Luke, who has mentioned his years, has expressed it, Now Jesus was, as it were, beginning to be thirty years old when he came to receive baptism. And, according to these men, he preached only one year, reckoning from his baptism. On completing his thirtieth year, he suffered, being in fact still a young man, and who had by no means attained to advanced age. Now that the first stage of early life embraces thirty years, and that this extends onwards to the fortieth year, every one will admit. But from the fortieth and fiftieth year, a man begins to decline towards old age, which our Lord possessed while he still fulfilled the office of a teacher, even as the gospel and all the elders testify, those who were conversant in Asia with John, the disciple of the Lord, affirming that John conveyed to them that information. 
and he remained among them up to the times of Trajan. Some of them, moreover, saw not only John, but the other apostles also, and heard the very same account from them, and bear testimony as to the validity of the statement. Whom, then, should we rather believe? Whether men such as these, or Ptolemaeus, who never saw the apostles, and who never even in his dreams attained to the slightest trace of an apostle? 6. But besides this, those very Jews who then disputed with the Lord Jesus Christ have most clearly indicated the same thing. For when the Lord said to them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, they answered him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Now such language is fittingly applied to one who has already passed the age of forty, without having as yet reached his fiftieth year, yet is not far from this latter period. But to one who is only thirty years old, it would unquestionably be said, Thou art not yet forty years old. For those who wished to convict him of falsehood would certainly not extend the number of his years far beyond the age which they saw he had attained. But they mentioned a period near his real age. Whether they had truly ascertained this out of the entry in the public register, or simply made a conjecture from what they observed that he was above forty years old, and that he was certainly not one of only thirty years of age. For it is altogether unreasonable to suppose that they were mistaken by twenty years, when they wished to prove him younger than the times of Abraham. For what they saw, that they also expressed, and he whom they beheld was not a mere phantasm, but an actual being of flesh and blood. He did not then want much of being fifty years old, and in accordance with that fact, they said to him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? He did not, therefore, preach only for one year, nor did he suffer in the twelfth month of the year, for the period included between the thirtieth and the fiftieth year can never be regarded as one year, unless indeed among their ions there be so long years assigned to those who sit in their ranks with Bithus in the Pleroma, of which beings Homer the poet too has spoken, doubtless being inspired by the mother of their system of error. The gods sat round, while Jove presided over, and converse held upon the golden floor. End of Book 2, Chapters 20-22《was no type of the suffering Ion. Moreover, their ignorance comes out in a clear light with respect to the case of that woman who, suffering from an issue of blood, touched the hem of the Lord's garment, and was made whole. For they maintain that through her was shown forth that twelfth power who suffered passion, and flowed out towards immensity, that is, the twelfth Ion, this ignorance of theirs appears first because, as I have shown, according to their own system, that this was not the twelfth Ion. But even granting them this point, in the meantime, there being twelve Ions, eleven of these are said to have continued impassable, while the twelfth suffered passion. But the woman, on the other hand, being healed in the twelfth year, it is manifest 
that she had continued to suffer during eleven years, and was healed in the twelfth. If, indeed, they were to say that eleven ions were involved in passion, but the twelfth one was healed, it would then be a plausible thing to say that the woman was a type of these. But since she suffered during eleven years, and all that time obtained no cure, but was healed in the twelfth year, in what way can she be a type of the twelfth of the Ions, eleven of whom, according to the hypothesis, did not suffer at all, but the twelfth alone participated in suffering? For a type and emblem is, no doubt, sometimes diverse from the truth signified as to matter and substance. But it ought, as to the general form and features, to maintain a likeness to what is typified, and in this way to shadow forth by means of things present those which are yet to come. 2. And not only in the case of this woman have the years of her infirmity, which they affirm to fit in with their figment, been mentioned, but lo, another woman was also healed, after suffering in a like manner for eighteen years, concerning whom our Lord said, and ought not this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound during eighteen years, to be set free on the Sabbath day? If, then, the former was a type of the twelfth Ion that suffered, the latter should also be a type of the eighteenth Ion in suffering. But they cannot maintain this. Otherwise, their primary and original Ogdoad will be included in the number of Ions who suffered together. Moreover, there was also a certain other person healed by the Lord after he had suffered for eight and thirty years. They ought therefore to affirm that the Ion who occupies the thirty-eighth place suffered. For if they assert that the things which were done by the Lord were types of what took place in the Pleroma, the type ought to be preserved throughout. But they can neither adapt to their fictitious system the case of her who was cured after eighteen years, nor of him who was cured after thirty-eight years. Now it is in every way absurd and inconsistent to declare that the Saviour preserved the type in certain cases, while he did not do so in others. The type of the woman, therefore, with the issue of blood, is shown to have no analogy to their system of ions. Chapter 24 Folly of the Arguments Derived by the Heretics from Numbers, Letters, and Syllables 1. This very thing, too, still further demonstrates their opinion false, and their fictitious system untenable, that they endeavor to bring forward proofs of it, sometimes through means of numbers and of syllables of names, sometimes also through the letters of syllables, and yet again through those numbers which are, according to the practice followed by the Greeks, contained in different letters. This, I say, demonstrates in the clearest manner their overthrow or confusion, as well as the untenable and perverse character of their professed knowledge. For, Transferring the name Jesus, which belongs to another language, to the numeration of the Greeks, they sometimes call it Episemon, as having six letters, and at other times the plentitude of the Ogdoads, as containing the number 888. But his corresponding Greek name, which is Soter, that is, Savior, because it does not fit in with their system, either with respect to numerical value, or as regards its letters, they pass over in silence. Yet, surely, if they regard the names of the Lord as in accordance with the preconceived purpose of the Father, by means of their numerical value and letters, indicating number in the Pleroma, so ter, as being a Greek name, ought, by means of its letters and the numbers expressed by these, in virtue of its being Greek, to show forth the mystery of the Pleroma. But the case is not so, because it is a word of five letters, and its numerical value is 1,408. 
but these things do not in any way correspond with their pleroma. The account, therefore, which they give of transactions in the pleroma cannot be true. 2. Moreover, Jesus, which is a word belonging to the proper tongue of the Hebrews, contains, as the learned among them declare, two letters and a half, and signifies that Lord who contains heaven and earth. For Jesus, in the ancient Hebrew tongue, means heaven, while again, earth is expressed by the words sura user. The word, therefore, which contains heaven and earth is just Jesus. Their explanation, then, of the episemon is false, and their numerical calculation is also manifestly overthrown. For, in their own language, soter is a Greek word of five letters, but, on the other hand, in the Hebrew tongue, Jesus contains only two letters and a half. The total, which they reckon up, viz. 888, therefore falls to the ground. And throughout, the Hebrew letters do not correspond in number with the Greek. Although these especially, as being the more ancient and unchanging, ought to uphold the reckoning connected with the names. For these ancient, original, and generally called sacred letters of the Hebrews are ten in number, but they are written by means of fifteen, the last letter being joined to the first. And thus they write some of these letters according to their natural sequence, just as we do, but others in a reverse direction, from the right hand towards the left, thus tracing the letters backwards. The name Christ, too, ought to be capable of being reckoned up in harmony with the ions of their pleroma, inasmuch as, according to their statements, he was produced for the establishment and rectification of their pleroma. The Father, too, in the same way, ought, both by means of letters and numerical value, to contain the number of those ions who were produced by him, bythos in like manner, and not less monogenes, but preeminently the name which is above all others, by which God is called, and which in the Hebrew tongue is expressed by Baruch, a word which also contains two and a half letters. From this fact, therefore, that the more important names, both in the Hebrew and Greek languages, do not conform to their system, either as respects the number of letters or the reckoning brought out of them, the forced character of their calculations respecting the rest becomes clearly manifest. 3. For choosing out of the law whatever things agree with the number adopted in their system, they thus violently strive to obtain proofs of its validity. But if it was really the purpose of their mother, or the Savior, to set forth, by means of the demiurge, types of those things which are in the pleroma, they should have taken care that the types were found in things more exactly correspondent and more holy, and above all, in the case of the Ark of the Covenant, on account of which the whole tabernacle of witness was formed. Now it was constructed thus. Its length was two cubits and a half, its breadth one cubit and a half, its height one cubit and a half. But such a number of cubits in no respect corresponds with their system. Yet by it, the type ought to have been, beyond anything else, clearly set forth. The mercy seat also does in like manner not at all harmonize with their expositions. Moreover, the table of showbread was two cubits in length, while its height was a cubit and a half. These stood before the Holy of Holies, and yet in them not a single number is of such an amount as contains an indication of the tetrad, or the ogdoad, or of the rest of their pleroma. What of the candlestick too, which had seven branches and seven lamps? While if these had been made according to the type, it ought to have had eight branches, and a like number of lamps, after the type of the primary ogdoad, 
which shines preeminently among the ions and illuminates the whole pleroma. They have carefully enumerated the curtains as being ten, declaring these a type of the ten ions, but they have forgotten to count the coverings of skin, which were eleven in number. Nor again have they measured the size of these very curtains, each curtain being eight and twenty cubits in length. And they set forth the length of the pillars as being ten cubits, with a reference to the decad of ions. But the breadth of each pillar was a cubit and a half, and this they do not explain any more than they do the entire number of the pillars, or of their bars, because that does not suit the argument. But what of the anointing oil which sanctified the whole tabernacle? Perhaps it escaped the notice of the Savior, or, while their mother was sleeping, the demiurge of himself gave instructions as to its weight, and on this account it is out of harmony with the pleroma, consisting, as it did, of five hundred shekels of myrrh, five hundred of cassia, two hundred and fifty of cinnamon, two hundred and fifty of calamus, and oil in addition, so that it was composed of five ingredients. The incense also, in like manner, was compounded of stacti, onicha, galbanum, mint, and frankincense, all which do in no respect, either as to their mixture or weight, harmonize with their argument. It is therefore unreasonable and altogether absurd to maintain that the types were not preserved in the sublime and more imposing enactments of the law. But in other points, when any number coincides with their assertions, to affirm that it was a type of the things in the pleroma, while the truth is that every number occurs with the utmost variety in the scriptures, so that, should any one desire it, he might form not only an ogdoad and a decad and a duodecad, but any sort of number from the scriptures, and then maintain that this was a type of the system of error devised by himself. 4. But that this point is true, that that number which is called five, which agrees in no respect with their argument, and does not harmonize with their system, nor is suitable for a typical manifestation of the things in the pleroma, yet has a wide prevalence, will be proved as follows from the scriptures. Soter is a name of five letters. Pater, too, contains five letters. Agape, too, consists of five letters. And our Lord, after blessing the five loaves, fed with them five thousand men. Five virgins were called wise by the Lord, and in like manner five were styled foolish. Again, five men are said to have been with the Lord when he obtained testimony from the Father, namely Peter, and James, and John, and Moses, and Elias. The Lord also, as the fifth person, entered into the apartment of the dead maiden, and raised her up again. For, says the scripture, He suffered no man to go in, save Peter, and James, and the father and mother of the maiden. The rich man in hell declared that he had five brothers, to whom he desired that one rising from the dead should go. The pool from which the Lord commanded the paralytic man to go into his house had five porches. The very form of the cross, too, has five extremities, two in length, two in breadth, and one in the middle, on which, last, the person rests who is fixed by the nails. Each of our hands has five fingers. We have also five senses. Our internal organs may also be reckoned as five, viz. the heart, the liver, the lungs, the spleen, and the kidneys. Moreover, even the whole person may be divided into this number of parts, the head, the breast, the belly, the thighs, and the feet. The human race passes through five ages, first infancy, then boyhood, then youth, then maturity, and then old age. 
Moses delivered the law to the people in five books. Each table which he received from God contained five commandments. The veil covering the Holy of Holies had five pillars. The altar of burnt offering also was five cubits in breadth. Five priests were chosen in the wilderness, namely Aaron, Nadab, Abiud, Eleazar, Ithamar. The ephod and the breastplate and other sacerdotal vestments were formed out of five materials, for they combined in themselves gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And there were five kings of the Amorites, whom Joshua the son of Nun shut up in a cave, and directed the people to trample upon their heads. Any one, in fact, may collect many thousand other things of the same kind, both in respect to this number and any other he chose to fix upon, either from the scriptures or from the works of nature lying under his observation. But although such is the case, we do not therefore affirm that there are five ions above the demiurge, nor do we consecrate the pentad as if it were some divine thing, nor do we strive to establish things which are untenable, nor ravings such as they indulge in, by means of that vain kind of labor, nor do we perversely force a creation well adapted by God, for the ends intended to be served, to change itself into types of things which have no real existence. Nor do we seek to bring forward impious and abominable doctrines, the detection and overthrow of which are easy to all possessed of intelligence. 5. For who can concede to them that the year has three hundred and sixty-five days only, in order that there may be twelve months of thirty days each, after the type of the twelve ions, when the type is in fact altogether out of harmony with the antitype? For in one case... Each of the ions is a thirtieth part of the entire pleroma, while in the other they declare that a month is the twelfth part of a year. If indeed the year were divided into thirty parts and the month into twelve, then a fitting type might be regarded as having been found for their fictitious system. But, on the contrary, as the case really stands, their pleroma is divided into thirty parts and a portion of it into twelve, while again the whole year is divided into twelve parts, and a certain portion of it into thirty. The Saviour, therefore, acted unwisely in constituting the month a type of the entire pleroma, but the year a type only of that duodecad which exists in the pleroma, for it was more fitting to divide the year into thirty parts, even as the whole pleroma is divided, but the month into twelve, just as the ions are in their pleroma. Moreover, they divide the entire pleroma into three portions, namely, into an ogdoad, a decad, and a duodecad. But our year is divided into four parts, namely, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And again, not even do the months, which they maintain to be a type of the triacontad, consist precisely of thirty days, but some have more and some less, inasmuch as five days remain to them as an overplus. The day, too, does not always consist precisely of twelve hours, but rises from nine to fifteen, and then falls again from fifteen to nine. It cannot, therefore, be held that months of thirty days each were so formed for the sake of typifying the ions, for in that case they would have consisted precisely of thirty days. Nor again the days of these months, that by means of twelve hours they might symbolize the twelve ions, for in that case they would always have consisted precisely of twelve hours. 6. But further, as to their calling material substances on the left hand, and maintaining that those things which are thus on the left hand of necessity fall into corruption, 
while they also affirm that the Savior came to the lost sheep in order to transfer it to the right hand, that is, to the ninety and nine sheep which were in safety and perished not, but continued within the fold, yet were of the left hand, it follows that they must acknowledge that the enjoyment of the rest did not imply salvation, and that which has not in like manner the same number they will be compelled to acknowledge as belonging to the left hand, that is, to corruption. This Greek word agape, then, according to the letters of the Greeks, by means of which reckoning is carried on among them, having a numerical value of ninety-three, is in like manner assigned to the place of rest on the left hand. Aletheia, too, having in like manner, according to the principle indicated above, a numerical value of sixty-four, exists among material substances. And thus, in fine, they will be compelled to acknowledge that all those sacred names which do not reach a numerical value of one hundred, but only contain the numbers summed by the left hand, are corruptible and material. End of Book 2, Chapters 23 through 24. Chapters 25 through 27 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Martin. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 25. God is not to be sought after by means of letters, syllables, and numbers. Necessity of humility in such investigations. 1. If any one, however, say in reply to these things, What then? Is it a meaningless and accidental thing that the positions of names, and the election of the apostles, and the working of the Lord, and the arrangement of created things are what they are? We answer them, Certainly not, but with great wisdom and diligence, all things have clearly been made by God, fitted and prepared for their special purposes, and His Word formed both things ancient and those belonging to the latest times, and men ought not to connect those things with the number thirty, but to harmonize them with what actually exists, or with right reason. Nor should they seek to prosecute inquiries respecting God by means of numbers, syllables, and letters. For this is an uncertain mode of proceeding, on account of their varied and diverse systems, and because every sort of hypothesis may at the present day be, in like manner, devised by any one, so that they can derive arguments against the truth from these very theories, inasmuch as they may be turned in many different directions. But on the contrary, they ought to adapt the numbers themselves, and those things which have been formed, to the true theory lying before them. For a system does not spring out of numbers, but numbers from a system, nor does God derive his being from things made but things made from God. For all things originate from one and the same God. 2. But since created things are various and numerous, they are indeed well fitted and adapted to the whole creation, yet when viewed individually, are mutually opposite and inharmonious, just as the sound of the lyre, which consists of many and opposite notes, gives rise to one unbroken melody, through means of the interval which separates each one from the others. The lover of truth, therefore, ought not to be deceived by the interval between each note, nor should he imagine that one was due to one artist and author, and another to another, nor that one person fitted the treble, another the bass, and yet another the tenor strings, but he should hold that one and the same person formed the whole, so as to prove the judgment, goodness, and skill exhibited in the whole work, and specimen of wisdom. Those, too, who listen to the melody ought to praise and extol the artist, to admire the tension of some notes, to attend to the softness of others, to catch the sound of others between both these extremes, and to consider the special character of others, so as to inquire at what each one aims, and what is the cause of their variety, never failing to apply our rule, neither giving up the one artist, nor casting off faith in the one God who formed all things, nor blaspheming our Creator. 3. 
if however any one do not discover the cause of all those things which become objects of investigation let him reflect that man is infinitely inferior to god that he has received grace only in part and is not yet equal or similar to his maker and moreover that he cannot have experience or form a conception of all things like god but in the same proportion as he who has formed but to-day and received the beginning of his creation is inferior to him who is uncreated and who is always the same in that proportion is he as respects knowledge and the faculty of investigating the causes of all things inferior to him who made him for though o man art not an uncreated being nor didst thou always coexist with god as did his own word but now through his pre-eminent goodness receiving the beginning of thy creation thou dost gradually learn from the word the dispensations of god who made thee four preserve therefore the proper order of thy knowledge and do not as being ignorant of things really good seek to rise above god himself for he cannot be surpassed nor do thou seek after any one above the creator for thou wilt not discover such for thy former cannot be contained within limits nor although thou shouldest measure all this universe and pass through all his creation and consider it in all its depth and height and length wouldst thou be able to conceive of any other above the father himself for thou wilt not be able to think him fully out but indulging in trains of reflection opposed to thy nature thou wilt prove thyself foolish and if thou persevere in such a course thou wilt fall into utter madness whilst thou deemest thyself loftier and greater than thy creator and imaginest that thou canst penetrate beyond his dominions chapter twenty six knowledge puffeth up but love edifieth one it is therefore better and more profitable to belong to the simple and unlettered class and by means of love to attain to nearness to god than by imagining ourselves learned and skilful to be found among those who are blasphemous against their own god inasmuch as they conjure up another god as the father and for this reason paul exclaimed knowledge puffeth up but love edifieth not that he meant to inveigh against a true knowledge of god for in that case he would have accused himself but because he knew that some puffed up by the pretence of knowledge fall away from the love of god and imagine that they themselves are perfect for this reason that they set forth an imperfect creator with the view of putting an end to the pride which they feel on account of knowledge of this kind he says knowledge puffeth up but love edifieth now there can be no greater conceit than this than any one should imagine he is better and more perfect than he who made and fashioned him and imparted to him the breath of life and commanded this very thing into existence it is therefore better as i have said that one should have no knowledge whatever of any one reason why a single thing in creation has been made but should believe in god and continue in his love than that puffed up through knowledge of this kind he should fall away from that love which is the life of man and that he should search after no other knowledge except the knowledge of jesus christ the son of god who was crucified for us than that by subtle questions and hair-splitting expressions he should fall into impiety two for how would it be if any one gradually elated by attempts of the kind referred to should because the lord said that even the hairs of your head are all numbered set about inquiring into the number of hairs on each one's head and endeavour to search out the reason on account of which one man has so many and another so many since all have not an equal number but many thousands upon thousands are to be found with still varying numbers on this account that some have larger and others smaller heads some have bushy heads of hair others thin and others scarcely any hair at all and then those who imagine that they have discovered the number of the hairs should endeavour to apply that for the commendation of their own sect which they have conceived or again if any one should because of this expression which occurs in the gospel are not two sparrows sold for a farthing and not one of them forced to the ground without the will of your father take occasion to reckon up the number of sparrows caught daily whether over all the world or in some particular district and to make inquiry as to the reason of so many having been captured yesterday so many the day before and so many again on this day and should then join on the number of sparrow to his particular hypothesis would he not in that case mislead himself altogether and drive into absolute insanity those that agreed with him 
since men are always eager in such matters to be thought to have discovered something more extraordinary than their masters three but if any one should ask us whether every number of all the things which have been made and which are made is known to god and whether every one of these numbers has according to his providence received that special amount which it contains and on our agreeing that such is the case and acknowledging that not one of the things which have been or are or shall be made escapes the knowledge of god but that through his providence every one of them has obtained its nature and rank and number and special quantity and that nothing whatever either has been or is produced in vain or accidentally but with exceeding suitability to the purpose intended and in the exercise of transcendent knowledge and that it was an admirable and truly divine intellect which could both distinguish and bring forth the proper causes of such a system if i say any one on obtaining our adherence and consent to this should proceed to reckon up the sand and pebbles of the earth yea also the waves of the sea and the stars of heaven and should endeavour to think out the causes of the number which he imagines himself to have discovered would not his labour be in vain and would not such a man be justly declared mad and destitute of reason by all possessed of common sense and the more he occupied himself beyond others in questions of this kind and the more he imagines himself to find out beyond others styling them unskilful ignorant and animal beings because they do not enter into his so useless labour the more is he in reality insane foolish struck as it were with a thunderbolt since indeed he does in no one point own himself inferior to god but by the knowledge which he imagines himself to have discovered he changes god himself and exalts his own opinion above the greatness of the creator chapter twenty seven proper mode of interpreting parables and obscure passages of scripture one a sound mind and one which does not expose its possessor to danger and is devoted to piety and the love of truth will eagerly meditate upon those things which god has placed within the power of mankind and has subjected to our knowledge and will make advancement in acquaintance with them rendering the knowledge of them easy to him by means of daily study these things are such as fall plainly under our observation and are clearly and unambiguously in express terms set forth in the sacred scriptures and therefore the parables ought not to be adapted to ambiguous expressions for if this be not done both he who explains them will do so without danger and the parables will receive a like interpretation from all and the body of truth remains entire with a harmonious adaptation of its members and without any collision of its several parts but to apply expressions which are not clear or evident to interpretations of the parables such as every one discovers for himself as inclination leads him is absurd for in this way no one will possess the rule of truth but in accordance with the number of persons who explain the parables will be found the various systems of truth in mutual opposition to each other and setting forth antagonistic doctrines like the questions current among the gentile philosophers two according to this course of procedure therefore man would always be inquiring but never finding because he has rejected the very method of discovery and when the bridegroom comes he who has his lamp untrimmed and not burning with the brightness of a steady light is classed among those who obscure the interpretations of the parables forsaking him who by his plain announcements freely imparts gifts to all who come to him and is excluded from his marriage chamber since therefore the entire scriptures the prophets and the gospels can be clearly unambiguously and harmoniously understood by all although all do not believe them and since they proclaim that one only god to the exclusion of all others formed all things by his word whether visible or invisible heavenly or earthly in the water or under the earth as i have shown from the very words of scripture and since the very system of creation to which we belong testifies by what falls under our notice that one being made and governs it those persons will seem truly foolish who blind their eyes to such a clear demonstration and will not behold the light of the announcement made to them but they put fetters upon themselves and every one of them imagines by means of their obscure interpretations of the parables that he has found out a god of his own for that there is nothing whatever openly expressly and without controversy said in any part of scripture respecting the father 
conceived of by those who hold a contrary opinion, they themselves testify, when they maintain that the Saviour privately taught these same things not to all, but to certain only of his disciples who could comprehend them, and who understood what was intended by him through means of arguments, enigmas, and parables. They come, in fine, to this, that they maintain there is one being who is proclaimed as God, and another as Father, he who is set forth as such through means of parables and enigmas. 3. But since parables admit of many interpretations, what lover of truth will not acknowledge that for them to assert God is to be searched out from these, while they desert what is certain, indubitable and true, is the part of men who eagerly throw themselves into danger, and act as if destitute of reason, and is not such a course of conduct not to build one's house upon a rock which is firm, strong, and placed in an open position, but upon the shifting sand? Hence the overthrow of such a building is a matter of ease. End of Book 2, Chapters 25 through 27 Chapters 28 through 29 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Martin. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 28. Perfect knowledge cannot be attained in the present life. Many questions must be submissively left in the hands of God. Having therefore the truth itself as our rule, and the testimony concerning God set clearly before us, we ought not, by running after numerous and diverse answers to questions, to cast away the firm and true knowledge of God. But it is much more suitable that we, directing our inquiries after this fashion, should exercise ourselves in the investigation of the mystery and administration of the living God, and should increase in the love of him who has done, and still does, so great things for us, but never should fall from the belief by which it is most clearly proclaimed that this being alone is truly God and Father, who both formed this world, fashioned man, and bestowed the faculty of increase on his own creation, and called him upwards from lesser things to those greater ones which are in his own presence, just as he brings an infant which has been conceived in the womb into the light of the sun, and lays up wheat in the farm after he has given it full strength on the stalk. But it is one and the same Creator who both fashioned the womb and created the sun, and one and the same Lord who both reared the stalk of corn, increased and multiplied the wheat, and prepared the barn. If, however, we cannot discover explanations of all those things in Scripture which are made the subject of investigation, yet let us not on that account seek after any other God besides Him who really exists, for this is the very greatest impiety. We should leave things of that nature to God who created us, being most properly assured that the Scriptures are indeed perfect, since they were spoken by the Word of God and His Spirit. But we, inasmuch as we are inferior to, and later in existence than, the word of God and his spirit, are on that very account destitute of the knowledge of his mysteries. And there is no cause for wonder if this is the case with us as respects things spiritual and heavenly, and such as require to be made known to us by revelation, since many even of those things which lie at our very feet, I mean such as belong to this world, which we handle, and see, and are in close contact with, transcend our knowledge, so that even these we must leave to God. For it is fitting that he should excel all in knowledge. For how stands the case, for instance, if we endeavor to explain the cause of the rising of the Nile? We may say a great deal, plausible or otherwise, on the subject, but what is true, sure, and incontrovertible regarding it, belongs only to God. Then again, the dwelling place of birds, of those, I mean, which come to us in spring, but fly away again on the approach of autumn, though it is a matter connected with this world, escapes our knowledge. What explanation, again, can we give of the flow and ebb of the ocean, although everyone admits there must be a certain cause for this phenomena? 
or what can we say as to the nature of those things which lie beyond it? What, moreover, can we say as to the formation of rain, lightning, thunder, gatherings of clouds, vapours, the bursting forth of winds, and such like things? Or tell as to the storehouses of snow, hail, and other like things? What do we know respecting the conditions requisite for the preparation of clouds, or what is the real nature of the vapours in the sky? What as to the reason why the moon waxes and wanes, or what as to the cause of the difference of nature among various waters, metals, stones, and such like things? On all these points we may indeed say a great deal, while we search into their causes, but God alone who made them can declare the truth regarding them. If, therefore, even with respect to creation, there are some things, the knowledge of which belongs only to God, and others which come within the range of our own knowledge, what ground is there for complaint, if, in regard to those things which we investigate in the Scriptures, which are throughout spiritual, we are able, by the grace of God, to explain some of them, while we must leave others in the hands of God, and that not only in the present world, but also in that which is to come, so that God should forever teach, and man should forever learn the things taught him by God? As the Apostle has said on this point, that when other things have been done away, then these three, faith, hope, and charity, shall endure. For faith, which has respect to our Master, endures unchangeably, assuring us that there is but one true God, and that we should truly love Him for ever, seeing that He alone is our Father, while we hope ever to be receiving more and more from God, and to learn from Him, because He is good, and possesses boundless riches, a kingdom without end and instruction that can never be exhausted. If, therefore, according to the rule which I have stated, we leave some questions in the hands of God, we shall both preserve our faith uninjured, and shall continue without danger, and all scripture, which has been given to us by God, shall be found by us perfectly consistent, and the parable shall harmonize with those passages which are perfectly plain, and those statements, the meaning of which is clear, shall serve to explain the parables, and through the many diversified utterances of Scripture, there shall be heard one harmonious melody in us, praising in hymns that God who created all things. If, for instance, anyone asks, What was God doing before He made the world? We reply that the answer to such a question lies with God Himself. For that this world was formed perfect by God, receiving a beginning in time, the Scriptures teach us, but no scripture reveals to us what God was employed about before this event. The answer, therefore, to that question remains with God, and it is not proper for us to aim at bringing forward foolish, rash, and blasphemous suppositions in reply to it, so as by one's imagining that he has discovered the origin of matter, he should in reality set aside God himself who made all things. For consider, all ye who invent such opinions, since the Father himself is alone called God, who has a real existence, but whom ye style a demiurge, since, moreover, the Scriptures acknowledge him alone as God, and yet again, since the Lord confesses him alone as his own Father, and knows no other, as I shall show from his very words, when ye style this very being the fruit of defect, and the offspring of ignorance, and describe him as being ignorant of those things which are above him, with the various other allegations which you make regarding him, consider the terrible blasphemy ye are thus guilty of against him who is truly God. Ye seem to affirm gravely and honestly enough that ye believe in God, but then, as ye are utterly unable to reveal any other God, ye declare this very being in whom ye profess to believe the fruit of defect and the offspring of ignorance. Now this blindness and foolish talking flow to you from the fact that ye reserve nothing for God, but ye wish to proclaim the nativity and production both of God himself, of his Anoia, of his Logos, and life and Christ, and ye form the idea of these from no other than a mere human experience, not understanding, as I said before, that it is possible in the case of man, who is a compound being, to speak in this way of the mind of man and the thought of man, and to say that thought, anoia, springs from mind, senses, intention, anthemesis, again from thought, and word, logos, from intention. But which logos? 
for there is among the Greeks one Logos which is the principle that thinks, and another which is the instrument by means of which thought is expressed. And to say that a man sometimes is at rest and silent, while at other times he speaks and is active. But since God is all mind, all reason, all active spirit, all light, and always exists one and the same, as it is both beneficial for us to think of God, and as we learn regarding Him from the Scriptures, such feelings and divisions of operation cannot fittingly be ascribed to Him. For our tongue, as being carnal, is not sufficient to minister to the rapidity of the human mind, inasmuch as that is of a spiritual nature, for which reason our word is restrained within us, and is not at once expressed as it has been conceived by the mind, but is uttered by successive efforts, just as the tongue is able to serve it. But God being all mind and all logos, both speaks exactly what he thinks, and thinks exactly what he speaks, for his thought is Logos, and Logos is mind, and mind comprehending all things is the Father himself. He, therefore, who speaks of the mind of God, and ascribes to it a special origin of its own, declares him a compound being, as if God were one thing, and the original mind another. So again, with respect to Logos, when one attributes to him the third place of production from the Father, on which supposition he is ignorant of his greatness, and thus Logos has been far separated from God. As for the prophet, he declares respecting him, Who shall describe his generation? But he pretend to set forth his generation from the Father, and he transfer the production of the word of men, which takes place by means of a tongue, to the word of God, and thus are righteously exposed by your own selves, as knowing neither things human nor divine. But beyond reason inflated with your own wisdom, ye presumptuously maintain that ye are acquainted with the unspeakable mysteries of God, while even the Lord, the very Son of God, allowed that the Father alone knows the very day and hour of judgment, when he plainly declares, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, neither the Son, but the Father only. If, then, the Son was not ashamed to ascribe the knowledge of that day to the Father only, but declared what was true regarding the matter, neither let us be ashamed to reserve for God those greater questions which may occur to us. For no man is superior to his master. If any one therefore says to us, How then was the Son produced by the Father? We reply to him that no man understands that production, or generation, or calling, or revelation, or by whatever name one may describe his generation, which is in fact altogether indescribable. Neither Valentinus, nor Marcion, nor Saturninus, nor Basilides, nor angels, nor archangels, nor principalities, nor powers, possess this knowledge, but the Father only who begat, and the Son who was begotten. Since therefore his generation is unspeakable, those who strive to set forth generations and productions cannot be in their right mind, inasmuch as they undertake to describe things which are indescribable. For that a word is uttered at the bidding of thought and mind, all men indeed will understand. Those, therefore, who have excogitated the theory of emissions have not discovered anything great, or revealed any abstruse mystery, when they have simply transferred what all understand to the only begotten word of God. And while they style him unspeakable and unnameable, they nevertheless set forth the production and formation of his first generation, as if they themselves had assisted at his birth, thus assimilating him to the word of mankind formed by emissions. But we shall not be wrong if we affirm the same thing also concerning the substance of matter, that God produced it. For we have learned from the scriptures that God holds the supremacy over all things, but whence or in what way he produced it, neither has scripture anywhere declared, nor does it become us to conjecture, so as, in accordance with our own opinions, to form endless conjectures concerning God, but we should leave such knowledge in the hands of God himself. In like manner, also, we must leave the cause why, while all things were made by God, certain of his creatures sinned and revolted from a state of submission to God, and others, indeed the great majority, persevered, and do still persevere, 
in willing subjection to him who formed them, and also of what nature those are who sinned, and of what nature those who persevere. We must, I say, leave the cause of these things to God and his word, to whom alone he said, Sit at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. But as for us, we still dwell upon the earth, and have not yet sat down upon his throne. For although the Spirit of the Saviour that is in him searcheth all things, even the deep things of God, yet as to us there are diversities of gifts, differences of administrations, and diversities of operations, and we, while upon the earth, as Paul also declares, know in part and prophesy in part. Since, therefore, we know but in part, we ought to leave all sorts of difficult questions in the hands of him who in some measure, and that only, bestows grace on us. That eternal fire, for instance, is prepared for sinners, both the Lord has plainly declared, and the rest of the scriptures demonstrate, and that God foreknew that this would happen, the scriptures do in like manner demonstrate, since he prepared eternal fire from the beginning for those who were afterwards to transgress his commandments. But the cause itself of the nature of such transgressors neither has any scripture informed us, nor has an apostle told us, nor has the Lord taught us. It becomes us, therefore, to leave the knowledge of this matter to God, even as the Lord does of the day and hour of judgment, and not to rush to such an extreme of danger, that we will leave nothing in the hands of God, even though we have received only a measure of grace from Him in this world. But when we investigate points which are above us, and with respect to which we cannot reach satisfaction, it is absurd that we should display such an extreme of presumption as to lay open God, and things which are not yet discovered, as if already we had found out, by the vain talk about omissions, God Himself, the creator of all things, and to assert that he derived his substance from apostasy and ignorance, so as to frame an impious hypothesis in opposition to God. Moreover, they possess no proof of their system, which has but recently been invented by them, sometimes resting upon certain numbers, sometimes on syllables, and sometimes again on names, and there are occasions too when by means of those letters which are contained in letters, by parables not properly interpreted, or by certain baseless conjectures, they strive to establish that fabulous account which they have devised. For if any one should inquire the reason why the Father, who has fellowship with the Son in all things, has been declared by the Lord alone to know the hour and the day of judgment, he will find at present no more suitable or becoming or safe reason than this, since indeed the Lord is the only true Master that we may learn through him that the Father is above all things. For the Father, says he, is greater than I. The Father, therefore, has been declared by our Lord to excel with respect to knowledge, for this reason that we, too, as long as we are connected with the scheme of things in this world, should leave perfect knowledge and such questions as have been mentioned to God, and should not by any chance, while we seek to investigate the sublime nature of the Father, fall into the danger of starting the question whether there is another God above God. But if any lover of strife contradict what I have said, and also what the Apostle affirms, that we know in part and prophesy in part, and imagine that he has acquired not a partial but a universal knowledge of all that exists, being such an one as Valentinus, or Ptolemaeus, or Basilides, or any other of those who maintain that they have searched out the deep things of God, let him not, arraying himself in vainglory, boast that he has acquired greater knowledge than others with respect to those things which are invisible, or cannot be placed under our observation, but let him, by making diligent inquiry and obtaining information from the Father, tell us the reasons, which we know not, of those things which are in this world, as for instance the number of hairs on his own head, and the sparrows which are captured day by day and such other points with which we are not previously acquainted, so that we may credit him also with respect to more important points. But if those who are perfect do not yet understand the very things in their hands, and at their feet and before their eyes, and on the earth, and especially the rule followed with respect to the hairs of their head, 
how can we believe them regarding things spiritual and super-celestial and those which with a vain confidence they assert to be above god so much then i have said concerning numbers and names and syllables and questions respecting such things as are above our comprehension and concerning their improper expositions of the parables i add no more on these points since thou thyself may enlarge upon them chapter twenty nine refutation of the views of the heretics as to the future destiny of the soul and body let us return however to the remaining points of their system for when they declare that at the consummation of all things their mother shall re-enter the pleroma and receive the saviour as her consort that they themselves as being spiritual when they have got rid of their animal souls and become intellectual spirits will be the consorts of the spiritual angels but the demiurge since they call him animal will pass into the place of the mother that the souls of the righteous shall psychically repose in the intermediate place when they declare that like will be gathered to like spiritual things to spiritual while material things continue among those that are material they do in fact contradict themselves inasmuch as they no longer maintain that souls pass on account of their nature into the intermediate place to those substances which are similar to themselves but that they do so on account of the deeds done in the body but those of the impious continue in the fire for if it is on account of their nature that all souls attain to the place of enjoyment and all belong to the intermediate place simply because they are souls as being thus of the same nature with it then it follows that faith is altogether superfluous as was also the descent of the saviour to this world if on the other hand it is on account of their righteousness that they attain to such a place of rest then it is no longer because they are souls but because they are righteous but if souls would have perished unless they had been righteous then righteousness must have power to save the bodies also which these souls inhabited for why should it not save them since they too participated in righteousness for if nature and substance are the means of salvation then all souls shall be saved but if righteousness and faith why should these not save those bodies which equally with the souls will enter into immortality for righteousness will appear in matters of this kind either impotent or unjust if indeed it saves some substances through participating in it but not others for it is manifest that those acts which are deemed righteous are performed in bodies either therefore all souls will of necessity pass into the intermediate place and there will never be a judgment or bodies too which have participated in righteousness will attain to the place of enjoyment along with the souls which have in like manner participated if indeed righteousness is powerful enough to bring thither those substances which have participated in it and then the doctrine concerning the resurrection of bodies which we believe will emerge true and certain from their system since as we hold god when he resuscitates our mortal bodies which preserve righteousness will render them incorruptible and immortal for god is superior to nature and has in himself the disposition to show kindness because he is good and the ability to do so because he is mighty and the faculty of fully carrying out his purpose because he is rich and perfect but these men are in all points inconsistent with themselves when they decide that all souls do not enter into the intermediate place but those of the righteous only for they maintain that according to nature and substance three sorts of being were produced by the mother the first which proceeded from perplexity and weariness and fear that is material substance the second from impetuosity that is animal substance but that which she brought forth after the vision of those angels who wait upon christ is spiritual substance if then that substance which she brought forth will by all means enter into the pleroma because it is spiritual while that which is material will remain below because it is material and shall be totally consumed by the fire which burns within it why should not the whole animal substance go into the intermediate place into which also they send the demiurge but what is it which shall enter within their pleroma for they maintain that souls shall continue in the intermediate place 
while bodies, because they possess material substance, when they have been resolved into matter, shall be consumed by that fire which exists in it. But their body being thus destroyed, and their soul remaining in the intermediate place, no part of man will any longer be left to enter in within the pleroma. For the intellect of man, his mind, thought, mental intention, and such like, is nothing else than his soul, but the emotions and operations of the soul itself have no substance apart from the soul. What part of them, then, will still remain to enter into the pleroma? For they themselves, in as far as they are souls, remain in intermediate place, while in as far as they are body, they will be consumed with the rest of matter. End of Book 2 Chapters 28 through 29 Chapters 30 through 31 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Nash. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 2. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 30. Absurdity of their styling themselves spiritual, while the demiurge is declared to be animal. 1. Such being the state of the case, these infatuated men declare that they rise above the Creator, demiurge, and, inasmuch as they proclaim themselves superior to that God, who made and adorned the heavens, and the earth, and all things that are in them, and maintain that they themselves are spiritual, while they are in fact shamefully carnal on account of their so great impiety, affirming that he who has made his angels spirits, and is clothed with light as a garment, and holds the circle of the earth, as it were, in his hand, in whose sight its inhabitants are counted as grasshoppers, and who is the creator and lord of all spiritual substance, is of an animal nature. They do beyond doubt, and verily betray their own madness, and, as if truly struck with thunder, even more than those giants who are spoken of in heathen fables, they lift up their opinions against God, inflated by a vain presumption and unstable glory. Men, for whose purgation all the hellebore on earth would not suffice, so that they should get rid of their intense folly. 2. The superior person is proved by his deeds. In what way, then, can they show themselves superior to the Creator? That I, too, through the necessity of the argument in hand, may come down to the level of their impiety, instituting a comparison between God and foolish men, and, by descending to their argument, may often refute them by their own doctrines. But in thus acting may God be merciful to me, for I venture on these statements, not with the view of comparing him to them, but of convicting and overthrowing their insane opinions. They, for whom many foolish persons entertain so great an admiration, as if, forsooth, they could learn from them something more precious than the truth itself. That expression of Scripture, Seek, and ye shall find, they interpret as spoken with this view, that they should discover themselves to be above the Creator, styling themselves greater and better than God and calling themselves spiritual, but the Creator animal, and affirming that for this reason they rise upwards above God, for that they enter in within the plenaroma, while He remains in the intermediate place. Let them, then, prove themselves by their deeds superior to the Creator, for the superior person ought to be proved not by what is said, but by what has a real existence. 3. What work, then, will they point to as having been accomplished through themselves by the Savior, or by their mother, either greater, or more glorious, or more adorned with wisdom, 
than those which have been produced by him who was the disposer of all around us. What heavens have they established? What earth have they founded? What stars have they called into existence? Or what lights of heaven have they caused to shine? Within what circles, moreover, have they confined them? Or what rains, or frosts, or snows, each suited to the season and to every special climate, have they brought upon the earth? And again, in opposition to these, what heat or dryness have they set over against them? Or what rivers have they made to flow? What fountains have they brought forth? With what flowers and trees have they adorned this sublunary world? Or what multitude of animals have they formed, some rational and others irrational, but all adorned with his beauty? And who can enumerate one by one all the remaining objects which have been constituted by the power of God, and are governed by his wisdom? Or who can search out the greatness of that God who made them? And what can be told of those existences which are above heaven, and which do not pass away, such as angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, and powers innumerable? Against what one of these works, then, do they set themselves in opposition? What have they similar to show, as having been made through themselves, or by themselves, since even they, too, are the workmanship and creatures of this Creator? For whether the Savior or their mother, to use their own expressions, proving them false by means of the very terms they themselves employ, used this being, as they maintain, to make an image of those things which are within the Pleroma, and of all of these beings which she saw waiting upon the Savior, she used him, the Demiurge, as being, in a sense, superior to herself, and better fitted to accomplish her purpose through his instrumentality, for she would by no means form the image of such important beings through means of an inferior, but by a superior agent. 4. For, be it observed, they themselves, according to their own declarations, were then existing as a spiritual conception, in consequence of the contemplation of those beings who were arranged as satellites around Pandora. And they indeed continued useless, the mother accomplishing nothing through their instrumentality, an idle conception, owing their being to the Savior, and fit for nothing, for not a thing appears to have been done by them. But the God, who according to them was produced, while, as they argue, inferior to themselves, for they maintain that he is of an animal nature, was nevertheless the active agent in all things, efficient and fit for the work to be done, so that by him the images of all things were made. And not only were these things which were seen formed by him, but also all things invisible, angels, archangels, dominations, powers, and virtues. By him, I say, as being the superior and capable of ministering to her desire. But it seems that the mother made nothing whatsoever through their instrumentality, as indeed they themselves acknowledge, so that one may justly reckon them as having been an abortion produced by the painful travail of their mother. For no accouchers performed their office upon her, and therefore they were cast forth as an abortion useful for nothing, and formed to accomplish no work of the mother. And yet they describe themselves as being superior to him, by whom so vast and admirable works have been accomplished and arranged, although by their own reasoning they are found to be so wretchedly inferior. 5. It is as if there were two iron tools, or instruments, the one of which was continually in the workman's hands and in constant use, and by the use of which he made whatever he pleased, and displayed his art and skill, but the other of which remained idle and useless, never being called into operation, the workman never appearing to make anything by it, and making no use of it in any of his labors. 
And then one should maintain that this useless and idle and unemployed tool was superior in nature and value to that which the artisan employed in his work, and by means of which he acquired his reputation. Such a man, if any such were found, would justly be regarded as imbecile and not in his right mind. And so should those be judged of who speak of themselves as being spiritual and superior, and of the Creator as possessed of an animal nature, and maintain that for this reason they will ascend on high and penetrate within the pleroma to their own husbands. For, according to their own statements, they are themselves feminine. But that God, the Creator, is of an inferior nature, and therefore remains in the intermediate place, while all the time they bring forward no proofs of these assertions. For the better man is shown by his works, and all works have been accomplished by the Creator. But they, having nothing worthy of reason to point to as having been produced by themselves, are laboring under the greatest and most incurable madness. 6. If, however, they labor to maintain that while all material things, such as the heaven and the whole world which exists below it, were indeed formed by the demiurge, yet all things of a more spiritual nature than these, those, namely, which are above the heavens, such as principalities, powers, angels, archangels, dominations, virtues, were produced by a spiritual process of birth, which they declare themselves to be, then, in the first place, we prove from the authoritative scriptures that all the things which have been mentioned, visible and invisible, have been made by one God. For these men are not more to be depended on than the scriptures. Nor ought we to give up the declarations of the Lord, Moses, and the rest of the prophets, who have proclaimed the truth, and give credit to them, who do indeed utter nothing of a sensible nature, but rave about untenable opinions. And, in the next place, if those things which are above the heavens were really made through their instrumentality, then let them inform us what is the nature of things invisible, recount the number of the angels, and the ranks of the archangels, reveal the mystery of the thrones, and teach us the differences between the dominations, principalities, powers, and virtues. But they can say nothing respecting them. Therefore, these beings were not made by them. If, on the other hand, these were made by the Creator, as was really the case, and are of a spiritual and holy character, then it follows that he who produced spiritual beings is not himself of an animal nature, and thus their fearful system of blasphemy is overthrown. 7. For that there are spiritual creatures in the heavens, all the scriptures loudly proclaim, and Paul expressly testifies that there are spiritual things when he declares that he was caught up into the third heaven, and again that he was carried away to paradise, and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. But what did that profit him, either his entrance into paradise or his assumption into the third heaven, since all these things are still but under the power of the demiurge, if, as some venture to maintain, he had already begun to be a spectator and hearer of those mysteries which are affirmed to be above the demiurge. For if it is true that he was becoming acquainted with that order of things which is above the demiurge, he would by no means have remained in the regions of the demiurge, and that so as not even thoroughly to explore even these. For according to their manner of speaking, there still lay before him four heavens, as if he were to approach the demiurge, and thus behold the whole seven lying beneath him. But he might have been admitted, perhaps, into the intermediate place, that is, into the presence of the mother, that he might receive instruction from her as to the things within the pleroma. For that inner man which was in him, 
and spoke in him, as they say, though invisible, could have attained not only to the third heaven, but even as far as the presence of their mother. For if they maintain that they themselves, that is, their inner man, at once ascends above the demiurge, and departs to the mother, much more must this have occurred to the inner man of the apostle. For the demiurge would not have hindered him, being, as they assert, himself already subject to the Saviour. But if he had tried to hinder him, the effort would have gone for nothing. For it is not possible that he should have proved stronger than the providence of the Father, and that when the inner man is said to be invisible, even to the demiurge. But since he, Paul, has described that assumption of himself up to the third heaven as something great and preeminent, it cannot be that these men ascend above the seventh heaven, for they are certainly not superior to the apostle. If they do maintain that they are more excellent than he, let them prove themselves so by their works, for they have never pretended to know anything like what he describes as occurring to himself. And for this reason he added, quote, Whether in the body, or whether out of the body, God knoweth, unquote, that the body might neither be thought to be a partaker in that vision, as if it could have participated in those things which it had seen and heard, nor, again, that any one should say that he was not carried higher on account of the weight of the body. But it is therefore thus far permitted, even without the body, to behold spiritual mysteries which are the operations of God, who made the heavens and the earth, and formed man, and placed him in paradise, so that those should be spectators of them, who, like the apostle, have reached a high degree of perfection in the love of God. 8. This being, therefore, also made spiritual beings, of which, as far as to the third heaven, the apostle was made a spectator, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not possible for a man to utter, inasmuch as they are spiritual. And he himself bestows gifts on the worthy, as inclination prompts him. For paradise is his, and he is truly the Spirit of God, and not an animal demiurge. Otherwise, he should never have created spiritual things. But if he really is of an animal nature, then let them inform us by whom spiritual things were made. They have no proof which they can give that this was done by means of the travail of their mother, which they declare themselves to be. For, not to speak of spiritual things, these men cannot create even a fly, or a gnat, or any other small and insignificant animal, without observing that law by which from the beginning animals have been, and are, naturally produced by God, through the deposition of seed in those that are of the same species. Nor was anything formed by the mother alone, for they say that this demiurge was produced by her, and that he was the Lord, the author of all creation. And they maintain that he who is the creator and Lord of all that has been made is of an animal nature, while they assert that they themselves are spiritual. They, who are neither the authors nor the lords of any one work, not only of those things which are extraneous to them, but not even of their own bodies. Moreover, these men, who call themselves spiritual and superior to the Creator, do often suffer much bodily pain sorely against their will. 9. Justly, therefore, do we convict them of having departed far and wide from the truth. For if the Savior formed the things which have been made, by means of him, the demiurge, he is proved that in that case not to be inferior, but superior to them, since he is found to have been the former even of themselves for they too have a place among created things. 
How then can it be argued that these men indeed are spiritual, but that he by whom they were created is of an animal nature? Or again, if, which is indeed the only true supposition, as I have shown by numerous arguments of the very clearest nature, he, the Creator, made all things freely and by his own power, and arranged and finished them, and his will is the substance of all things, then he is discovered to be the one only God who created all things, who alone is omnipotent, and who is the only Father rounding and forming all things, visible and invisible, such as may be perceived by our senses, and such as cannot, heavenly and earthly, by the word of his power. And he has fitted and arranged all things by his wisdom, while he contains all things, but he himself can be contained by no one. He is the former, he the builder, he the discoverer, he the creator, he the Lord of all, and there is no one besides him or above him. Neither has he any mother, as they falsely ascribe to him, nor is there a second God, as Marcion has imagined. Nor is there a pleroma of thirty eons, which has been shown in a vain supposition. Nor is there any such being as Bythus or Proarche. Nor are there a series of heavens, nor is there a virginal light, nor an unnameable eon, nor, in fact, any one of those things which are madly dreamt of by these and all the heretics. But there is only one God, the Creator, He who is above every principality and power and dominion and virtue. He is Father. He is God. He the Founder. He the Maker. He the Creator who made those things by himself, that is, through his word and his wisdom, heaven and earth and the seas and all the things that are in them. He is just. He is good. He it is who formed man, who planted paradise, who made the world, who gave rise to the flood, who saved Noah. He is the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob the God of the living. He it is whom the law proclaims, whom the prophets preach, whom Christ reveals, whom the apostles make known to us, and in whom the church believes. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through his word, who is his Son, through him he is revealed, and manifested to all whom he is revealed. For those only know him to whom the Son has revealed him. But the Son, eternally coexisting with the Father, from of old, yea, from the beginning, always reveals the Father to angels, archangels, powers, virtues, and all to whom he wills that God should be revealed. Chapter 31 Recapitulation and Application of the Foregoing Arguments 1. Those, then, who are of the school of Valentinus, being overthrown, the whole multitude of heretics are, in fact, also subverted. For all the arguments I have advanced against their pleroma, and with respect to those things which are beyond it, showing how the Father of all is shut up and circumscribed by that which is beyond him, if indeed there be anything beyond him, and how there is an absolute necessity, on their theory, to conceive of many fathers and many pleromas and many creations of worlds, beginning with one set and ending with another, as existing on every side, and that all the beings referred to continue in their own domains and do not curiously intermeddle with others, since indeed no common interest nor any fellowship exists between them and that there is no other God of all, but that that name belongs only to the Almighty. All these arguments, I say, will in like manner apply to those who are of the school of Marcion and Simon and Meander, 
or whatever others there may be, whom, like them, cut off that creation with which we are connected from the Father. The arguments, again, which I have employed against those who maintain that the Father of all no doubt contains all things, but that the creation to which we belong was not formed by him, but by a certain other power, or by angels having no knowledge of the propriator, who is surrounded as a center by the immense extent of the universe, just as a stain is by the surrounding cloak, when I showed that it is not a probable supposition that any other being than the Father of all formed that creation to which we belong, these same arguments will apply against the followers of Saturnius, Lacildes, Carpocrates, and the rest of the Gnostics, who express similar opinions. Those statements, again, which have been made with respect to the emanations and the eons and the supposed state of degeneracy and the inconstant character of their mother, equally overthrow Basildis, and all who are falsely styled Gnostics, who do, in fact, just repeat the same views under different names, but do, to a greater extent than the former, transfer those things which lie outside of the truth to the system of their own doctrine. And the remarks I have made respecting numbers will also apply to all those who misappropriate things belonging to the truth for the support of a system of this kind. And all that has been said respecting the Creator, or Demiurge, to show that He alone is God and Father of all, and whatever remarks may yet be made in the following books, I apply against the heretics at large. The more moderate and reasonable among them thou wilt convert and convince, so as to lead them no longer to blaspheme their Creator and Maker and Sustainer and Lord, nor ascribe His origin to defect and ignorance. But the fierce and terrible and irrational among them thou wilt drive far from thee, that you may no longer have to endure their idle loquaciousness. 2. Moreover, those also will be thus confuted who belong to Simon and Carpocrates, and if there be any others who are said to perform miracles, who do not perform what they do either through the power of God, or in connection with the truth, nor for the well-being of men, but for the sake of destroying and misleading mankind, by means of magical deceptions, and with universal deceit, thus impaling greater harm than good on those who believe them, with respect to the point on which they lead them astray. For they can neither confer sight on the blind, nor hearing on the deaf, nor chase away all sorts of demons, none indeed, except those who are sent into others by themselves, if they can even do so much as this. Nor can they cure the weak, or the lame, or the paralytic, or those who are distressed in any other part of the body, as has often been done in regard to bodily infirmity. Nor can they furnish effective remedies for those external accidents which may occur. And so far are they from being able to raise the dead, as the Lord raised them, and the apostles did by means of prayer, and has been frequently done in the brotherhood on account of some necessity, the entire church in that particular locality, entreating the boon with much fasting and prayer, the spirit of the dead man has returned, and he has been bestowed in answer to the prayers of the saints. That they do not even believe this can possibly be done, and hold that the resurrection from the dead is simply an acquaintance with that truth which they proclaim. 3. Since, therefore, there exist among them error and misleading influences, and magical illusions are impiously wrought in the sight of men, but in the church sympathy and compassion and steadfastness and truth for the aid and encouragement of mankind are not only displayed without fee or reward, but we ourselves lay out for the benefit of others our own means. And inasmuch as those who are cured very frequently do not possess the things which they require, they receive them from us. Since such is the case, 
These men are in this way undoubtedly proved to be utter aliens from the divine nature, the beneficence of God, and all spiritual excellence. But they are altogether full of deceit of every kind, apostate inspiration, demoniacal working, and the phantasms of idolatry, and are in reality the predecessors of that dragon who by means of deception of the same kind will with his tail cause a third part of the stars to fall from their place, and will cast them down to the earth. It behooves us to flee from them as we would from him, and the greater the display with which they are said to perform their marvels, the more carefully we should watch them, as having been endowed with a greater spirit of wickedness. If any one will consider the prophecy referred to, and the daily practices of these men, he will find that their manner of acting is one and the same with the demons. End of Book 2, Chapters 30 through 31、Chapters 32 through 35 of Irenaeus Against Heresies. Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. Irenaeus Against Heresies. Book Two. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 32 Further Exposure of the Wicked and Blasphemous Doctrines of the Heretics 1. Moreover, this impious opinion of theirs with respect to actions, namely that it is incumbent on them to have experience of all kinds of deeds, even the most abominable, is refuted by the teaching of the Lord, with whom not only is the adulterer rejected, but also the man who desires to commit adultery. And not only is the actual murderer held guilty of having killed another to his own damnation, but the man also who is angry with his brother without a cause, who commanded his disciples not only not to hate men, but also to love their enemies and enjoined them not only not to swear falsely, but not even to swear at all, and not only not to speak evil of their neighbors, but not even to style any one raka and fool, declaring that otherwise they were in danger of hell-fire, and not only not to strike, but even when themselves struck, to present the other cheek to those that maltreated them, and not only not to refuse to give up the property of others, but even if their own were taken away, not to demand it back again from those that took it, and not only not to injure their neighbors, nor to do them any evil, but also when themselves wickedly dealt with, to be long-suffering and to show kindness towards those that injured them, and to pray for them, that by means of repentance they might be saved, so that we should in no respect imitate the arrogance, lust, and pride of others. Since, therefore, he whom these men boast of as their master, and of whom they affirm that he had a soul greatly better and more highly toned than others, did indeed with much earnestness command certain things to be done as being good and excellent, and certain things to be abstained from, not only in their actual perpetration, but even in the thoughts which lead to their performance, as being wicked, pernicious, and abominable. How then can they escape being put to confusion when they affirm that such a master 
was more highly toned in spirit, and better than others, and yet manifestly give instruction of a kind utterly opposed to his teaching. And again, if there were really no such thing as good and evil, but certain things were deemed righteous, and certain others unrighteous, in human opinion only, he never would have expressed himself thus in his teaching. The righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. But he shall send the unrighteous and those who do not the works of righteousness into everlasting fire, where their worm shall not die, and the fire shall not be quenched. 2. When they further maintain that it is incumbent on them to have experience of every kind of work and conduct, so that, if it be possible, accomplishing all during one manifestation in this life, they may at once pass over to the state of perfection. They are by no chance found striving to do those things which wait upon virtue, and are laborious, glorious, and skillful, which also are proved universally as being good. For if it be necessary to go through every work and every kind of operation, they ought in the first place to learn all the arts. All of them, I say, whether referring to theory or practice, whether they be acquired by self-denial, or are mastered through means of labor, exercise, and perseverance. As, for example, every kind of music, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and all such as are occupied with intellectual pursuits. Then again, the whole study of medicine, and the knowledge of plants, so as to become acquainted with those which are prepared for the health of man, the art of painting and sculpture, brass and marble work, and the kindred arts. Moreover, they have to study every kind of country labor, the veterinary art, pastoral occupations, the various kinds of skilled labor, which are said to pervade the whole circle of human exertion, those again connected with a maritime life, gymnastic exercises, hunting, military and kingly pursuits, and as many others as may exist, of which, with the utmost labor, they could not learn the tenth, or even the thousandth part, in the whole course of their lives. The fact indeed is that they endeavor to learn none of these, although they maintain that it is incumbent on them to have experience of every kind of work. But turning aside to voluptuousness and lust and abominable actions, they stand self-condemned when they are tried by their own doctrine. For since they are destitute of all those virtues which have been mentioned, they will of necessity pass into the destruction of fire. These men, while they boast of Jesus as being their master, do in fact emulate the philosophy of Epicurus and the indifference of the cynics, calling Jesus their master, who not only turned his disciples away from evil deeds, but even from wicked words and thoughts, as I have already shown. 3. Again, while they assert that they possess souls from the same sphere as Jesus, and that they are like to him, sometimes even maintaining that they are superior, while they affirm that they were produced like him for the performance of works tending to the benefit and establishment of mankind, they are found doing nothing of the same or a like kind with his actions, nor what can in any respect be brought into comparison with them. And if they have in truth 
accomplished anything remarkable by means of magic, they strive in this way deceitfully to lead foolish people astray, since they confer no real benefit or blessing on those over whom they declare that they exert supernatural power. But bringing forward mere boys as the subjects on whom they practice, and deceiving their sight while they exhibit phantasms that instantly cease, and do not endure even a moment of time, they are proved to be like not Jesus our Lord, but Simon the Magician. It is certain, too, from the fact that the Lord rose from the dead on the third day, and manifested himself to his disciples, and was in their sight received up into heaven, that inasmuch as these men die, and do not rise again, nor manifest themselves to any, they are proved as possessing souls in no respect similar to that of Jesus. 4. If, however, they maintain that the Lord, too, performed such works simply in appearance, we shall refer them to the prophetical writings, and prove from these both that all things were thus predicted regarding him, and did take place undoubtedly, and that he is the only Son of God. Wherefore also those who are in truth his disciples, receiving grace from him, do in his name perform miracles, so as to promote the welfare of other men, according to the gift which each one has received from him. For some do, certainly and truly, drive out devils, so that those who have thus been cleansed from evil spirits frequently both believe in Christ and join themselves to the church. Others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and utter prophetic expressions. Others still heal the sick by laying their hands upon them, and they are made whole. Yea, moreover, as I have said, the dead even have been raised up and remained among us for many years. And what shall I more say? It is not possible to name the number of the gifts which the church, scattered throughout the whole world, has received from God in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and which she exerts day by day for the benefit of the Gentiles, neither practicing deception upon any, nor taking any reward from them on account of such miraculous interpositions. For as she has received freely from God, freely also does she minister to others. 5. Nor does she perform anything by means of angelic invocations, or by incantations, or by any other wicked, curious art, but directing her prayers to the Lord, who made all things in a pure, sincere, and straightforward spirit. And calling upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, she has been accustomed to work miracles for the advantage of mankind, and not to lead them into error. If, therefore, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ even now confers benefits upon men, and cures thoroughly and effectively all who anywhere believe on him, but not that of Simon, or Menander, or Carpocrates, or of any other man whatever, it is manifest that, when he was made man, he held fellowship with his own creation, and did all things truly through the power of God, according to the will of the Father of all, as the prophets had foretold. But what these things were, 
shall be described in dealing with the proofs to be found in the prophetical writings. Chapter 33 Absurdity of the Doctrine of the Transmigration of Souls 1. We may subvert their doctrine as to transmigration from body to body by this fact, that souls remember nothing whatever of the events which took place in their previous states of existence. For if they were sent forth with this object, that they should have experience of every kind of action, they must of necessity retain a remembrance of those things which have been previously accomplished, that they might fill up those in which they were still deficient, and not by always hovering without intermission round the same pursuits, spend their labor wretchedly in vain, for the mere union of a body with a soul could not altogether extinguish the memory and contemplation of those things which had formerly been experienced. And especially as they came into the world for this very purpose. For as, when the body is asleep and at rest, whatever things the soul sees by herself and does in a vision, recollecting many of these, she also communicates them to the body. And as it happens that when one awakes, perhaps after a long time, he relates what he saw in a dream, so also would he undoubtedly remember those things which he did before he came into this particular body. For if that which is seen only for a very brief space of time, or has been conceived of simply in a phantasm, and by the soul alone, through means of a dream, is remembered after she has mingled again with the body, and been dispersed through all the members, much more would she remember those things in connection with which she stayed during so long a time, even throughout the whole period of a bypassed life. 2. With reference to these objections, Plato, that ancient Athenian, who also was the first to introduce this opinion, when he could not set them aside, invented the notion of a cup of oblivion, imagining that in this way he would escape this sort of difficulty. He attempted no kind of proof of his supposition, but simply replied dogmatically to the objection in question that when souls enter into this life, they are caused to drink of oblivion by that demon who watches their entrance into the world before they effect an entrance into the bodies assigned them. It escaped him that by speaking thus he fell into another greater perplexity. For if the cup of oblivion, after it has been drunk, can obliterate the memory of all the deeds that have been done, how, O oh Plato, dost thou obtain the knowledge of this fact, since thy soul is now in the body, that, before it entered into the body, it was made to drink by the demon a drug which caused oblivion? For if thou hast a remembrance of the demon, and the cup, and the entrance into life, thou oughtest also to be acquainted with other things. But if, on the other hand, thou art ignorant of them, then there is no truth in the story of the demon, nor in the cup of oblivion prepared with art. 3. In opposition again to those who affirm that the body itself is the drug of oblivion, this observation may be made. How then does it come to pass 
that whatsoever the soul sees by her own instrumentality, both in dreams and by reflection or earnest mental exertion, while the body is passive, she remembers and reports to her neighbors. But again, if the body itself were the cause of oblivion, then the soul, as existing in the body, could not remember even those things which were perceived long ago either by means of the eyes or the ears. But as soon as the eye was turned from the things looked at, the memory of them also would undoubtedly be destroyed. For the soul, as existing in the very cause of oblivion, could have no knowledge of anything else than that only which it saw at the present moment. How, too, could it become acquainted with divine things, and retain a remembrance of them while existing in the body, since, as they maintain, the body itself is the cause of oblivion? But the prophets also, when they were upon the earth, remembered likewise, on their returning to their ordinary state of mind, whatever things they spiritually saw or heard in visions of heavenly objects, and related them to others. The body, therefore, does not cause the soul to forget those things which have been spiritually witnessed. But the soul teaches the body, and shares with it the spiritual vision which it has enjoyed. 4. For the body is not possessed of greater power than the soul, since indeed the former is inspired and vivified and increased and held together by the latter. But the soul possesses and rules over the body. It is doubtless retarded in its velocity, just in the exact proportion in which the body shares in its motion but it never loses the knowledge which properly belongs to it. For the body may be compared to an instrument, but the soul is possessed of the reason of an artist. As, therefore, the artist finds the idea of a work to spring up rapidly in his mind, but can only carry it out slowly by means of an instrument, owing to the want of perfect pliability in the matter acted upon, and thus the rapidity of his mental operation, being blended with the slow action of the instrument, gives rise to a moderate kind of movement towards the end contemplated. So also the soul, by being mixed up with the body belonging to it, is in a certain measure impeded its rapidity being blended with the body's slowness. Yet it does not lose altogether its own peculiar powers. But while, as it were, sharing life with the body, it does not itself cease to live. Thus, too, while communicating other things to the body, it neither loses the knowledge of them, nor the memory of those things which have been witnessed. 5. If, therefore, the soul remembers nothing of what took place in a former state of existence, but has a perception of those things which are here, it follows that she never existed in other bodies, nor did things of which she has no knowledge, nor once knew things which she cannot now mentally contemplate. But as each one of us receives his body through the skillful working of God, so does he also possess his soul. For God is not so poor or destitute in resources that he cannot confer its own proper soul on each individual body, even as he gives it also its special character. And therefore, when the number fixed upon is completed, that number which he had predetermined in his own counsel, 
all those who have been enrolled for life eternal shall rise again, having their own bodies, and having also their own souls, and their own spirits, in which they had pleased God. Those, on the other hand, who are worthy of punishment, shall go away into it, they too having their own souls and their own bodies, in which they stood apart from the grace of God. Both classes shall then cease from any longer begetting and being begotten, from marrying and being given in marriage, so that the number of mankind, corresponding to the foreordination of God, being completed, may fully realize the scheme formed by the Father. Chapter 34 Souls can be recognized in the separate state, and are immortal, although they once had a beginning. 1. The Lord has taught with very great fullness that souls not only continue to exist, not by passing from body to body, but that they preserve the same form in their separate state as the body had to which they were adapted, and that they remember the deeds which they did in this state of existence, and from which they have now ceased. In that narrative, which is recorded respecting the rich man and that Lazarus who found repose in the bosom of Abraham. In this account, he states that Dives knew Lazarus after death, and Abraham in like manner, and that each one of these persons continued in his own proper position, and that Dives requested Lazarus to be sent to relieve him, Lazarus, on whom he did not formally bestow even the crumbs which fell from his table. He tells us also of the answer given by Abraham, who was acquainted not only with what respected himself, but dives also, and who enjoined those who did not wish to come into that place of torment to believe Moses and the prophets and to receive the preaching of him who was to rise again from the dead. By these things, then, it is plainly declared that souls continue to exist, that they do not pass from body to body, that they possess the form of a man, so that they may be recognized and retain the memory of things in this world, Moreover, that the gift of prophecy was possessed by Abraham, and that each class of souls receives a habitation such as it has deserved even before the judgment. 2. But if any persons at this point maintain that those souls which only began a little while ago to exist cannot endure for any length of time, but that they must, on the one hand, either be unborn, in order that they may be immortal, or if they have had a beginning in the way of generation, that they should die with the body itself. Let them learn that God alone, who is Lord of all, is without beginning and without end, being truly and forever the same, and always remaining the same unchangeable being. But all things which proceed from him whatsoever have been made, and are made, do indeed receive their own beginning of generation. And on this account are inferior to him who formed them, inasmuch as they are not unbegotten. Nevertheless, they endure, 
and extend their existence into a long series of ages in accordance with the will of God their Creator, so that he grants them that they should be thus formed at the beginning, and that they should so exist afterwards. 3. For as the heaven which is above us, the firmament, the sun, the moon, the rest of the stars, and all their grandeur, although they had no previous existence, were called into being, and continue throughout a long course of time according to the will of God, so also any one who thinks thus respecting souls and spirits, and in fact respecting all created things, will not by any means go far astray, inasmuch as all things that have been made had a beginning when they were formed, but endure as long as God wills that they should have an existence and continuance. The prophetic spirit bears testimony to these opinions when he declares, For he spake, and they were made, he commanded, and they were created, he hath established them for ever, yea, for ever and ever. And again he thus speaks, respecting the salvation of man. He asked life of thee, and thou gavest him length of days for ever and ever, indicating that it is the Father of all who imparts continuance for ever and ever on those who are saved. For life does not arise from us, nor from our own nature, but it is bestowed according to the grace of God. And therefore he who shall preserve the life bestowed upon him, and give thanks to him who imparted it, shall receive also length of days for ever and ever. But he who shall reject it, and prove himself, ungrateful to his Maker, inasmuch as he has been created, and has not recognized him who bestowed the gift upon him, deprives himself of the privilege of continuance for ever and ever. And for this reason the Lord declared to those who showed themselves ungrateful towards him, If ye had not been faithful in that which is little, who will give you that which is great, indicating that those who in this brief temporal life have shown themselves ungrateful to him who bestowed it, shall justly not receive from him length of days for ever and ever. 4. But as the animal body is certainly not itself the soul, yet has fellowship with the soul as long as God pleases, so the soul herself is not life, but partakes in that life bestowed upon her by God. Wherefore also the prophetic word declares of the first formed man, he became a living soul, teaching us that by the participation of life, the soul became alive, so that the soul and the life which it possesses must be understood as being separate existences. When God therefore bestows life and perpetual duration, it comes to pass that even souls which did not previously exist should henceforth endure forever, since God has both willed that they should exist and should continue in existence. For the will of God ought to govern and rule in all things, while all other things give way to Him, are in subjection and devoted to His service. Thus far, then, let me speak concerning the creation and the continued duration of the soul. Chapter 35 
refutation of Basilides, and of the opinion that the prophets uttered their predictions under the inspiration of different gods. 1. Moreover, in addition to what has been said, Basilides himself will, according to his own principles, find it necessary to maintain not only that there are 365 heavens made in succession by one another, but that an immense and innumerable multitude of heavens have always been in the process of being made, and are being made, and will continue to be made, so that the formation of heavens of this kind can never cease. For if from the efflux of the first heaven, the second was made after his likeness, and the third after the likeness of the second, and so on with all the remaining subsequent ones, then it follows as a matter of necessity that from the efflux of our heaven, which he indeed terms the last, another be formed like to it and from that again a third, and thus there can never cease. Either the process or efflux from those heavens which have been already made, or the manufacture of new heavens. But the operation must go on ad infinitum, and give rise to a number of heavens which will be altogether indefinite. 2. The remainder of those who are falsely termed Gnostics, and who maintain that the prophets uttered their prophecies under the inspiration of different gods, will be easily overthrown by this fact, that all the prophets proclaimed one God and Lord, and that the very Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things which are therein while they moreover announced the advent of his son, as I shall demonstrate from the scriptures themselves in the books which follow. 3. If, however, any object that, in the Hebrew language, diverse expressions to represent God occur in the scriptures, such as Sabaoth, Eloi, Adonai, and all other such terms, striving to prove from these that there are different powers and gods, let them learn that all expressions of this kind are but announcements and appellations of one and the same being. For the term Eloi in the Jewish language denotes God, while Elohim and Eloth, in the Hebrew language, signify that which contains all. As to the appellation Adonai, sometimes it denotes what is nameable and admirable, but at other times, when the letter Daleth in it is doubled, and the word receives an initial guttural sound, Thus, Adonai, it signifies one who bounds and separates the land from the water, so that the water should not subsequently submerge the land. In like manner also, Sabaoth, when it is spelled by a Greek omega in the last syllable, Sabaoth, denotes a voluntary agent but when it is spelled with a Greek omicron, as, for instance, Sabaoth, it expresses the first heaven. In the same way, too, the word Jaoth, when the last syllable is made long and aspirated, denotes a predetermined measure. But when it is written shortly by the Greek letter omicron, namely Jaoth, it signifies one who puts evils to flight. All the other expressions, likewise, bring out the title of one and the same being, 
as, for example, in English, the Lord of Powers, the Father of All, God Almighty, the Most High, the Creator, the Maker, and such like. These are not the names and titles of a succession of different beings, but of one and the same, by means of which the one God and Father is revealed, he who contains all things, and grants to all the boon of existence. 4. Now that the preaching of the apostles, the authoritative teaching of the Lord, the announcements of the prophets, the dictated utterances of the apostles, and the ministration of the law, all of which praise one and the same being, the God and Father of all, and not many diverse beings, nor one deriving his substance from different gods or powers, but declare that all things were formed by one and the same Father, who nevertheless adapts his works to the natures and tendencies of the materials dealt with, things visible and invisible, and in short, all things that have been made were created neither by angels nor by any other power, but by God alone, the Father are all in harmony with our statements, has, I think, been sufficiently proved, while by these weighty arguments it has been shown that there is but one God, the Maker of all things. But that I may not be thought to avoid that series of proofs, which may be derived from the Scriptures of the Lord, since indeed these Scriptures do much more evidently and clearly proclaim this very point, I shall, for the benefit of those at least, who do not bring a depraved mind to bear upon them, devote a special book to the scriptures referred to, which shall fairly follow them out and explain them, and I shall plainly set forth from these divine scriptures proofs to satisfy all the lovers of truth. End of Book 2 Chapters 32 through 35. Recording by Bill Mosley, Frellsburg, Texas. Preface through Chapter 4 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Preface. Thou hast indeed enjoined upon me, my very dear friend, that I should bring to light the Valentinian doctrines, concealed, as their votaries imagine, that I should exhibit their diversity, and compose a treatise in refutation of them. I therefore have undertaken, showing that they spring from Simon, the father of all heretics, to exhibit both their doctrines and successions, and to set forth arguments against them all. Wherefore, since the conviction of these men, and their exposure is in many points but one work, I have sent unto thee certain books, of which the first comprises the opinions of all these men, and exhibits their customs, and the character of their behavior. In the second again, their perverse teachings are cast down and overthrown, and, such as they really are, laid bare and open to view. But in this, the third book, I shall adduce proofs from the scriptures, so that I may come behind in nothing of what thou hast enjoined. Yea, that over and above thou didst reckon upon me, thou mayest receive from me the means of combating and vanquishing those who, in whatever manner, are propagating falsehood. For the love of God, being rich and ungrudging, confers upon the suppliant more than he can ask from it, Call to mind, then, the things which I have stated in the two preceding books, 
and taking these in connection with them, thou shalt have from me a very copious refutation of all the heretics, and faithfully and strenuously shalt thou resist them in defense of the only true and life-giving faith, which the church has received from the apostles and imparted to her sons. For the Lord of all gave to his apostles the power of the gospel, through whom also we have known the truth, that is, the doctrine of the Son of God, to whom also did the Lord declare, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despiseth you, despiseth me, and him that sent me. Chapter 1 The apostles did not commence to preach the gospel, or to place anything on record until they were endowed with the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. They preached one God alone, maker of heaven and earth, 1. We have learned from none others the plan of our salvation, than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public, and, at a later period, by the will of God, handed down to us in the scriptures, to be the ground and pillar of our faith. For it is unlawful to assert that they preached before they possessed perfect knowledge, as some do even venture to say, boasting themselves as improvers of the apostles. For, after our Lord rose from the dead, the apostles were invested with power from on high when the Holy Spirit came down upon them, were filled with all his gifts, and had perfect knowledge. They departed to the ends of the earth, preaching the glad tidings of the good things sent from God to us, and proclaiming the peace of heaven to men, who indeed do all equally and individually possess the gospel of God. Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had learned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. 2. These have all declared to us that there is one God, creator of heaven and earth, announced by the law and the prophets, and one Christ, the Son of God. If anyone do not agree to these truths, he despises the companions of the Lord. Nay, more, he despises Christ himself, the Lord. Yea, he despises the Father also, and stands self-condemned, resisting and opposing his own salvation, as is the case with all heretics. Chapter 2. The heretics follow neither scripture nor tradition. 1. When, however, they are confuted from the scriptures, they turn round and accuse these same scriptures, as if they were not correct nor of authority, and assert that they are ambiguous, and that the truth cannot be extracted from them by those who are ignorant of tradition. For they allege that the truth was not delivered by means of written documents, but vive voce. Wherefore also Paul declared, But we speak wisdom among those that are perfect, but not the wisdom of this world. And this wisdom each one of them alleges to be the fiction of his own inventing, forsooth, so that, according to their idea, the truth properly resides at one time in Valentinus, at another time in Marcion, at another in Cerinthus, then afterwards in Basilides, or has even been indifferently in any other opponent, who could speak nothing pertaining to salvation. For every one of these men, being altogether of a perverse disposition, depraving the system of truth, is not ashamed to preach himself. 2. But again, when we refer them to that tradition which originates from the apostles, and which is preserved by means of the succession of presbyters in the churches, they object to tradition, saying that they themselves are wiser not merely than the presbyters, but even than the apostles, because they have discovered the unadulterated truth. For they maintain that the apostles intermingle the things of the law with the words of the Savior, and that not the apostles alone, but even the Lord himself, spoke as at one time from the demiurge, at another time from the intermediate place, and yet again from the pleroma, but that they themselves, indubitably, unsullyly, and purely, have knowledge of the hidden mystery. This is indeed to blaspheme their creator after a most impudent manner. It comes to this, therefore, that these men do now consent neither to scripture nor to tradition. 3. 
Such are the adversaries with whom we have to deal, my very dear friend, endeavoring like slippery servants to escape at all points. Wherefore, they must be opposed at all points. If, perchance, by cutting off their retreat, we may succeed in turning them back to the truth. For, though it is not an easy thing for a soul under the influence of error to repent, yet, on the other hand, it is not altogether impossible to escape from error when the truth is brought alongside it. Chapter 3. A Refutation of the Heretics From the Fact That, in the Various Churches, a Perpetual Succession of Bishops Was Kept Up. 1. It is within the power of all, therefore, in every church, who may wish to see the truth, to contemplate clearly the tradition of the apostles manifested throughout the whole world, and we are in a position to reckon up those who were by the apostles instituted bishops in the churches, and to demonstrate the succession of these men to our own times, those who neither taught nor knew of anything like what these heretics rave about. For if the apostles had known hidden mysteries, which they were in the habit of imparting to the perfect, apart and privily from the rest, they would have delivered them especially to those to whom they were also committing the churches themselves. For they were desirous that these men should be very perfect and blameless in all things, whom also they were leaving behind as their successors, delivering up their own place of government to these men, which men, if they discharged their functions honestly, would be a great boon to the church, but if they should fall away, the direst calamity. 2. Since, however, it would be very tedious, in such a volume as this, to reckon up the successions of all the churches, we do put to confusion all those who, in whatever manner, whether by an evil self-pleasing, by vainglory, or by blindness and perverse opinion, assemble in unauthorized meetings. We do this, I say, by indicating that tradition derived from the apostles, of the very great, the very ancient, and universally known church founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, as also by pointing out the faith preached to men, which comes down to our time by means of the successions of the bishops. For it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church, on account of its preeminent authority, that is, the faithful everywhere, inasmuch as the apostolic tradition has been preserved continuously by those faithful men who exist everywhere. 3. The blessed apostles, then, having founded and built up the church, committed into the hands of Linus the office of the episcopate. Of this Linus, Paul makes mention in the epistles to Timothy. To him succeeded Anacletus, and after him, in the third place from the apostles, Clement was allotted the bishopric. This man, as he had seen the blessed apostles, and had been conversant with them, might be said to have the preaching of the apostles still echoing in his ears, and their traditions before his eyes. Nor was he alone in this, for there were many still remaining who had received instructions from the apostles. In the time of this Clement, no small dissension having occurred among the brethren at Corinth, the church in Rome dispatched a most powerful letter to the Corinthians, exhorting them to peace, renewing their faith, and declaring the tradition which it had lately received from the apostles, proclaiming the one God, omnipotent, the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of man, who brought on the deluge, and called Abraham, who led the people from the land of Egypt, spake with Moses, set forth the law, sent the prophets, and who has prepared fire for the devil and his angels. From this document, whosoever chooses to do so, may learn that he, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, was preached by the churches, and may also understand the apostolic tradition of the church. Since this epistle is of later date than these men who are now propagating falsehood, and who conjure into existence another God beyond the Creator and the Maker of all existing things. To this Clement there succeeded Everistus. Alexander followed Everistus. Then, six from the apostles, Sixtus was appointed. After him, Telephorus, who was gloriously martyred. Then Hyginus, after him, Pius. Then after him, Anicetus. Soror having succeeded Anicetus, Eleutherius does now, in the twelfth place from the apostles, hold the inheritance of the episcopate. In this order, and by this succession, the ecclesiastical tradition from the apostles, and the preaching of the truth, have come down to us. 
and this is most abundant proof that there is one and the same vivifying faith which has been preserved in the church from the apostles until now and handed down in truth four but polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen christ but was also by apostles in asia appointed bishop of the church in smyrna whom i also saw in my early youth for he tarried on earth a very long time and when a very old man gloriously and most nobly suffered martyrdom departed this life having also taught the things which he had learned from the apostles and which the church has handed down and which alone are true to these things all the asiatic churches testify as do also those men who have succeeded Polycarp down to the present time, a man who was of much greater weight and a more steadfast witness to the truth than Valentinus and Marcion and the rest of the heretics. He it was who, coming to Rome in the time of Anicetus, caused many to turn away from the aforesaid heretics to the church of God, proclaiming that he had received this one and sole truth from the apostles, that namely which is handed down by the church. There are also those who heard from him that John, the disciple of the Lord, going to bathe at Ephesus, and perceiving Serinthus within, rushed out of the bathhouse without bathing, exclaiming, Let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serinthus, the enemy of the truth, is within. And Polycarp himself replied to Marcion, who met him on one occasion, and said, Dost thou know me? I do know thee, the firstborn of Satan. Such was the horror which the apostles and their disciples had against holding even verbal communication with any corruptors of the truth. As Paul also says, a man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted, and sinneth, being condemned of himself. There is also a very powerful epistle of Polycarp written to the Philippians, from which those who choose to do so, and are anxious about their salvation, can learn the character of his faith, and the preaching of the truth. Then again, the church in Ephesus, founded by Paul, and having John remaining among them permanently until the times of Trajan, is a true witness of the tradition of the apostles. Chapter 4 The truth is to be found nowhere else but in the Catholic Church, the sole depository of apostolic doctrine, Heresies are of recent formation and cannot trace their origins up to the apostles. 1. Since therefore we have such proofs, it is not necessary to seek the truth among others which it is easy to obtain from the church, since the apostles, like a rich man depositing his money in a bank, lodged in her hands most copiously all things pertaining to the truth, so that every man, whosoever will, can draw from her the water of life. For she is the entrance to life. All others are thieves and robbers. On this account are we bound to avoid them, but to make choice of the thing pertaining to the church with the utmost diligence, and to lay hold of the tradition of the truth. For how stands the case? Suppose there arise a dispute relative to some important question among us. Should we not have recourse to the most ancient churches with which the apostles held constant intercourse? and learn from them what is certain and clear in regard to the present question? For who should it be if the apostles themselves had not left those writings? Would it not be necessary, in that case, to follow the course of the tradition which they handed down to those to whom they did commit the churches? 2. To which course many nations of those barbarians who believe in Christ do assent, having salvation written in their hearts by the Spirit, without paper or ink, and carefully preserving the ancient tradition, believing in one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and all things therein, by means of Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who, because of his surpassing love towards his creation, condescended to be born of the Virgin, he himself uniting man through himself to God, and having suffered under Pontius Pilate, and rising again, and having been received up in splendor, shall come in glory, the Savior of those who are saved, and the judge of those who are judged, and sending into eternal fire those who transform the truth, and despise his father and his advent. Those who, in the absence of written documents, have believed this faith are barbarians, so far as regards our language. But as regards doctrine, manner, and tenor of life, they are, because of faith, very wise indeed, and they do please God, 
ordering their conversation in all righteousness, chastity, and wisdom. If any one were to preach to these men the inventions of the heretics, speaking to them in their own language, they would at once stop their ears and flee as far off as possible, not enduring to listen to the blasphemous address. Thus, by means of that ancient tradition of the apostles, they do not suffer their mind to conceive anything of the doctrines suggested by the portentous language of these teachers, among whom neither church nor doctrine has ever been established. 3. 4. Prior to Valentinus. Those who follow Valentinus had no existence, nor did those from Marcion exist before Marcion, nor in short had any of those malign-minded people, whom I have above enumerated, any being previous to the initiators and inventors of their perversity. For Valentinus came to Rome in the time of Hyginus, flourished under Pius, and remained until Anicetus. Certain, too, Marcion's predecessor, himself arrived in the time of Hyginus, who was the ninth bishop. Coming frequently into the church and making public confession, he thus remained, one time teaching in secret, and then again making public confession. But at last, having been denounced for corrupt teaching, he was excommunicated from the assembly of the brethren. Marcion then, succeeding him, flourished under Anicetus, who held the tenth place of the episcopate. But the rest, who are called Gnostics, take rise from Meander, Simon's disciple, as I have shown, and each one of them appeared to be both the father and the high priest of that doctrine into which he has been initiated. But all these, the Marcosians, broke out into their apostasy much later, even during the intermediate period of the church. End of Book 3, Preface through Chapter 4 Chapters 5 through 7 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 5. Christ and his apostles, without any fraud, deception, or hypocrisy, preached that one God, the Father, was the founder of all things. They did not accommodate their doctrine to the prepossessions of their hearers. 1. Since, therefore, the tradition from the apostles does thus exist in the church, and is permanent among us, let us revert to the scriptural proof furnished by those apostles who did also write the gospel, in which they recorded the doctrine regarding God, pointing out that our Lord Jesus Christ is the truth, and that no lie is in him. As also David says, prophesying his birth from a virgin, and the resurrection from the dead, truth has sprung out of the earth. The apostles likewise, being disciples of the truth, are above all falsehood, for a lie has no fellowship with the truth, just as darkness has none with light, but the presence of the one shuts out that of the other. Our Lord, therefore, being the truth, does not speak lies, and whom he knew to have taken origin from a defect, he never would have acknowledged as God, even the God of all, the supreme king, too, and his own father, an imperfect being as a perfect one, an animal one as a spiritual, him who was without the pleroma as him who was within it. Neither did his disciples make mention of any other God, or term any other Lord, except him, who was truly the God and Lord of all, as these most vain sophists affirm that the apostles did with hypocrisy frame their doctrine according to the capacity of their hearers, and gave answers after the opinions of their questioners, fabling blind things for the blind, according to their blindness, for the dull according to their dullness, for those in error according to their error. And to those who imagined that the Demiurge alone was God, they preached him. But to those who are capable of comprehending the unnameable Father, they did declare the unspeakable mystery through parables and enigmas, so that the Lord and the apostles exercised the office of teacher not to further the cause of truth, but even in hypocrisy, and as each individual was able to receive it. 2. Such a line of conduct belongs not to those who heal or who give life. It is rather that of those bringing on diseases and increasing ignorance. 
Much more true than these men shall the law be found, which pronounces every one accursed who sends the blind man astray in the way. For the apostles, who were commissioned to find out the wanderers, and to be for sight to those who saw not, and medicine to the weak, certainly did not address them in accordance with their opinion at the time, but according to revealed truth. For no person of any kind would act properly, if they should advise blind men, just to fall over a precipice, to continue their most dangerous path, as if it were the right one, and as if they might go on in safety. Or what medical man, anxious to heal a sick person, would prescribe in accordance to the patient's whims, and not according to the requisite medicine? But that the Lord came as the physician of the sick, he does himself declare, saying, that they are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. How then shall the sick be strengthened, or how shall sinners come to repentance? Is it by persevering in the very same courses? Or, on the contrary, is it by undergoing a great change and reversal of their former mode of living, by which they have brought upon themselves no slight amount of sickness and many sins? But ignorance, the mother of all these, is driven out by knowledge. Wherefore the Lord used to impart knowledge to his disciples, by which also it was his practice to heal those who were suffering, and to keep back sinners from sin. He therefore did not address them in accordance with their pristine notions, nor did he reply to them in harmony with the opinion of his questioners, but according to the doctrine leading to salvation, without any hypocrisy or respect of person. 3. This is also made clear from the words of the Lord, who did truly reveal the Son of God to those of circumcision, he who had been foretold as Christ by the prophets, that is, he set himself forth, who had restored liberty to men, and bestowed on them the inheritance of incorruption. And again, the apostles taught the Gentiles that they should leave vain stocks and stones, which they imagined to be gods, and worship the true God who had created and made all the human family, and, by means of his creation, did nourish, increase, strengthen, and preserve them in being, and that they might look for his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed us from apostasy with his own blood, so that we should also be a sanctified people, who shall also descend from heaven in his Father's power, and pass judgment upon all, and who shall freely give the good things of God to those who shall have kept his commandments. He, appearing in these last times, the chief cornerstone, has gathered into one, and united those that were far off, and those that were near, that is, the circumcision and the uncircumcision, enlarging Japhet, and placing him in the dwelling of Shem. Chapter 6 The Holy Ghost, throughout the Old Testament scriptures, made mention of no other God or Lord, save Him who is the true God. 1. Therefore neither would the Lord, nor the Holy Spirit, nor the Apostles, have ever named as God, definitely and absolutely, Him who was not God, unless He were truly God. Nor would they have named anyone in His own person Lord, except God the Father ruling over all, and His Son who has received dominion from His Father over all creation, as this passage has it. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Here the scripture represents to us the Father addressing the Son, He who gave him the inheritance of the heathen, and subjected to him all his enemies. Since therefore the Father is truly Lord, and the Son truly Lord, the Holy Spirit has fitly designated them by the title of Lord. And again, referring to the destruction of the Sodomites, the scripture says, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. For it here points out that the Son, who had also been talking with Abraham, had received power to judge the Sodomites for their wickedness. And this following text does declare the same truth. Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee. For the Spirit designates both of them by the name of God, both him who is anointed as Son, and him who does anoint, that is, the Father. And again, God stood in the congregation of the gods, he judges among the gods. 
He here refers to the Father and the Son, those who have received the adoption, but these are the church. She is the synagogue of God, which God, that is the Son himself, has gathered by himself, of whom he again speaks, the God of gods, the Lord hath spoken, and hath called the earth. Who is meant by God? He of whom he has said, God shall come openly, our God, and shall not keep silence. That is, the Son, who came manifested to man, who said, I have openly appeared to those who seek me not. But of what gods does he speak? Of those to whom he says, I have said, ye are gods, and all sons of the Most High. To those, no doubt, who have received the grace of the adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. 2. Wherefore, as I have already stated, no other is named as God, or is called Lord, except him who is God, and Lord of all, who also said to Moses, I am that I am. And thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, He who is hath sent me unto you. And his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who makes those that believe in his name the sons of God. And again, when the Son speaks to Moses, he says, I am come down to deliver this people. For it is he who descended and ascended for the salvation of men. Therefore God has declared through the Son, who is in the Father, and has the Father in himself, he who is, the Father bearing witness to the Son, and the Son announcing the Father. As also Esaias says, I too am witness, he declares, saith the Lord God, and the Son whom I have chosen, that ye may know, and believe, and understand that I am. 3. When, however, the scripture terms them gods which are no gods, it does not, as I have already remarked, declare them as gods in every sense, but with a certain addition and signification, by which they are shown to be no gods at all. As with David, the gods of the heathen are idols of demons, and ye shall not follow other gods. For in that, he says, the gods of the heathen, but the heathen are ignorant of the true God, and calls them other gods, he bars their claim to be looked upon as gods at all. But as to what they are in their own person, he speaks concerning them. For they are, he says, the idols of demons. And Esaias, let them be confounded, all who blaspheme God, and carve useless things. Even I am witness, saith the Lord. He removes them from the category of gods, but he makes use of the word alone, for this purpose that they may know of whom he speaks. Jeremiah also says the same. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, let them perish from the earth which is under the heaven. For, from the fact of his having subjoined their destruction, he shows them to be no gods at all. Elias, too, when all Israel was assembled at Mount Carmel, wishing to turn them from idolatry, says to them, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And again, at the burnt offering, he thus addressed the idolatrous priests. Ye shall call upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord my God. And the Lord that will hearken by fire, he is God. Now, from the fact of the prophet having said these words, he proves that these gods which were reputed so among those men are no gods at all. He directed them to that God upon whom he believed, and who was truly God, whom invoking he exclaimed, Lord God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, hear me today, and let all this people know that thou art the God of Israel. 4. Wherefore I do also call upon thee, Lord God of Abraham, and God of Isaac, and God of Jacob and Israel, who art the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who, through the abundance of thy mercy, hast had a favor towards us, that we should know thee, who hast made heaven and earth, who rulest over all, who art the only and the true God, above whom there is no other God. Grant, by our Lord Jesus Christ, the governing power of the Holy Spirit, give to every reader of this book to know thee, that thou art God alone, to be strengthened in thee, and to avoid every heretical and godless and impious doctrine. 5. And the Apostle Paul also, saying, For though ye have served them which are no gods, ye now know God, or rather are known of God, has made a separation between those that were not gods and him who is God. 
And again, speaking of Antichrist, he says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped? He points out here those who are called gods, by such as know not God, that is, idols. For the Father of all is called God, and is so. And Antichrist shall be lifted up, not above him, but above those which are indeed called gods, but are not. And Paul himself says that this is true. We know that an idol is nothing, and that there is none other god but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, yet to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we through him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. For he has made a distinction, and separated those which are indeed called gods, but which are none, from the one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and, as he confessed in the most decided manner in his own person, one Lord Jesus Christ. But in this clause, whether in heaven or in earth, he does not speak of the formers of the world, as these teachers expound it. But his meaning is similar to that of Moses, when it is said, Thou shalt not make to thyself any image for God, of whatsoever things are in heaven above, whatsoever in the earth beneath, and whatsoever in the waters under the earth. And he does thus explain what are meant by the things in heaven. Lest when, he says, looking towards heaven, and observing the sun and the moon and the stars, and all the ornament of heaven, falling into error, thou shouldest adore and serve them. And Moses himself, being a man of God, was indeed given as a god before Pharaoh. But he is not properly termed Lord, nor is called God by the prophets, but is spoken of by the Spirit as Moses, the faithful minister and servant of God, which also he was. Chapter 7 Reply to an objection founded on the words of St. Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 St. Paul occasionally uses words not in their grammatical sequence. 1. As to their affirming that Paul said plainly in the second epistle to the Corinthians, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, and maintaining that there is indeed one God of this world, but another who is beyond all principality and beginning in power, we are not to blame if they, who give out that they do themselves no mysteries beyond God, know not how to read Paul. For if any one read the passage thus, according to Paul's custom, as I show elsewhere, and by many examples, that he uses transposition of words, in whom God, then pointing it off, and making a slight interval, and at the same time read also the rest of the sentence in one clause, hath blinded the minds of them of this world that believe not. He shall find out the true sense, that it is contained in the expression, God hath blinded the minds of the unbelievers of this world. And this is shown by means of the little interval between the clauses. For Paul does not say, the God of this world, as if recognizing any other beyond him, but he confessed God as indeed God. He says, the unbelievers of this world, because they shall not inherit the future age of incorruption. I shall show from Paul himself how it is that God has blinded the minds of them that believe not in the course of this work, that we may not just at present distract our mind from the matter in hand by wandering at large. 2. From many other instances also, we may discover that the Apostle frequently uses a transposed order in his sentences, due to the rapidity of his discourses, and the impetus of the Spirit which is in him. An example occurs in the Epistle to the Galatians, where he expresses himself as follows, Wherefore then the law of works? It was added, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the land of the Mediator. For the order of the words runs thus, Wherefore then the law of works, ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator? It was added until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Man thus asking the question and the spirit making answer. And again in the second Thessalonians, speaking of Antichrist, he says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus Christ shall slay with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy him with the presence of his coming even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now in these sentences the order of the words is this, 
and then shall be revealed that wicked, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the presence of his coming. For he does not mean that the coming of the Lord is after the working of Satan, but the coming of the wicked one, whom we also call Antichrist. If, then, one does not attend to the proper reading of the passage, and if he do not exhibit the intervals of breathing as they occur, there shall be not only incongruities, but also, when reading, he will utter blasphemy, as if the advent of the Lord could take place according to the working of Satan. So, therefore, in such passages, the hyperbaton must be exhibited by the reading, and the apostle's meaning following on, preserved, and thus we do not read in that passage the God of this world, but God, whom we do truly call God, and we hear it declared of the unbelieving and the blinded of this world, that they shall not inherit the world of life which is to come. End of Book 3, Chapters 5-7 through seven. Chapters 8 through 10 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombeau. Chapter 8. Answer to an objection arising from the words of Christ, Matthew 6, verse 24. God alone is to be really called God and Lord, for he is without beginning and end. 1. This calumny, then, of these men having been quashed, it is clearly proved that neither the prophets nor the apostles did ever name another God, or call him Lord, except the true and only God. Much more would this be the case with regard to the Lord himself, who did also direct us to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's, naming indeed Caesar as Caesar, but confessing God as God. In like manner also, that text which says, Ye cannot serve two masters, he does himself interpret saying, Ye cannot serve God and mammon, acknowledging God indeed as God, but mentioning mammon, a thing having also an existence. He does not call mammon Lord when he says, Ye cannot serve two masters, but he teaches his disciples who serve God not to be subject to mammon, nor to be ruled by it. For he says, He that committeth sin is the slave of sin. Inasmuch then as he terms those the slaves of sin who serve sin, but does not certainly call sin itself God, thus also he terms those who serve mammon the slaves of mammon, not calling mammon God. For mammon is, according to the Jewish language, which the Samaritans do also use, a covetous man, one who wishes to have more than he ought to have. But according to the Hebrew, it is by the addition of a syllable, adjunctive, called mamwell, and signifies golosum, that is, one whose gullet is insatiable. Therefore, according to both these things which are indicated, we cannot serve God and mammon. 2. But also, when he spoke of the devil as strong, not absolutely so, but as in comparison with us, the Lord showed himself under every aspect and truly to be the strong man, saying that one can in no other way spoil the goods of a strong man, if he do not first bind the strong man himself, and then he will spoil his house. Now we were the vessels in the house of this strong man, when we were in a state of apostasy, for he put us to whatever use he pleased, and the unclean spirit dwelt within us. For he was not strong, as opposed to him who bound him and spoiled his house, but as against those persons who were his tools, inasmuch as he caused their thought to wander away from God, these did the Lord snatch from his grasp. As also Jeremiah declares, The Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and hath snatched him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. If, then, he had not pointed out him who binds and spoils his goods, but had merely spoken of him as being strong, the strong man should have been unconquered. But he also subjoined him who obtains and retains possession, for he holds who binds, but he is held who is bound. And this he did without any comparison, so that, apostate slave as he was, he might not be compared to the Lord, 
for not he alone but not one of created and subject things shall ever be compared to the word of god by whom all things were made who is our lord jesus christ three for that all things whether angels or archangels or thrones or dominions were both established and created by him who is god over all through his word john has thus pointed out for when he had spoken of the word of god as having been in the father he added all things were made by him and without him was not anything made david also when he had enumerated his praises subjoins by name all things whatsoever i have mentioned both the heavens and the powers therein for he commanded and they were created he spake and they were made whom therefore did he command the word no doubt by whom he says the heavens were established and all their power by the breath of his mouth but that he did himself make all things freely and as he pleased again david says but our god is in the heavens above and in the earth he hath made all things whatsoever he pleased but the things established are distinct from him who has established them and what have been made from him who has made them for he is himself uncreated both without beginning and end and lacking nothing he is himself sufficient for himself and still further he grants to all others this very thing existence but the things which have been made by him have received a beginning but whatever things had a beginning and are liable to dissolution and are subject to and stand in need of him who made them must necessarily in all respects have a different term applied to them even by those who have but a moderate capacity for discerning such things so that he indeed who made all things can alone together with his word properly be termed god and lord but the things which have been made cannot have this term applied to them neither should they justly assume that appellation which belongs to the creator chapter nine one and the same god the creator of heaven and earth is he whom the prophets foretold and who was declared by the gospel proof of this at the outset from st matthew's gospel one this therefore having been clearly demonstrated here and it shall yet be so still more clearly that neither the prophets nor the apostles nor the lord christ in his own person did acknowledge any other lord or god but the god and lord supreme the prophets and the apostles confessing the father and the son but naming no other as god and confessing no other as lord and the lord himself handing down to his disciples that he the father is the only god and lord who alone is god and ruler of all it is incumbent on us to follow if we are their disciples indeed their testimonies to this effect for matthew the apostle knowing as one and the same god him who had given promise to abraham that he would make his seed as the stars of heaven and him who by his son christ jesus has called us to the knowledge of himself from the worship of stones so that those who were not a people were made a people and she beloved who was not beloved declares that john when preparing the way for christ said to those who were boasting of their relationship to abraham according to the flesh but who had their mind tinged and stuffed with all manner of evil preaching that repentance which should call them back from their evil doings said o generation of vipers who hath shown you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruit meet for repentance and think not to say within yourselves we have abraham to our father for i say unto you that god is able of these stones to raise up children unto abraham he preached to them therefore the repentance from wickedness but he did not declare to them another god besides him who made the promise to abraham he the forerunner of christ of whom matthew again says and luke likewise for this is he that was spoken of from the lord by the prophet the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord make straight the paths of our god every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough into smooth ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of god there is therefore one and the same god the father of our lord who also promised through the prophets that he would send his forerunner and his salvation that is his word he caused to be made visible to all flesh the word himself being made incarnate that in all things their king might become manifest 
For it is necessary that those beings which are judged do see the judge, and know him from whom they receive judgment. And it is also proper that those which follow on to glory should know him who bestows upon them the gift of glory. 2. Then again Matthew, when speaking of the angel, says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in sleep. Of what Lord does he himself interpret? That it may be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is, being interpreted, God with us. David likewise speaks of him who, from the virgin, is Emmanuel. Turn not away the face of thine appointed. The Lord hath sworn a truth to David, and will not turn from him. Of the fruit of thy body I will set upon thy seat. And again, in Judea is God known, his place has been made in peace, and his dwelling in Zion. Therefore there is one and the same God, who was proclaimed by the prophets and announced by the gospel, and his son, who was the fruit of David's body, that is, of the virgin of the house of David, and Emmanuel, whose star also Balaam thus prophesied, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a leader shall rise in Israel. But Matthew says that the Magi, coming from the east, exclaimed, For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And that having been led by the star into the house of Jacob to Emmanuel, they showed, by these gifts which they offered, who it was that was worshipped, myrrh, because it was he who should die and be buried for the mortal human race, gold, because he was a king, of whose kingdom is no end, and frankincense, because he was God, who also was made known in Judea, and was declared to those who sought him not. 3. And then speaking of his baptism, Matthew says, The heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, as a dove coming upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. For Christ did not at that time descend upon Jesus, neither was Christ one and Jesus another, but the Word of God, who is the Savior of all, and the ruler of heaven and earth, who is Jesus, as I have already pointed out who did also take upon him flesh, and was anointed by the Spirit of the Father, was made Jesus Christ. As Esaias also says, There shall come forth a rod from the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise from his root. And the Spirit of God shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and piety, and the Spirit of the fear of God, shall fill him. He shall not judge according to glory, nor reprove after the manner of speech, but he shall dispense judgment to the humble man, and reprove the haughty ones of the earth. And again Esaias, pointing out beforehand his unction, and the reason why he was anointed, does himself say, The Spirit of God is upon me, because he hath anointed me, he hath sent me to preach the gospel to the lowly, to heal the broken up in heart to proclaim liberty to the captives, and sight to the blind, to announce the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance, to comfort all that mourn. For inasmuch as the word of God was man from the root of Jesse, and son of Abraham, in this respect did the Spirit of God rest upon him, and anoint him to preach the gospel to the lowly. But inasmuch as he was God, he did not judge according to glory, nor reprove after the manner of speech. For he needed not that any should testify to him of man, for he himself knew what was in man. For he called all men that mourn, and granting forgiveness to those who had been led into the captivity by their sins. He loosened them from their chains, of whom Solomon says, Everyone shall be holden with the cords of his own sins. Therefore did the Spirit of God descend upon him, the Spirit of him who had promised by the prophets that he would anoint him, so that we receiving from the abundance of his unction, might be saved. Such, then, is the witness of Matthew. Chapter 10. Proofs of the Foregoing, Drawn from the Gospels of Mark and Luke 1. Luke also, the follower and disciple of the apostles, referring to Zacharias and Elizabeth, from whom, according to promise, John was born, says, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And again, speaking of Zacharias, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, 
According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense, and he came to sacrifice, entering into the temple of the Lord, whose angel Gabriel also, who stands prominently in the presence of the Lord, simply, absolutely, and decidedly confessed in his own person as God and Lord, him who had chosen Jerusalem, and had instituted the sacerdotal office. For he knew of none other above him, since, if he had been in possession of the knowledge of any other more perfect God and Lord besides him, he surely would never, as I have already shown, have confessed him, whom he knew to be the fruit of a defect, as absolutely and altogether God and Lord. And then, speaking of John, he thus says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. For whom, then, did he prepare the people, and in the sight of what Lord was he made great? Truly of him who said that John had something even more than a prophet, and that among those born of women none is greater than John the Baptist, who did also make the people ready for the Lord's advent, warning his fellow servants, and preaching to them repentance, that they might receive remission from the Lord when he should be present, having been converted to him, from whom they had been alienated because of sins and transgressions. As also David says, The alienated are sinners from the womb, they go astray as soon as they are born. And it was on account of this that he, turning them to their Lord, prepared in the spirit and power of Elias, a perfect people for the Lord. 2. And again, speaking in reference to the angel, he says, But at that time the angel Gabriel was sent from God, who did also say to the virgin, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And he says concerning the Lord, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. For who else is there who can reign uninterruptedly over the house of Jacob forever, except Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of the Most High God, who promised by the law and the prophets that he would make his salvation visible to all flesh, so that he would become the Son of Man for this purpose, that man also might become the Son of God? And Mary, exulting because of this, cried out, prophesying on behalf of the church, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath taken up his child Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers Abraham, and his seed for ever. By these and such like passages the gospel points out that it was God who spake to the fathers, that it was he who, by Moses, instituted the legal dispensation, by which giving of the law we know that he spake to the fathers. This same God, after his great goodness, poured his compassion upon us, through which compassion the day spring from on high hath looked upon us, and appeared to those who sat in darkness and the shadow of death, and has guided our feet into the way of peace. As Zacharias also, recovering from the state of dumbness which he had suffered on account of unbelief, having been filled with a new spirit, did bless God in a new manner. For all things had entered upon a new phase, the word arranging after a new manner the advent in the flesh, that he might win back to God that human nature, hominen, which had departed from God, and therefore men were taught to worship God after a new fashion, but not another God, because in truth there is but one God, who justifieth the circumcision by faith, and the uncircumcision through faith. But Zacharias prophesying exclaimed, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world begun, salvation from our enemies, and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all our days. Then he says to John, and thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, for the remission of their sins. For this is the knowledge of salvation which was wanting to them, 
that the Son of God, which John made known, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man who was made before me, because he was prior to me, and of his fullness have all we received. This, therefore, was the knowledge of salvation, but it did not consist in another God, nor another father, nor Bithus, nor the pleroma of thirty aeons, nor the mother of the lower Ogdawad. But the knowledge of salvation was the knowledge of the Son of God, who is both called and actually is salvation, and Savior, and salutary. Salvation indeed as follows. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. And then again, Savior. Behold, my God, my Savior, I will put my trust in him. But as bringing salvation, thus, God hath made known his salvation, salutare, in the sight of the heathen. For he is indeed Savior, as being the Son and Word of God. But salutary, since he is Spirit, for he says, The Spirit of our countenance, Christ the Lord. But salvation, as being flesh, for the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This knowledge of salvation, therefore, John did impart to those repenting and believing in the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. 3. And the angel of the Lord, he says, appeared to the shepherds, proclaiming joy to them. For there is born in the house of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Then appeared a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory in the highest to God, and on earth peace, to men of good will. The falsely called Gnostics say that these angels came from the Ogdawad, and made manifest the descent of the superior Christ. But they are again in error, when saying that the Christ and Savior from above was not born, but that also, after the baptism of the dispensational Jesus, he, the Christ of the Pleroma, descended upon him as a dove. Therefore, according to these men, the angels of the Ogdawad lied, when they said, For unto you is born this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, in the city of David. For neither was Christ nor the Savior born at that time, by their account. But it was he, the dispensational Jesus, who is of the framer of the world, the Demiurge, and upon whom, after his baptism, that is, after the lapse of thirty years, they maintain the Savior from above descended. But why did the angels add, in the city of David, if they did not proclaim the glad tidings of the fulfillment of God's promise made to David, that from the fruit of his body there should be an eternal king? For the framer, Demiurge, of the entire universe made promise to David, as David himself declares, My help is from God, who made heaven and earth. And again, in his hand are the ends of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his. For the sea is his, and he did himself make it. And his hands founded the dry land. Come ye, let us worship and fall down before him, and weep in the presence of the Lord who made us. For he is the Lord our God. The Holy Spirit evidently thus declares by David to those hearing him, that there shall be those who despise him who formed us, and who is God alone. Wherefore he also uttered the foregoing words, meaning to say, See that ye do not err, besides or above him there is no other God, to whom ye should rather stretch out your hands, thus rendering us pious and grateful towards him who made, established, and still nourishes us. What then shall happen to those who have been the authors of so much blasphemy against their creator? This identical truth was also what the angels proclaimed, for when they exclaim, Glory to God in the highest, and in earth peace. They have glorified with these words him who is the creator of the highest, that is, of super celestial things, and the founder of everything on earth, who has sent to his own handiwork, that is, to men, the blessing of his salvation from heaven. Wherefore, he adds, the shepherds returned, glorifying God for all which they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. For the Israelitish shepherds did not glorify another god, but him who had been announced by the law and the prophets, the maker of all things, whom also the angels glorified. But if the angels who were from Ogdawad were accustomed to glorify any other, different from him whom the shepherds adored, these angels from the Ogdawad brought to them error and not truth. 4. And still further does Luke say in reference to the Lord, 
When the days of purification were accomplished, they brought him up to Jerusalem, to present him before the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, that every male opening the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and that they should offer a sacrifice, as it is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. In his own person most clearly calling him Lord, who appointed the legal dispensation. But Simeon, he also says, Bless God, and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Anna also, the prophetess, he says, in like manner glorified God when she saw Christ, and spake of him to all them who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now by all these one God is shown forth, revealing to men the new dispensation of liberty, the covenant, through the new advent of his Son. 5. Wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, does thus commence his gospel narrative. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make the path straight before our God. Plainly does the commencement of the gospel quote the words of the holy prophets, and point out him at once, whom they confess as God and Lord. Him, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had also made promise to him, that he would send his messenger before his face, who was John, crying in the wilderness, in the spirit and power of Elias. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight paths before our God. For the prophets did not announce one and another God, but one and the same, under various aspects, however, and many titles. For varied and rich in attribute is the Father, as I have already shown in the book preceding this, and I shall show the same truth from the prophets themselves in the further course of this work. Also, towards the conclusion of his gospel, Mark says, so then, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God. Confirming what had been spoken by the prophet, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Thus God and the Father are truly one and the same. He who was announced by the prophets, and handed down by the true gospel, whom we Christians worship and love with the whole heart, as the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things therein. End of Book 3, Chapters 8 through 10